to the Standing Committee on City Finance and Services mar uh, meeting of March 30th, 2022. This committee meeting is being convened by electronic means as authorized under Part 14 of the Procedure Bylaw, and as such, committee members may participate in person or by electronic means. Committee members participating uh, uh, virtually are reminded that in accordance with Section 14.0, uh, 13 of the procedure bylaw video must be enabled in order to confirm quorum members are also asked to please advise the clerk if they need to leave the meeting if a committee member loses connection during the voting process staff will get back online get you back online quickly while we suspend suspend the voting process the staff contact information has been circulated to you Video of committee members speaking, presentations, and vote results will be projected on the live stream when available. Members of the public who wish to participate are encouraged to submit comments online or participate via telephone. Members of the public are strongly encouraged to attend remotely. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. We thank them for having cared for this land and look forward to working with them in partnership as we continue to build this great city together. I also want to recognize the immense contributions of the City of Vancouver's staff who work hard every day to help make our city an incredible place to live, work, and play. Clerk, may we have the roll call, please? Yes, Mayor Stewart is on a leave of absence until noon today. Councillor Carr. Councillor DiGenova. Councillor Fry. Present. Councillor Swanson. Here. Councillor Hardwick. Present. Councillor Reap. Councillor Boyle is on leave of absence until noon today. Councillor Dominato. Present. Councillor Bly is in the chair. Councillor Kirby Young. Present. The meeting has quorum, Chair Bly. Thank you very much. At this time, I'm going to go over the plan for the day. We have 14 items of business on today's agenda, eight staff reports, one administrative report, and four member motions referred from yesterday's council. Uh, we will recess at noon for lunch and then reconvene at 3 p.m. following the in-camera portion. Should the business not be completed prior to 5 p.m. today, we will recess for dinner at 5 p.m. and reconvene at 6 p.m. And if an additional day is required, the meeting will reconvene next Tuesday, April 5th at, 20, at uh, 3 p.m. And finally, I'd like to remind council members that if amendments are brought forward, they must be submitted to the city clerk in final written form before the council member introduces them. Please ensure the clerk has received your amendment by using the council meeting amendments DL. So as chair for this meeting, I am suggesting for reports that have no speakers and no presentations that we adopt the recommendations collectively in a single motion. Reports two, three, four, six, eight, and nine have no presentation and speakers. Does any member wish to hold these reports for debate or questions to staff? Hearing none, uh, does any member wish to declare a conflict of interest on the consent items? Excuse me, um, it's Jean. I think there's a speaker for number six, isn't there? That speaker has withdrawn, Councillor Swanson. Oh, okay, sorry. No problem, thank you for checking. Thank you, Councilor Carr. So we have uh, a mover um, for um, the adoption of the recommendations contained in the following items. Item two, annual procurement report 2021. Item three, Vancouver Community Sport Hosting Grant spring 2022 intake. Item four, approval of 2022 to 2023 business improvement area budgets. Item six, extension to support Drinker's Lounge alcohol consumption pilot. Uh, report number, item number eight, contract award for construction services for sewer separation uh, at West 49th. And then item nine, contract award for supply and delivery of Tritum Axle walking floor trailer. All those in favor, say yay. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. 
So the following has been approved on consent. Bear with me, I do need to read these titles back into the record. So item two, annual procurement report 2021. Item three, Vancouver Community Support Hosting Grant 2022 intake. Uh, spring 2022 intake. Item four, approval of the 2022-2023 business improvement area budgets. Item six, extension to support drinkers lounge alcohol consumption pilot. Item eight, contract award for construction services for sewer separation on West 49th. And item nine, contract award for supply and delivery of Tritum Axle walking floor trailer. Thank you very much, Council. So uh, before we begin, I'd like to remind speakers that they have five minutes to make their comments and should state whether they are in support or in opposition of the recommendations and may only speak once. Council members have up to three minutes to ask questions to speakers. However, speakers are under no obligation to respond. I will also ask if speakers are residents of Vancouver if it is not indicated on the speakers list. Following the last speaker on the list, we, for each item, we will go back through the list for those who are not present when their name was initially called. I also want to note that uh, the City of Vancouver's long-standing commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, including utmost respect for all genders. I remind Council that when addressing speakers and staff, we will avoid using gendered honorifics and will instead refer to the person by first and last name, role, or title. So we are moving to our first item on the agenda today, which is the 2021 Statement of Financial Information. And we have Julia Aspinall, Director of Financial Services, um, in the chamber to provide a presentation and answer questions. Mr. Chair, by morning. Um, Paul Mokri here, City Manager. So we do have a presentation for Council. It's optional, so if Council wishes to forego that, that's certainly your option. Um, the recommendations are re reasonably straightforward here for the SOFI report. It's approve and accept for information. But So we're in your hands. Uh, we are able to provide a presentation if Council would prefer that or, or not. Yeah, I do appreciate that, City Manager. I will let um, Council know that we do not have a speaker to this item. Um, so I'd like to just get... Move to waive presentation. Okay, great. So that would be a motion on the floor. All those in favor, say yay. Yay. Any opposed? Okay, that motion passes. So we'll waive the presentation and we can now move to questions of staff. I'll just give councils a moment to join the queue. I'm actually not seeing any questions. It must be a very comprehensive report for everybody on council. So I think we can actually move ahead to um, ask for a motion. Thank you, Councillor Carr. So we are um, going to go straight to a vote. And I think what we'll do is we'll do a, we'll do a uh, recorded vote. So if uh, we can get that voting screen up, please. Sorry, Chair, if I could get a vote assist in favor. Certainly. Uh, same, similar for me as well, Chair. Uh, Councilor Dominato, a vote assist in favor. Great, thank you very much. Me too, please. Okay, that's Councilor Hardwick. And some technical issues. Okay. So that looks like all those are right. Okay, great. So uh, that motion does pass with none in opposition. So thank you very much to staff for the thorough preparation uh, of that report that concludes item one on our agenda. So we'll now be moving right along to item five. Bear with me for just a moment. Our fifth item is uh, alcohol consumption and public plazas policy. And we have Lisa Parker, Director of Public Space and Street Use from Engineering Services in the Chamber to answer questions. But I also recognize, okay, great, yes, hi. Uh, so we'll just give staff a moment to get themselves ready to go and then, um, we do have a presentation. So whenever you're ready, over to you. We'll just wait for your mic, just one moment. Good morning, I'm Lisa Parker, Director of Public Space and Street Use. Um, we do have a presentation available if, uh, if you're looking for that or we don't. I just, 
We do have a speaker, um, so I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead with the presentation. Great, okay, thank you. So we're, we're looking to get the tech, um, like it just set up, so just one moment. Good morning, Mary and Council. It's uh, nice to be here. Um, my name is Rachel Magnuson. Uh, she, her, is a branch manager of street activities and engineering services. Thank you for the adjustment to the podium. Um, I'm here today uh, to share our policy moving forward for alcohol consumption in public plazas. Um, so just quickly, what I want to go through today is a brief introduction to this policy, some background from the 2020 and 2021 pilots, uh, our pros, proposed approach, and then some consideration and some next steps. So um, what we're bringing forward today in this report is a proposal for a longer term approach to alcohol consumption in public plazas that really builds on the success of our two previous pilots. And what's really key is it's just a modest approach to keep the program going for our steward partners so that they have that tool and it provides um, a tool to enhance kind of community enjoyment and public life and business support in Vancouver. So just a quick overview of the pilots. So in 2020 and 2021, we did two seasonal summer pilots, uh, a bit shorter in 2020 and a, a few more uh, months and sites in 2021. And the key here is that uh, we did uh, about nine sites overall, and uh, you can see that there's some geographic distribution, so most of the 2020 sites in downtown, and then more of our neighborhood plazas uh, in 2021. And really overall, our pl uh, this program was a huge uh, success. Um, there was very strong levels of public support for this initiative. 92% uh, uh, support. Um, in addition, we've learned a lot about what made this, <laughs> this program a, a success, and that was about our partnerships with our plaza stewards. Um, so, and that had a couple different components. One, that, that we were responding to their interest in the program. So if they were interested in having drinking in their plazas, um, they came forward to us and we worked with them uh, about how to support that. And second, that the, our steward partners played a really critical role in the day-to-day -day management of those spaces. And I think that's a big part of why we see the, the success of this program. A couple uh, interesting things to note are that these spaces provide a kind of another opportunity uh, in this city. Um, they tend to be in retail areas. They are uh, a, close to uh, restaurants and other local businesses. And so pro by providing that public space, they are uh, an alternative to the, the restaurant private patio uh, that provides a low cost option for citizens. And at the same time, uh, people using those spaces were still uh, going to local business to get their takeout food, to get their drinks, and so it was supporting the economy. Um, and finally, and importantly, we just didn't have any issues reported to us of a health and safety nature. And this is in line with what we heard also from VPD and Vancouver Coastal Health. So their data uh, also did not show any links to issues at these sites, whether calls to the police or uh, increase in uh, emergency department visits. Now, I think the important caveat here, both for our data and the data of our partners, is that you know, we may not hear about all um, health and safety issues that are in the plazas, but certainly from the uh, perspective of our partners and ourselves, there didn't seem to be any issues. So, our proposed approach moving forward. Um, we're really, as I said, looking to build on the success of these two plazas. 
oh, sorry, two pilots uh, in the previous years. Um, and with the core purpose being to provide these low cost, flexible options for socializing. Um, they really contribute to the public life of Vancouver and they support our local businesses. Um, and overall, this approach is very lean, it's modest, it's meant to enable our partners to do programming in their spaces, and it has a lot of flexibility to evolve over time. So what will this look like? Uh, quite simply, it will be very similar to the programs we've had before. So we'll see an annual seasonal outreach to our partners to gauge their level of interest. If they are interested, we'll work through them uh, around the practicalities of their site. Um, we'll bring the proposed sites to VPD and then again to council for approval. Um, once the plaza has been approved as a drinking space, we will continue to work with the partners to manage that space over the season. And we will continue to provide the cost of a portable washroom if it's needed, if there's no other alternatives. So this is purposely scaled as an approach that fits within our existing budgets and our existing steward capacity. And so that's the really crucial thing here. So over time, there's possibility to expand this program if that's seen as a priority and will bring broader benefit to Vancouver. Um, one of the key things is, is geographic reach. Right now, because we rely on the existing plazas, uh, we know that there aren't plazas everywhere. We have active steward uh, relationships, and so that does limit the ge geographic reach. So that's something that as our plaza program expands, so too can this program. Um, the other kind of a key barrier is washrooms and just the practicalities of managing those in the space. So as the city advances the citywide washroom strategy, we can look for how it can support this program. And then finally, and really importantly, there's all kinds of needs for people in Vancouver to support harm reduction, to support illicit drinkers, that this program is not geared to address. And we are committed to working with our colleagues in ACCS on kind of different kinds of community partnerships that would address those needs. And we have done that in terms of the Drinker's Lounge, and we will continue to do that work. So with that, we are bringing our recommendation to Council on this proposed policy um, and are happy to discuss next steps. Great. Thank you very much for the presentation. You do have uh, questions from councillors. Councillor Carr, over to you first. Thank you. Great. I wasn't able to put my mic on myself, but thank you very much. Uh, great. Happy to hear this report and the um, sort of ongoing, more uh, permanent nature of this. Um, two questions. Um, the, I, I visited all of them, and, um, and there were some that were definitely um, sort of more robust, I guess. And also, I noticed that the washrooms varied. So the, the washroom I liked the best, and I saw people commenting on, was the uh, 17th in Camby. One, so I'm not sure who determines what the portable washroom is, but that one was like a Cadillac. <laughs> that's so funny. Uh, yeah, so that's something we work through with our steward partners. And um, the Canby Village BIA uh, was a very active partner in managing that space. So that I think the credit goes to them in terms of uh, the washroom. Uh, we were providing it. Um, Okay, you, could, you can't hint to any other partner that that one was a really good one, or is it totally in the partner's hands? So we do provide the washrooms and work with them on any okay. issues, but yeah, they're managing them. Okay, well, I would suggest heartily to you as staff that that one pace. Um, the second is um, some of them had other things going on, like art displays, for example, which also um, were really points of conversation amongst people. So they sit down, they'd have their, they have, would have brought maybe some wine or have some beer, whatever. But the point is when the art was around, I noticed people talking to each other more. So um, how do we encourage those kinds of um, sort of additional attributes to the plaza? Yeah, I think that's a really important point because one of the things we observed is that drinking wasn't the primary use in any of these plazas. It was about all the other programming and socializing going on. And so I think, again, that's uh, credit to our partners for programming this space. Okay, and we can encourage that. Mm -hmm. that. Yes. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Carr. Uh, Councillor Kirby-Young. 
Yeah, thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks to staff for the report. Um, the question that I have is really around um, just kind of daylighting. How do we resource these for success? I know that the BIAs were actively involved in a lot of the programming, like it can be one, for example, did wine tasting and kids events and playing chess and all sorts of things. And I'm wondering, um, with respect to things like cleanliness and activation, is the activation going to be on the part of the BIAs? Do Are we looking at the staff looking at bringing forward in the operating budget um, support for these programs in terms of cleanliness and cleanup. Um, I know that, for example, the one on Fraser Street, which is actively attached to a BIA, sometimes um, there have been flags raised there with respect to leaf debris, other things in terms of keeping it a really you know, usable, welcoming space. So what are, what are we looking at in terms of sustainability of resourcing? And we're looking to make this a line item in our budget. And can you also speak to sort of the just the distinction between which costs the city bears is it cleanup and washrooms and which costs are borne by the respective partners yeah uh, thank you for that question so we're uh, actively working on looking at our service levels in the uh, our plazas to make sure that they're they are clean uh, and uh, that is something that is the city responsibility so uh, we are looking at that working with our colleagues in sanitation and then also um uh, we would be providing the washroom. Where we're really relying on our steward partners is for the things that they're best at, which is programming these spaces to fit the needs of the community. And then also um, being that the day-to-day -day -day eyes on this space and knowing what's going on, being able to connect back with staff. Um, so if, in terms of the washroom management, it's things like unlocking and locking up the washroom at the end of the day. So it's important tasks like that. Okay, but do we feel that, like, will we be looking to increase resources in terms of cleanliness and servicing sort of during the peak summer months for approved plaza locations? Um, so that's a part of our plaza program overall, and it wouldn't be impacted by this particular program. Okay, so we feel like reflecting back in terms of what you're saying, we feel that we'll have the resourcing in place to keep them clean and welcoming? Yeah. Okay. Um, the other question I have switching gears a little bit is really with respect to um, buskers and busker licensing. Um, and I, I know that they were, you know, a lot of our local musicians were really anxious to get back to performing in front of people. I've connected a number of them with the BIAs individually. Is there any opportunity here to tie in busker licensing to these specific locations, recognizing that there's a BIA relationship here um, versus sort of letting it happen in a more ad hoc way with sort of individual connections between BIAs and the buskers? Yeah, um, thank you. Lisa Parker, Director of Public Space and Street Use. Um, that is definitely something we can look at through um, our overall program, um, including the opportunities with Share a Square, which is meant to be a low barrier way of programming within the space. So we can look into that and report back to Council. Yeah, I really welcome some information on that because I've been approached by a number of different groups as to whether or not that's sort of a program that can be formalized. Um, is it something that can be enabled by the city? Is it best to leave it to private industry. I've been looking at it, or sort of private folks to organize them looking at a number of different models. So I'd, I'd really welcome some information back on that. Absolutely, we can do that. And I think during the pandemic, there was some changes with that, but we can look um, as we return into the recovery, um, what the opportunities are for that. Okay, um, that's super. And with respect to some of the locations, we heard, for example, you're not expecting areas like lot nine necessarily or Butte and Robson to come back, right? It's fair to say some of the more popular ones were ones that were in those more populated areas that felt a bit more kind of active with people um, in terms of energy and life around them. Is that a fair? Yeah, um, my understanding is that for Lot 19, there just wasn't the uptake. So um, that wasn't seen as a, a of interest to the DVBA. And then in terms of Butte Robson, it they saw enough programming in public life anyway in the plaza, so the drinking didn't add another element. So it wasn't a useful programming tool. Okay. Um, and then the last question, so I know there was some surveying done, you mentioned high support, but do you have a sense if it was, the people really appreciated the fact it was there, but it was casual? Like it, my, you know, anecdotal observations is there were some people certainly enjoying it, taking advantage of it, but not necessarily hordes of people that were drinking. You often have lots of people in the plaza, might be a couple of people having a glass of wine, but you know, the majority likely not and never do is existing side by side. Do we see it was something that people were really doing um, at scale or it was a little bit more kind yeah. of smaller scale? 
It's a really good question. So uh, we did monitoring of these sites over both seasons. Um, and I think it was about 20% of the time where someone was drinking uh, in this space. So definitely it's not the predominant activity. Um, and yeah, so. Okay, that's helpful. Okay, thank you so much. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Dijanova. Thanks very much and, and really appreciate the report. I was wondering, is this completely separate to the Piazza model uh, that we saw on Commercial Drive? Is there something that will be coming back on that? Because I, I know that this is, this is somewhat separate, but the idea of the Piazza model was, and I understand that we have uh, some restrictions with the BC liquor laws that are provincial there, but I'm just wondering, it, are we still looking to follow through with that model as well that would be much different than this, but would also help those small businesses? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we've been working closely with the stakeholders involved in that space, and we did do a trial plaza um, at Grant with them, and at that time they weren't uh, interested in participating in the drinking in plazas program as it exists um, because as you're uh, suggesting there's a kind of a different model that's needed um, and that really does require that provincial change in legislation to advance. Um, just a follow-up to that is I, I was actually uh, uh, dining at Sa Prasado, um mm -hmm. one evening last summer and I was speaking with the owner there, asking him about this plaza and what he thought, because it did turn into one of these plazas instead where you could bring your own liquor, uh, was my understanding, is what he thought the only option was. But he had said, I would have loved to extend my patio and at least have had a little area where it was more like a bar outside. People didn't have to perhaps um, order a huge meal or something like that, but they could come in and be in that square and that area, kind of how it's programmed on Italian days with wine tasting. So I'm wondering, is there something that you've looked at that would look at sort of having some of these parklets or areas closed off and restaurants throughout the city could sort of take turns in specific areas to, you know, to, to either um, bid on those contracts or through the BIA. I'm just wondering if that model's been considered since we can't change the provincial laws. Hi, thank you, Councillor Dejanova. Um, as you were highlighting, there is some, I would say some extra steps for consideration for that. Um, and this policy in its intent for Council's consideration today is quite focused on the out public alcohol consumption and not the selling of that in different models. It's not to preclude um, staff working, continue to work with the key partners for something um, of the model that you're describing. So this would, this would move forward in a parallel fashion, but not preclude any work as we are continuing to work with the key partners for um, some of those more, um, I would say, fundamental shifts that would need to be approached and to deliver the opportunity for that business to have far more presence um, within a plaza for the selling of the alcohol and if there's food associated with that. So we could see this running parallel, but that is not um, specifically included in this. Okay, and I'm, I'm wondering, would, would you need direction to move forward with that, or is that something you're already looking at? No, I think that we have um, this, the understanding from the, the existing um, Piazza motion. And um, I, I would say from staff's perspective, we've done an incredible amount of learning over the last 18 months with the partners to really understand um, what we would consider nuance, but very important nuance for what, um, what, would, cons what would be required to have a successful Piazza um, model compared to an alcohol consumption in a plaza. Okay, so I wouldn't need to add anything like an amendment instead that, that that's something you're already considering and looking forward towards and maybe there is the opportunity to open those spaces up that are adjacent to restaurants and give those restaurants opportunities also. We, um, from staff's perspective, nothing would be needed to add to this policy in particular. We do understand from that existing motion already um, okay. for that direction. All right, thanks. I might send you some questions on that then to follow up, but thank you for your work on this and thank you for your work on that. Thank you. Great. Uh, Councillor Domnetto. Uh, thanks, Chair, and, and thanks to staff for the um, thorough report and, and analysis. I, I just wanted to follow up one question um, with respect to um, uh, some feedback we've had uh, around uh, not so much the plaza pilots, and, and I guess the context of this is that 
when I lived in Europe um, for several years, the, you know, the things like winter markets and where there was alcohol consumption wasn't confined by boundaries. We're a very different culture in North America. And so um, what we've adopted is um, allowing and permitting drinking within these plaza spaces. But one of the concerns I did hear um, uh, was, uh, through a number of channels was that um, there may be a lack of understanding from the broader public that may come and visit the city um, and come into the city about understanding um, the parameters of where we're permitting. Oh, oh we've lost your mic, Council Dominato. So if you just hold for a moment. Can you hear me now? Okay, you're back on, yeah. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Chair. But what we've heard was um, through VPD and others was that there may be a, a lack of understanding about what those parameters and, and rules are within our city. So people are coming to our city to visit and, and, and then adopting a, well, I can consume alcohol anywhere, anytime. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have any comments on that particularly um, and, and whether we've looked at ways to mitigate that or to educate people who are coming to visit about sort of what are the parameters of what we're doing in our city. Yeah, I think it's a really good question um, and it's something that uh, I imagine we'll continue to work through with Park Board as well. Uh, and uh, one of the key things that we, our tools that we have is signage uh, and making sure that it's very clear in the spaces that are allowed that it is enabled and where it's not, we can also include that as a part of the signage of our standard plazas to just help communicate that to the public. I appreciate that. And can I just ask as a, a, a question of interest to this is that um, has there been any uh, discussion um, with respect to operators, meaning bars, restaurants, um, uh, in terms of over, um, over sale um, of alcohol? Um, I know it's within their purview to be sort of managing that, but I'm just curious if that came up in any of the dialogue around um, the plazas. No, um, we didn't hear any feedback of that nature. Okay, great. Um, thank you. I appreciate the report and, and uh, the work that's going to continue in the policy framework that's set out. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dominato. Uh, Councillor Fry. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and thanks, thanks for this report. And I'm, I'm well, I'm talking to you. Thanks for the, the work on the, uh, on the pilot program at Hawks Avenue. That, I, I, in my opinion, as a local resident, I think that's been a great success. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, uh, and I think that these plazas have, have shown a good success as well. And, and I'm curious where, if, if we've had conversations with some of the neighboring municipalities, I know North Vancouver city has been having also some similar success and are we sharing information and we seeing where opportunities are. And one thing that I've noticed <clears throat> was a lack of, uh, food trucks at any of these plazas. And I'm wondering if that is by design or if that's just a function of, of, of a marketing decision by the various food trucks. Thank you for the question on the food trucks. I would say that we, over the last two years, we've really been approaching this pilot um, as like looking at the operational side of it. And I think with this policy direction, if we do um, have direction from council to move forward, we could start to build in some of those broader, more um, holistic uses of the plazas. Right now, we really, the last two years, wanted to see like, is this a good fit for us as a full stop question? Um, and so what we could start to do is to bring in those opportunities for food trucks and everything, especially as we're starting to move into the recovery, we can start to broaden out those ways of creating those real social connection hubs that have complementary and appropriate um, layers of connections with the business community right there. Yeah, fantastic. And have, have we had conversations with some of our neighboring municipalities about some of their findings and successes and even looking at how we can kind of um, have a, a level of consistency across Metro? That's a really uh, good point, and I think uh, that can be a part of our future work. So a key thing for us is to work with Park Board, but as you're saying, also our other municipalities to see how this program can evolve over time. Great. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the work that's been done on this, and good report. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Fry. Um, Councillor Di Genova, you do have one minute left. Thanks so much. And I was actually just hoping to move for a second round. I have one question, but it might take a little longer than a moment. Okay, I'm happy to entertain that motion. Uh, all those in favor, say yay. 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 Any opposed?
Okay, please go ahead and I'll reset your timer. Thanks very much. Uh, I, I too, like Councillor uh, Dominato, have spent a lot of time in Europe. Uh, a lot of my family is in Europe and uh, in Italy and Switzerland, where you can walk down the street with a, a stroller and a glass of wine and, and there aren't any big fights or brawls. It's not like Granville Street. We all know this. Uh, so my question is, is, is have staff talked to VPD about how this, perhaps there's, I mean, 99% of, of people who are going to participate in this are going to do it responsibly. Um, we've seen that, you know, it, it's that idea of earning that, that uh, showing uh, people and, and uh, showing our city that we can do this together, maybe even with park board eventually. Um, I'm just wondering, have, have you talked to the police about how they see the resources around the summer, especially if there is that 1% that is taking up those resources? And, and is there anything that kind of precludes VPD's ability to make sure that this is a safe environment? If there is that one or half a percent, I want to stress that I'm not expecting it to be a lot of people that might not follow the rules. Yeah, so um, there were... Uh the data we got from VPD is that there were no calls related to these sites, uh, related to the drinking. And so um, we haven't heard concerns from them about the, the impact on their operations. And just further to that, was there any confusion as to where the sites were? So if someone's strolling down the street with a, with a beer in their hand thinking that we've turned into Las Vegas. Sorry, I just wanted to, to check in on that as well. Yeah, and uh, that's... Uh, a little challenging for us to know, like we didn't hear that in our feedback, um, but yes, uh, VPD did observe uh, more public drinking overall, um, and so that is something that we could continue to talk with them about, like what does this look like as a, a long-term program. Thanks so much. If I could just add one point to that, which is um, this policy right now is looking direction for the process moving forward, um, but we would continue like we have for the last two years, which is to review the specific locations as they come forward during the application process with VPD to see if they have any flags um, specifically to each location that we're considering. And that would also be um, an ongoing discussion um, with VPD through that, but that's a critical part is not just um, VPD having input for the policy as a whole, but really ensuring that we understand the site-specific concerns um, as those come forward for the locations. Thanks so much. That's great to know. Great. Thanks, uh, Councillor Carr. So, um, uh, some of the questioning actually prompted me to get back on the list. Um, and although I'm, I'm enthusiastic about food trucks, I'm particularly enthusiastic where there aren't bricks and mortar restaurants um, and cafes around me. I just think that you have to approach that uh, carefully with the BIAs because um, I do know of BIAs that have been quite concerned about the location of food trucks adjacent to bricks and mortars restaurants where they're, you know, the competition becomes difficult. So just to make sure there's a careful pursuit of that idea um, with the BIAs. And, um, and secondly, I, uh, there has been a, you know, if there was a field trip by one of the BIAs actually to Montreal to, to look at their plazas, excellent presentation. And um, so it's, I, I love Europe too and have been many times, but, you know, in our own country, we have some good examples of how uh, the public can get engaged um, at a really grassroots community level um, with local businesses in those kinds of plazas. So um, it, it looks like by your nodding that you've seen that presentation. Oh, it's a great presentation, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we all want to go to Montreal. <laughs> okay, is there a question, Councillor Card? Mm, um, asking if they'd seen that. If they've seen the presentation. Yes. Okay, great. Sounds like they have. Okay, excellent. Well, we are uh, at the end of our question queue, so thank you very much. We do have a speaker on the line, so we will um, call on our first speaker to this item, and that is uh, Aaron Bailey who is the program coordinator for the Eastside Illicit Drinkers Group for Education and will be joining us by phone. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You have five minutes and you can please go ahead now. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Aaron Bailey and I'm currently the program coordinator with EDGE, which is the Eastside Illicit Drinkers Group for Education here at Van Du. At, uh, Van du. At the moment, I'm also a graduate student in health promotion, uh, uh, formerly uh, uh, with the Center for uh, Environmental Health Equity at Queen's University. 
I want to speak in full foot support of both this motion, the alcohol consumption in public plazas motion, and, and the one to follow your bylaw extension for the PHS Drinkers Lounge. I think both of these motions are fantastic forms of alcohol harm reduction through planning mechanisms in the city of Vancouver. And I know Edge, as of lately, stuck a bit about how planning and access to public amenities like the plazas is a form of alcohol harm reduction uh, in the city of Vancouver. But, but I'm not sure if folks on council know the history of as to why we, we continue to make this argument. Uh, 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 going back to the 1950s, illicit drinkers have always been singled out as a form of blight, as something to be taken out uh, uh, of the downtown east side. Uh, in the 1970s, this continued. Back in the 1980s, the closure of a liquor store at Man Tastings drove many, many folks to consume things like rice alcohol, which killed many. As of 1988, City of Vancouver placed a moratorium on the issuance of liquor licenses on the downtown east side, which since then, Edge's independent research has figured out caused the loss of, of about uh, 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 1,100 licensed liquor seats at, at the same time as, as drinkers continued to die from accessing unsafe non-beverage uh, uh, alcohol substitutes. And this is to say that I'm in full support of both of these motions as is the membership of Edge. We also urge council to formally include the downtown east side in its alcohol planning activity because its exclusion for the last 50, 60, 70 years has actively killed people. And this is something that Edge wants to work with the city to stop. Um, the, uh, the mayor and council might be aware that Edge has recently launched a campaign to advocate for the opening of a drinker's park in Oppenheimer Park and support of council and support of city staff would, would be really appreciated in doing that. Um, we understand that this plaza's program is quite unique from the parks program, but backing from City of Vancouver to produce a, a safe, peer-governed, peer-staffed, highly visible space for illicit drinkers to be to reduce uh, uh, these alcohol-related harms would be really, uh, uh, incredible uh, for the downtown east side. Uh, you for hearing me today. I think I just prepared to be a a active stored in the alcohol planning process uh, in the downtown east side, and we just hope that council can trust us as as a uh, edge as a edge has demonstrated to the rest of the community that they are capable of, of being neighborhood stewards and an actively organized group for drinkers. Thank you. Thank you very much. You do have questions, so uh, if you'll just stay on the line. Councillor Swanson, three minutes, questions of the speaker. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, coming, Erin. Um, it's really interesting that you're working on this with Edge and Bandu. Um, I just, um, and I have put in a, uh, I'm going to introduce an amendment to the, or an amendment to addition to this recommendation, asking staff to consult with you guys. Um, just if you, um, I know you've talked about this with Edge. How do you visualize managing um, if you had a place where you could do drinking outside in a park or near a park in a plaza? How would you visualize managing it? Okay, I think uh, would that be necessary. I think that's a fantastic question, Councillor Swanson. Thank you for that. And I think this is something that Edge has actively been planning for months now. In fact, uh, since about June of 2021, we actually uh, launched a peer consultation process on the Vancouver Alcohol Strategy, which is a, which is a document that uh, we, together with the PHS Drinkers Lounge, and uh, to Vancouver Coastal Health, that contains about 46, 47 very novel alcohol policy recommendations. And in that document is sort of our vision for peer governed public spaces for drinkers in the neighborhood. I think Edge Edge was the first group within Van Du to establish a sort of a sort of highly effective peer accountability structure. We actually think that drinkers have governed themselves in, in the neighborhood, in our community space, in Oppenheimer for half a century now. And we think that uh extending EDGE's system of accountability 
uh, into such a space as active stewards is very, very possible for us. And in fact, that's what drinkers want. Drinkers feel highly, highly criminalized. And the involvement uh, of the VPD and of bylaw in general is highly, highly discouraged. In fact, that wouldn't be acceptable for drinkers. Um, we also opened up conversations with the Dudes Club about a, uh, a, a novel potential peer security program to ensure that folks are kept safe there as well. Okay, thanks so much, Erin. That's it for me. Thank you, Councilor Swanson. Councilor Fry. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Erin, and uh, good to hear from you here. Um, I just, you know, and expanding on that, I think that the, the pure piece seems to be critical. Um, can we extrapolate the, from that that a lot of this population may otherwise have untoward interactions with police if that is the sort of first point of contact and and why peer support is important? Yes, I think absolutely. I think when a list of drinkers that live or spend time in Zanson East Side and interact with bylaw, with police, it is, uh, they're often, if you ask the VPD, if you ask, if you, if you ask bylaw about this, it is a matter of, um, uh, uh, of discretion, right? But as we know, when police activities take place in that's any side, it could mean intensified criminalization. So what 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 experience typically comes down to ticketing and typically comes down to liquor confiscation and pour outs. Now ticketing might seem as a very minor administrative offense, but if you're living on an extremely low income that that very quickly becomes a tool of criminalization. And with respect to liquor pour outs, many EDGE members, many PHS Pickers Lounge members are folks that live with very chronic, severe, long-term alcohol dependency. And the beer that is being confiscated, that is being poured out, let's say, that might be the beer that was going to prevent that illicit drinker from going into very, very acute alcohol withdrawal symptoms, like seizures, like delirium tremens, like a major cardiovascular event, et cetera. So those, uh, those, so those, are those typical interactions that drinkers have with police, with bylaw? And I should also yep. note, nearly eighty percent of the Edge membership and the Drinkers Lounge membership is uh, uh, Indigenous as well. So, folks are policed in a highly racialized fashion here. Now, you mentioned Van Du and Edge uh, in some of our earlier correspondence. You mentioned a code of conduct and enforcement procedure yes. for peers. What, what does that look like? What's yes. the code of conduct? So, uh, Sure. So, um, uh, uh, so Edge was in fact the uh, first group in Van Duke to uh, produce a code of conduct, which has actually sort of since been taken up by the whole organization. Uh, the uh, the Edge code of conduct, the rules, uh, uh, standards that are applied to peers by peers to ensure that the organization can sort of do its work there. So, with respect to Edge, that's things like, uh, yeah, you're going to be. Uh, at a meeting, had to be sort of in the proper state of mind to be there. If folks have to drink to avoid withdrawals, they can, but they can't be disruptive. They can drink outside. They can drink in the washroom. They can come back in to be present at that meeting. Folks cannot be violent. Folks will have warnings. If a second warning is received, folks won't receive a stipend. If a third warning is received, folks will be removed from that meeting. And sort of all other major transgressions are then referred to the VNDU board, which might result in further sanction. So, so, so Edge really is a self-sustaining organ within Van Du, which I think surprises lots of people because there are these very ugly stereotypes about illicit drinkers as sort of violent, as chaotic, as sort of unable to oversee their own affairs, which I invite anybody to an Edge meeting. That's not the case. It's, it's so quite a beautiful what sight. About a, I think, what about a, what about, a, what about a, sorry, what about a public facing code of conduct where, you know, kids on the block, that kind of thing proximity to playgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, so does sort of edge uh, currently apply such a standard to the neighborhood? Is that your question? You know, yeah. Councillor Fry, I um, failed to remember that we only, that you have three minutes, not five. Uh, so you are well over time. So I'm going to have to oh, pause this I, there. Do appreciate I failed that. to remember that as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, so unfortunately, I have to leave it there. Um, but Aaron, thank you very much for coming to speak to Council and... Um, and we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Councillor Swanson, I see you're on the queue and I'm 
going to assume that's to move the recommendations and end your amendment? That is correct. Okay. I move the recommendation and my amendment. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. Which I so we'll move to an amendment queue, and I'll just ask you to go back on the list. Councilor Genova, I'm just going to have Councilor Swanson move forward. Um, go ahead, Councilor Swanson. Yeah, so this is just an amendment to ask the staff to talk with Edge and Bandu about their proposal. I know this is uh, for plazas, not parks, but maybe there is a place that there could be another plaza in the downtown east side. Um, just to, you know, see if this is possible and and work with them. I think it's a great idea and it's not committing us to anything, but it's except to working with these folks to try and see if we can get something going. I know I've been in Oppenheimer Park a lot and uh, there is a lot of drinking that happens there. Um, I've never been harassed or anything there. Um, people just say hi and that's basically it. Um, so I think this is doable and so we're, if we just ask staff to consult with Van Du and Edge about their proposal and uh, see if we can, if they can take it from there. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Councillor Swanson. Um, Councillor Di Genova to the amendment. Thanks. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask a point of information um, to our staff. If there is any reason that the uh, these groups wouldn't already be involved in consultation if there are other groups that would like to be involved in consultation um, either specifically to some of the to, to speak to some of the issues and the marginalization that we just heard from the speaker but also other groups that have been mentioned such as um, groups outside of BIAs so I, I'm kind of wondering does this cherry pick specific organizations when others on this matter may want to also weigh in, does this kind of give them a preference over others? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, so the policy we're bringing forward today uh, is really a tool to enable our existing plaza partners. And then we realize that there is additional work to do in parallel. And so this would uh, motion fits within that. Um, and uh, we would work closely with our colleagues in ACCS and uh, Park Board uh, to explore this uh, with the partners. But, uh, thanks. I'm uh, just a, another point of information would be these organizations wouldn't be given preference over others in the downtown east side that wanted to address these issues as well, or other organizations that also wanted to input, such as um, you know event committees, organizations, Italian Down the Drive, others that wanted to be involved in that consultation. Is there a place on the website they can say, I want to be consulted or I'd like to reach out to staff and maybe they, they don't get in touch with the counselor or they're not sure how to do that? How do we make sure that we're engaging everyone, including uh, Van Du and Edge? Hey, thanks for your question. It's Alicia Fridkin. I'm an urban health planner with social policy. And uh, we work uh, very closely with Van Du and with engineering and other partners at BIA and the downtown east side around safer spaces for illicit drinkers. So I think there definitely is an opportunity if people are interested to come and reach out to us and we could work with them and the steering committee. There's, a, I think, about uh, maybe about partners involved in that, including nonprofits in the downtown east side. So that, I think that's definitely continue the conversation and make the links with plazas. And I don't think that precludes the work from the hall plazas happening. And yeah, we would look for, invite that. And just a, a point of info to be so specific, but because there's not a place on our website, I've looked for it. I'm not asking to be a specific page to consult, um, you know, this staff group on this issue, but do they reach out to? For those listening that want to be involved, that perhaps active in the BIA, they're either a, a community group or a specific event that happily. Yeah, so for broader interests, we do, um, you could reach out to our group. We have a inbox uh, plazas at uh, vancouver.ca. You can send us an email um, and if there's interest in this type of thing. Thank you very much for noting the email address for those listening. Thanks. That's all. I, I uh, will support the amendment. Actually, that's all for my questions. I will support the amendment. I'm a little bit hesitant to cherry pick certain organizations, um, considering I think there are many voices in the downtown east side and other groups. I, I'm not uh, trying to take away from the work that 
uh, Van Du or Edge do, but I think that there are other groups also uh, that may not know that this is coming forward, that uh, may uh, find out about it later, and I just want to make sure that they're included as well as um, other groups for, throughout our city that may have interest in participating in the engagement and consultation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks. I also wanted to follow up on a point of information through you to staff if I could, um, similar um, to Councillor DeGenova's, but I just want to get some clarification because the answer I heard back and what I heard staff say during the presentation then just now is that they are pursuing work with respect to such as the Drinkers <laughs> Lounge operated run Princess Report 5 that we have with PHS and we're pursuing other opportunities, but they view that as separate work, um, more along the lines of the social policy from this specific report and Am I hearing that correctly? Because I'm just trying to understand why we would be attaching this to this initiative because I heard staff say that they were two different things. Is that not correct? Can I get clarity on that? Just a point of information to staff? Yes, thank you. Uh, the policy we're bringing today is more limited, but the work that we are doing is, is broader. So we already uh, are involved with some of this work with ACCS and uh, the through the Drinkers Lounge work. So this is this work is already underway and it's happening in parallel and it's separate from sort of from the specific focus of this report. That's correct. correct. That's correct. Okay, so it's not it's it's really not from the staff's perspective. You're already doing that, and this is this specific one on your radar, or these opportunities are on your radar. Is that fair to say? Um, yes, it's on our radar. Okay, thank you. I'll let Councillor Fry ask a question. I might come back. Thanks. Hey, Councillor Fry. Yeah, <clears throat> only to speak wholeheartedly in support of this amendment. Um, I've had a number of conversations with uh, with Aaron um, ab about some of the issues, and I and, and I think that these organizations, Vandu and Edge, uh, have a very good handle on on some of the complexities around illicit drinking in the downtown east side, in particular things like like an older, gentler uh, crowd of illicit drinkers. And 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 how they are sometimes impacted by a younger, rowdier crowd of illicit drinkers, and and how do we manage those collective spaces and recognizing that there are a dearth of spaces. Um, so I'm very much in support of this. I and I and I do want to just take a moment to also highlight uh, that Aaron mentioned something that's been uh, weighing heavily on my mind because I've I've lived in the neighborhood since the closure of the liquor store, the government liquor store on Main Street, and watched quite literally as that liquor store closed down. Um, a incredible rise in people drinking Lysol and rice wine uh, as a direct result of losing a government-sanctioned liquor store. And now, of course, the only liquor store on the downtown east side is uh, the one that's owned by the Sahotas. Um, and that, that troubles me deeply. And I, and I think that those pieces, in addition to the moratorium on liquor primaries, um, since we have social service uh, paying attention to this and ACCS following this as well. I, I think that that's a further conversation. I know it's not germane to this, so I'm not going to add it as an amendment, but that is an important conversation that we need to have uh, because it is part of harm reduction and providing that safe access, I think, is critical. Anyway, really happy to support this uh, amendment, and I thank Councillor Swanson for adding it. Great. Thank you very much. Councillor Swanson. Yeah, I think it's important to um, my own mute. You are not on mute. We can hear you. Okay, sorry. I think it's really important to support um, Van Du and Edge. Um, I think they do really good work. Uh, I'd really like to thank Aaron and the folks at Edge for working on this, uh, working on a proposal. And um, I'm, you know, I'm hoping we can see something happen here. Uh, I think it would be really good. Thanks very much, Councilor Swanson. I have a, a question of staff. Um, if I may, I'll just move my, get myself on the queue. Uh, and the question is just if staff could support, based on the conversations that, uh, or the questions you've had so far, discern the difference in the intersection between the, um, we have, of course, the plaza, but then we have the Drinker's Lounge pilot, and then this particular initiative any discerning differences that you could help us understand how each would be, or this particular uh, amendment would be approach that's distinct from particularly the drinker's lounge? Um, so for the 
plaza uh, policy. Um, we really rely on our existing plazas and stewards, and so it's a the policy is geared towards being a programming tool for those spaces. Um, this other work is broader in its, uh, or different in its um, fundamental objective, which is to support illicit drinkers, and uh, maybe Alicia wants to step in here. And so then um, there's broader kind of community outreach in the downtown east side, uh, where we would be working to support that work through uh, Alicia's work in social policy. Thank you. I think all of this comes under the House of Alcohol Harm Reduction. So. Uh, Part of it is you know, the work at the, at the parklet and the broader work that we're doing to create safe spaces for illicit drinkers, which I think this, um, this amendment does fall within. Parks is also part of that conversation. I think it does link to the other places uh, in the city where we're trying to have safer consumption of alcohol. The more places in the city where we allow public consumption of alcohol, where people aren't criminalized, this is the tie to the other projects, but they are uh, separate initiatives, but are all linked through the idea of alcohol harm reduction and decriminalizing people for drinking in public spaces. So, I, and I appreciate that. Just a quick follow-up. Um, I appreciate sort of the overarching principle and I actually am in full support of it. Uh, just to better understand, is this something that would have more of a pop-up nature or more of a um, sort of fixed location like the Drinker's Lounge? It would have a fixed location like the Drinker's Lounge. Okay, so it's quite similar to the Drinker's Lounge is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Okay, great. Uh, okay, well, I'm, uh, I guess, last on the queue here, and I'm very happy to support the amendment. So I think we'll go to a voting queue, please. Great, that motion passes with uh, none in opposition. So we'll go back to the main uh, report and our main queue. And Councillor Swanson, you still have the floor. Not hearing any further I, I support the recommendation, of course. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Councillor Swanson, Councillor Di Genova. No. The amended report. No, you're fine. Hold over. Okay. Councillor Weeb. Um, yeah, I just want to thank staff, and I'm very supportive of the report in front of us today. I think it's been a few years, which has been an opportune time to test out some of these pilots and learn, and through COVID, this is the type of thing that we can build back better and change the way we approach this. I think one of the things that shocked me when we were at Park Board was that conversation about how someone like myself doesn't feel uncomfortable having a beer in public, but others do. And that um, recognizing my privilege and being able to experience alcohol in public compared to others, and that this is a great way to move forward so more people feel comfortable in the city. And I appreciate the way this is being brought forward. So thank you, and I will be supportive. Thank you very much, Councillor Weeb. Seeing no other councillors on the queue, we can go to a vote on the amended report. And that uh, passes with unanimous consent. So thank you very much to staff for your work and your presentation today. We'll now be moving to our seventh item on the agenda today, which is the Type A Advisory Board Review, oh, sorry, Body Review and Improvement Report. And we have Kevin Burris, uh, Manager of Civic Agencies from City Clerk's Office in Chamber to answer questions. And I also see that you have a presentation. So our staff just give a presentation. If council wishes, we, we could do the presentation. Okay, I'll just, uh, Gage, yes, I'm seeing some nods. Move so to we'll waive presentation. I, I Director Dominato. Councilor Dominato, I do see a councilor who would like to see the presentation, Councilor Hardwick, so we're gonna go ahead and see the presentation. It's hard to see in the virtual context. Uh, so over to you, Katrina, thank you. Thanks. Um, Katrina Lakovic, City Clerk. So today we have uh, City Clerk's Office staff here to present Type A Advisory Body Review and Improvement Report. This work began in February 2019 when Council directed staff to undertake a review of the Type A Advisory Bodies and report back to Council by September of 2020. Subsequently at the September 15th, 2020 Council meeting, Council received for information a report responding to this direction, which identified the need for certain expense allowances and improved training for advisory body members. 
During the 2021 budget process, Council approved $72,000 for these purposes. Since that time, staff have worked to identify further improvements and enhancements of the advisory body system. We have Kevin Burris here today, Manager of Civic Agencies, here to provide you with a short presentation on this work to date. Just share my presentation here. So just pause for a moment to allow staff to set up the presentation. All right, thank you very much uh, to the standing committee. So as Katrina mentioned, uh, this report stems from a 2019 council motion directing staff to undertake a review of the city's 12 type A advisory bodies. Advisory bodies are a structured ongoing form of civic engagement, which help to convey community concerns to council and staff while advising on city priorities, projects, and initiatives. In developing this report, clerk's office staff engaged with members in two separate terms, elected officials, staff from across city departments, and staff from comparable municipalities. The report is intended to identify gaps, issues, and problems experienced by advisory bodies and to propose solutions in an effort to improve and maintain an adaptable, modern, well-functioning, and effective advisory body system. Now, municipal projects often follow a similar pattern. A problem is identified and staff are directed... <laughs> I'm quite tall. <laughs> are directed to assess solutions and report back. However, we really hope that the solutions proposed here will enable staff and advisory body members to move forward with a more responsive and dynamic culture of continuous improvement, allowing for issues to be addressed as they arise. There are several elements which will feed into this culture, in particular, council development of strategies and directions, ongoing engagement and consultation with advisory body members and internal stakeholders, and ongoing evaluation of best practices through literature reviews and connections with similar municipalities. Overall, research uncovered several issues which are common to advisory body systems and are not unique to the City of Vancouver. These are misunderstandings of the purpose of advisory bodies, per perceptions of tokenism or rubber stamping, and communications and interpersonal challenges. When this report was initially conceived, it was thought that restructuring or amalgamation of some advisory bodies might help, but research has since shown that these issues persist regardless of structure and that there is actually little enthusiasm among members for any sort of amalgamation. Staff have identified four main principles leading to success in advisory body systems. These are clarity of purpose, alignment with council priorities, social and professional support, and robust communications and conflict resolution protocols. Research findings are produced in detail in the report itself, but we wish to uh, draw attention to several key data points. Since 2020, and in light of improved training implemented in 2021, perception surveys indicate that advisory body mandates are better understood by members, and that members are more comfortable participating in meetings. In terms of advisory body demographics, we determine strong representation or parity with the broader population for Indigenous peoples, persons with disabilities, members of the 2S LGBTQ plus community, and people who identify as women. However, due to the identity-based nature of many advisory bodies, representation tends to be concentrated into one or two committees. And a, a main goal of upcoming recruitments will be to improve representation and intersectionality across the entire system. Recruitment will also focus on populations with weak representation, including racialized persons, first-generation immigrants, people with low incomes, and residents of Southeast Vancouver. For the purposes of the report, we've grouped identified issues and solutions into five themes. These are clarity, support, engagement, access, and communications. I'll briefly go through each of these and highlight improvement actions that have been undertaken or are planned. And please note, this will not be an exhaustive list of the report contents. 
Members identified a broad lack of understanding and clarity in terms of roles and responsibilities, scope, expectations and values, accountability processes, and the core purpose of advisory bodies. To address this, staff are developing more comprehensive recruitment materials so that applicants may better understand what they are signing up for. Staff have also proposed updates to terms of reference to standardize language, better convey, better convey roles and mandates, and codify existing ad hoc practices. And we'll also be uh, revising the guidelines for advisory bodies in line with these changes. And finally, in 2021, staff provided enhanced training to advisory bodies, including sessions focused on process, conduct, communications, and privacy. And this training will be further refined for future terms. Now, while members generally express uh, satisfaction with the support received from advisory body liaisons, these are council liaisons, staff liaisons, and external liaisons from other civic bodies, there is an occasional blurring of roles. In the absence of adequate training, members may assume that they have greater authority or influence than is actually the case. And conversely, they may be expected to act as pseudo decision makers or to conduct unpaid labor that would be better allocated to staff. As part of the overall redesign of advisory body training, staff are developing improved training and criteria for advisory body staff liaisons, integrating council liaison information into council orientation, and clarifying expectations for external liaisons. Advisory bodies have consistently reported feeling tokenized or treated as a rubber stamp during public consultation processes. Staff groups may consult with advisory bodies without explaining how a given project or initiative relates to a relevant mandate, without allowing enough time for recommendations to be implemented, or without any clear plan to follow up and explain how recommendations affected a given project or initiative. This is not a reflection on those staff groups, but rather it's been a result of a prior lack of process clarity and consistency. Staff have implemented a new engagement request form, which is included as uh, Appendix E of the report, which is allowing for more considered engagement across the entire system. Further, staff are, are planning on developing an advisory body motion tracker, which will allow for quick reference to past decisions and engagements. And as part of the revisions to training and guidelines, we'll be simplifying and clarifying the tools available for conveying recommendations to council and staff. Traditionally, advisory bodies have been inaccessible to a range of community members. Many residents face systemic financial, educational, professional, physical, or cultural barriers to participation, and so staff have developed a range of actions intended to make the entire advisory body system more accessible, particularly to underrepresented communities. Work is ongoing to decolonize advisory body practices and spaces, including a pilot program to suspend the motion requirement to enable more informal and consensus-based decision-making in the meetings. Further, the city now offers reimbursement for certain expenses associated with attending meetings. In terms of representation, staff will continue tracking advisory body demographics and are developing a communications plan to improve recruitment and outreach in underrepresented communities. Now, as in any group, there is potential in advisory bodies for communication to break down, and outside of actual meetings, research also showed broad confusion around internal and external communications involving advisory bodies. The measures listed here are intended to facilitate uh, respectful interactions in advisory bodies, to standardize and clarify communications processes, and to enable improved succession planning between terms. Three advisory bodies are currently participating in a pilot program to extend SharePoint access to members, which will allow for easier collaboration and record keeping within the boundaries of provincial privacy legislation. Staff will also continue providing targeted anti-oppression and conflict resolution training in partnership with an external consultant. And finally, staff are working to simplify existing communications protocols relating to the media and outside organizations, and ongoing support for social media use is also available. The majority of improvement measures outlined in this report are able to move forward without council action. Specific council action will be required to re-establish the advisory bodies and update terms of reference for the next term, and potentially update the uh, procedure bylaw based on the outcomes of the motion suspension pilot. This is why we've recommended that this council forward all recommendations to the incoming 2022-2026 council. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. We're ready to field any, any questions or comments you may have.
Great. Thank you very much, Kevin, for that uh, excellent presentation. We do have uh, Councillor Carr on for questions. Go ahead, Councillor Carr. Thank you. Um, very much appreciate the report. Solid and good recommendations, um, so thank you for that. Uh, the one area that I don't feel has been well um, defined or delved into is the role of council liaisons and um, training provided um, sort of a standardized um, expectation around the role that's played. I think it varies a lot from committee to committee right now, and um, yeah, I've seen it vary over different terms. Um, I've seen council liaisons be very proactive, for example, um, in, um, in um, sort of encouraging motions to come forward from the um, body, um, so actually planting the ideas or helping write motions, et cetera, and, and others not. So I'm wondering if you could perhaps um, explain how you would see consistency amongst, that liais uh, amongst the liaisons and a training uh, for what role we play and what is expected of us in terms of the reports we give um, at the beginning of each one of our um, committee meetings. Certainly, yeah. So as part of uh, developing the orientation for the incoming council, we will be including information for the actual council liaisons on advisory bodies. So that'll be part of that training that goes forward. Really, I think it'll be uh, key to, as you said, sort of introduce some, some consistency into what information is provided to council liaisons, particularly um, uh, letting council liaisons know that the expectation is not necessarily that they be a representative of their committee on council, but rather they're a point of information for the, for the committee. And so um, th this is something that'll be part of the, the committee training as well, that uh, the expectation should not necessarily be that the committee uh, has an idea or passes a recommendation or something like that, and then it's the councillor's job to bring that to council and represent that faithfully, but rather that um, the councillor is more there to assist the advisory body in uh, maintaining scope or staying within scope, staying within mandate, and also bringing information to the committee that might be of interest to them, which they can then develop recommendations on. But the expectation is not that uh, the, the councillor be a, a representative of the committee on council, and that'll be conveyed through the training. That's a, that's a, a really good point. Um, not being a representative in council is one aspect of that, um, but I've also seen some liaisons who are representing the committee in communications with senior staff. Mm -hmm. um, so um, if there could be consistency, I think, and, and um, an understanding that is universally shared as to whether or not that should happen, if um, a council liaison should just provide um, and, and maybe ask for the support of the count, uh, well, anyway, to provide information to the chair of the committee, the vice chair of the committee regarding who they might be and how they might access um, if there other information from staff. That, I think that would be very helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hardwick. Thank you very much. Um, I'm interested in the uh, the logistics of this and the cost of it. How many headcount have been added uh, to this area of, of supporting the advisory committees in the last couple of years since we've been on council? Do, do you mean in terms of staff, Councillor? Yes. Um, we have added uh, myself as manager of civic agencies, and we currently have one uh, committee clerk. The rest of the um, uh, administrative support is provided by meeting coordinators in the, uh, in the city clerk's office. And then in terms of staff liaisons, I believe there are only one or two committees that have more than one staff liaisons. For the other ones, it has remained at one staff, staff liaison per committee. So that would be uh, 12 to 14, if I'm counting right. And that, that you has You also remained. mentioned external consultants. Oh, right. So the external consultant was uh, brought in to develop, uh, develop and deliver specific anti-oppression training, which was um, in response to certain uh, incidents that had happened within advisory committee meetings and something that had been requested by the committees themselves. So that was something that was provided by an external consultant with expertise in that area. 
So um, how much did that cost? And uh, what I'm getting at is overall, the we've added headcount, we've added consultants, we've added liaison, uh, uh, and you know, what's the magic number adding it all up? Is it half a million dollars? Is it a million dollars? Uh, what is the overall budget impact of all of this? And I see Katrina has, um, is at the podium to answer your question potentially. To the first part of the question, so the cost of the anti-oppression training was $12,000, um, which was split between the equity office budget and the uh, city clerk's office budget. And that included the development of approximately uh, two hours of informational videos and then 12, um, no, 10 um, uh, debrief sessions with the actual members, which were facilitated by, by uh, staff of the external consultant. Okay, still looking for an overall number on uh, all of this activity and the cost, additional cost to, uh, this, to the taxpayers. So the number that was uh, approved by council for the 2021 term was $72,000 in addition to the $12,000 uh, that had been the budget for about two decades prior. So currently it is $84,000 budgeted. We have saved quite a bit of money in the last two years, um, somewhat unfortunately due to the pandemic because the meetings have been uh, online. There's also been uh, an increase in the actual number of meetings um, due to uh, working sessions being provided in it as well as um, as well as the regular meetings but everything has been online up to now we are looking at going back in person so those numbers will so will uh, be more in line with the actual right uh, we've also seen reports recently about um, significant headcount increases with uh, city staff and the the shocking number of employees with six-figure salaries which was pushing 1800 overall so what i'm trying to get at here is not is not the uh, this, the small amount, I'm looking at the, the larger amount of the impact of this approach to uh, expansion of, of the advisory committees. Councillor Hardwick, if I may just add to what, what Kevin said. Um, as he mentioned, the, the changes to meeting support has not changed since at least 1999. It might have been even earlier. So that's over 20 years. We have done this as a comprehensive look at meeting support for council in terms of um, council meetings, uh, standing committees, public hearings, and all the other meetings, including advisory bodies that we support. The eight meeting coordinators that support all of these meetings for, for those two decades uh, had not changed. However, the length of meetings, the number of hours required, the number of speakers, the, the lengths of reports, that's all changed. So in terms of adding support to these other meeting types, nothing has changed. But we have looked at adding support for advisory bodies that have increased in number, scope, um, and the work required. So that's the way we've managed the uh, overall staffing for all of these meeting types. It's, we've looked at it comprehensively. Thank you very much for that answer. I don't know how I'm doing on time here, but scope I think is really at the heart of what I'm getting at because there has been what I would consider scope creep and that's what I'm, I'm pushing are. for more understanding. But thank you, I, I think I'm out of time. Yes, you're at your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks. I, I want to delve into a little bit around um, trying to set these advisory bodies up for success and if they're actually working now. Um, and I, I, I would actually argue that I don't think that they are effectively. Um, and I think that there's a rethink that needs to happen. So I'm looking, for example, in the report around um, terms of reference, and it says language around better detail, uh, conveying detail, mandate, scope, responsibilities, um, et cetera, including relationships with council, et cetera. I guess I'm drilling into, let me preface this question with an observation to try to illustrate it. Um, what I see is not a setting a grounding in terms of knowledge around specific subject areas that's given to these committees at the beginning. And what I see is not a scope or a mandate or these are things that are currently important to the, the city of Vancouver and initiatives where we would like to have them weigh in. It's I've seen a much more open, um, kind of undefined approach to letting the committees decide what it is that they would like to work on, which may or may not sometimes align with some of the priorities and work of the city. And it can vary so dramatically from committee to committee. So I'm just wondering if staff can provide some perspective and comment on that, if that has changed over the years, because I've honestly seen these committees, a lot of them floundering 
quite a bit um, in not knowing, particularly when there have been a lot of new folks um, and some of the history has been lost if there aren't subject matter areas and people have been brought in to represent um, specific communities or points of view, but ne not necessarily with having had the benefit of being grounded in some of the city context. And I see them floundering and not supported for success. So do staff have comments around how mandate or scope could better be defined? Because I'm not seeing that substantively in the report, but I'd love to hear if you feel differently or you can offer a point of view on that. Certainly, thanks for the question. Um, this speaks a little bit to, to what uh, Councillor Hardwick had just mentioned about scope creep as well. Um, one of the things that is uh, going to be very important going forward is ensuring that the committees are aware of what current council priorities are and aligning with those essentially. And that's a bit of a, a, a tricky balance to walk with the committees themselves because we don't want to, as staff, be telling them um, as members of the public or as residents of Vancouver, you can only be talking to council about one thing or the other thing. But it is helpful to provide at the beginning of the term and then reinforce throughout the term for the members of the committees um, what are the big goals of, of a specific council. And these this council has outlined, uh, I believe, five of them quite specifically. So a lot of it comes down to, as you mentioned, the initial setup of the committees, letting them know um, what the uh, somewhat parameters of their action is, what their ability is, um, what the scope of their action is. Because sometimes, you know, if a committee begins uh, trying to make recommendations on something that is maybe the purview of the provincial or the federal government, then that's a place where uh, it will be up to us as staff and staff liaisons from other departments to step in and say, you know, this might be beyond what uh, this, this committee is actually capable of dealing with. Um, but yeah, essentially, um, in terms of mandate, in the terms of reference, uh, we have included a line about um, aligning with council. The goal is really for um, the committees to uh, bring community concerns while advising on the initiatives and projects and priorities of a given council. That doesn't mean why, that they why, don't. Why, why did that change? Why are we not doing that now? Because I haven't seen that information being shared with the committees on what the priorities of council are and giving them sort of a bit of a, a sense of here's the priorities and here's how this committee might relate to it and areas that they the committee could work on or might want to weigh in that how did how did we get to that gap was there a change in philosophy or process or are we now pulling back to what we had before or what what happened so that information on the council priorities was provided to the uh, committees in the uh, training that was provided at the beginning of this term in 2021. So for the most part, the committees are aware of uh, what this council's priorities are. Um, there are cases, of course, where some will go beyond that and seek to um, uh, perhaps champion other causes or things like that. But as, as I mentioned, then it's really up to us as staff to um, kind of make them more aware of what the actual priorities are. And so part of that going forward will be, as I mentioned, the staff liaison training, making sure that staff understand their role within keeping the committees within scope. Thank you. Chair, can I move for a second round? Sure. Uh, second round of questions. All those in favor? Any opposed? Aye. Okay. We are on for a second round. Councilor Kirby Young, you can go back on the list after Councilor Dominato. Thank you. Councilor Dominato, over to you. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. It was really thorough. I have a couple of questions with respect to, um, I note from the report that the guidelines for advisory bodies are not being um, updated at this time or not included. Is that correct? They will be updated this year, but we have not started the update yet. They're generally uh, reviewed and updated every two years. Okay, thank you. Um, I, 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 as I guess part of that question is I, I raise the um, <clears throat> concern that um, that advisory bodies were, you know, guided and given direction that in order to get information, um, uh, they needed to move motions, and I'm and I really wrestled with that and found it extremely frustrating that when I, as an elected councillor representing the public, would go and seek information on behalf of the committee, was told no, they need to move a motion. And so I, I'd like some clarity as to whether that will be looked at and revisited as part of that review, because 
I fundamentally think it was wrong. I, I believe that when they asked for information that would be reasonable to access, that the committee should have been able to get that information via my request. And so will that be revisited as part of that review? Certainly. And I think that um, uh, any understanding that a an official motion would be required to uh, request information from staff um, was possibly a misunderstanding of the actual rules, which would maybe reflect uh, uh, not conveying the rules effectively to the actual committees at the time. But but that's certainly not, if, if a committee needs information from staff, they are certainly well within their rights to, to send an email and ask for, for that information. So uh, a motion is not required in that, and that's something that we can definitely focus in on uh, in both the revisions to the advisory body guidelines and in the training that happens for the next term. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, can you clarify for me, um, I'm, I'm noting in the red line of the, um, uh, in the appendix around the um, roles and responsibilities and scope of committees, I'm assuming all the red line is, is new. Um, there's reference to uh, accountability to council and specifically that um, uh, advisory bodies will now do prepare work plans which will be submitted to council they will report out on accomplishments at year end and is i guess a couple of things one is this new um two what's the rationale for having uh, that level of, of um kind of information flowing to council and i'm not clear if it's for approval or simply for information um but i I'm really trying to get my head wrapped around sort of if that's new information and what the rationale and background for it was for that. Sure. So those are not new uh, measures. The committees have always had uh, a requirement that they submit a uh, work plan to council and a uh, annual report at the end of the year. And then another reporting mechanism is the Council of Councils, which has not been held, unfortunately, for the last couple of years due to COVID. <laughs> um, but actually, we have uh, reduced the, we, we have heard pretty loud and clear from members that this has become a little bit of an administrative burden for them. And so we've actually reduced the requirements, whereas previously it was that they were expected to submit a work plan to council at the beginning of each year. We've now asked that they just submit a single work plan within six months of their first meeting, um, which will essentially form the guiding document for the remainder of the term. Of course, it's it's uh, subject to review and revision as things come up, um, but that is not a, a new thing. And also the, the the idea is more for council's information rather than council's approval. Okay, thank I'm you. I'm going to ask then, everyone to go on mute. We just got quite a bit of background noise. Go ahead, Councilor uh, Yeah, Thank you, Chair. And I guess that the, um, thank you for that. I, I want to also circle back on um, a comment that, a question that Councilor Carr was raising around the role of council liaison. And I think I heard you say that the role of council liaisons was to play a role in, in, uh, managing kind of roles and responsibilities and, and scope of the committee um, and understanding their scope and role and responsibilities. And I'm curious as to why that would fall to a council liaison and why that would not be the role of a combination of the chair and the staff clerking these committees. If it's clearly articulated what the roles and responsibilities of the advisory body are in the terms of reference, then in, it, to me, it's incumbent on the chair and potentially staff to be playing that role versus council liaisons who can't always be there due to conflicts to be managing that. Um, and so maybe you could speak and elaborate on that and what that really means. Yeah, I appreciate the question. We're, we're right um, at it, the five minutes. So Kevin, if you could hang on to that response and perhaps Council Dominato, you could come back on the queue and hear the answer to that question. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Councilor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I also want to pick up on that, um, actually, because that's where I was going and trying to really understand the role for council and, uh, you know, pick up on Council Dominato's question in terms of what role staff play, because I've seen staff sort of, um, I don't mean this to be a negative word, but more passively support as opposed to actively defining scope and um, parameters for the committees and to the point where sometimes the committees have looked around a bit helplessly and the, the response has been that staff provide administrative support to committees but not necessarily that direction or guidance um, and so I'd like to understand that I'd also like to understand better the role of counselors I know this might have been touched on a bit er earlier um, but I see counselors attending some of these advisory committee meetings they may or may not be the liaison to a committee and essentially shopping and asking for 
a mandate um, on emotion or an idea and validating emotion and bringing it back. And so can you speak to both of those components around the role of counselors? Because I'm, and I'm asking replace, I'm deeply concerned. I feel like we are really not respecting the time and effort and setting these committees up to deliver value for their own participation and to the city. That's my two parts around scope and role. Sure. So for the first part of the question, um, you know, as you observe, there are times when the committees themselves feel a little bit unmoored or possibly unaware of the uh, um, what their scope is, what their abilities are within the civic engagement system. And that's something that we have recognized through this research and through observing those meetings. And so that's definitely something that uh, we are going to be addressing as part of the staff liaison training that I had mentioned, really empowering staff liaisons to be able to take an active role within the committees in helping them understand mandate and scope and things like that. Um, and then for actual counselor involvement, um, it may be playing semantics a bit, but I, I would say less uh, managing than more assisting with, with scope and things like that. Um, if there's something that's kind of blatantly obvious that, that uh, it, it, a recommendation is being made if it's a case where, as I had mentioned earlier, maybe it's a provincial or a federal jurisdiction and the counselor knows that it, it, that it maybe isn't going to go anywhere, has that knowledge, then just assisting with that knowledge with the committee. But the, the expectation is not that that counselors be uh, guiding or, or directing the committee in any way. Um, and again, or, are, or attending an, a committee meeting if they're not the liaison and shopping a motion that might be on federal jurisdiction for endorsement, for example. I'm going to ask the explicit question. Um, I could give a whole a, a whole number of different examples that I've seen um, transpiring. Would that be inappropriate? Counselors are, um, I mean, they are welcome to uh, attend meetings, even if they are not the council liaisons. Um, it would be a matter of whether. Uh, it's considered uh, appropriate for the counselor themselves what what um, they are bringing to the the committee essentially. I don't understand what that means, and I think that that's where we get into issues because there are all kinds of things happening, and I think some counselors are trying to follow playing the support, provide information, guidance role. Others are using um, potentially um, attending committees and requesting. Is that one way if I can put that? Um, thoughtfully um, validation for motions. So I'm seeing I'm seeing them utilized in different ways and I'm I'm not hearing explicit clarity. And I guess that's what I'm looking for in understanding the intent um, from staff in the report that we're going to have consistency um, and equity in how these the counselors roles and how these committees are supportive for success. So is there a question, uh, Councillor Kirby? I'm just to sort of bring up. Yes, my point. question is, I'm, I'm not, I'm not clear from that if it is or isn't appropriate for councillor to do that and to bring a motion and attend, for example, another council meeting or to shop, workshop motions. I, I, I wasn't clear on the answer. I, I believe Kevin said that that would not be the role of the council liaison on the advisory committee. That it would be uh, to guide. I think the word was and and to act as an advisor. So, um, I just want to sort of bring us into. That clarity well, question. That, okay, I heard that. I heard that initially first, and then I heard a contradiction. That's why I was asking, Chair. But I think this is. I think this is um, using up my time, so I'm going to pause there to say what I have. Thanks. Okay. Um, so th those are all your questions right now, Councillor Kirby Young. Yes, I've lost connection. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Genova. Thanks. Um, I, I actually, I have a few questions and they're along the same lines, but it's a little bit different. I've been here for two terms. I've been liaisons to different committees. And I take it upon myself with the staff liaison report when I'm able to deliver it, when I'm not in public hearing. I have two committees that meet on the same day, usually at the same time. So I try and split my time. But in the liaison um, report that we, the section where usually on the agenda, I would assume all committees have it, all that I've seen do, I can report back on what I know. Um, but most of our hours are spent here in council, so I can pick for the Women's Advisory Committee. These are the issues that I think, you know, in, in uh, just a few minutes, because they only have that committee meeting, um, are pertinent to your committee and your work plan and the work that you're doing. But I don't know what staff across the entire organization are doing. And I understand there's a staff liaison update, but how do we kind of level set 
so that council liaisons know what it is we're supposed to be bringing forward. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Councillor um, uh, Kirby Young brought up a very good point. You know, this isn't a place to kind of shop things around. That being said, there are advisory committees that have asked council to bring motions. So, sorry, I'm just trying to frame the question up. How is it that we level set that? You know, I, it might be a little late for this council, but how do we do that in the future? I think um, through the training, through the both the training that will be uh, as part of the council orientation and also the training that's being developed right now, I should have mentioned prior, um, will involve input from this current council, essentially, you know, what are what are some things that you have learned? And so that can be a part of, of what goes into the uh, information that is provided to the next council on their role within advisory committees, what might be helpful for them. Um, as for level setting, it's, it's a little bit difficult because we want to create consistency across the system, but the reality is that there is always going to be some variation between the committees. For example, as you mentioned, some may be asking for motions to come to them. Some may not want that. And so really uh, being able to be somewhat flexible within the rules that we create, but making it clear for uh, councillors what uh, is the role uh, well, sorry, what is the councillor liaison's role? And then, as you mentioned, for other things that you maybe don't know about the exact staff details or, or staff projects or things like that, making sure that, again, the staff liaison is empowered and uh, has the broader knowledge of the city, of what's going on in the city, to be able to provide that to the actual councillors, wh where maybe the council liaison doesn't have that explicit knowledge. Is that sort of, does that I, no, answer that the question? that totally answers that question. Um, I'm wondering, do, is there any consideration to giving committees, if it's chairs or committees, here's an update since your last meeting about the items that council dealt with. That's a great idea. <laughs> And it's something that we, we have talked about. It's not something that we've implemented across uh, all of the staff liaisons, but it's definitely something that we're looking at standardizing and again, creating that consistency with don't the Don't worry, liaisons. I don't have an amendment. I don't think you need <laughs> one to, to incorporate that if you choose to, correct? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also wondering, you had talked about this work plan and it kind of needs to be developed in the first six months. Well, there's only usually two meetings in the first six months. Mm -hmm. And the first one is, Hi, we're all here. Maybe we elect a chair. Um, I'm wondering, has there been consideration to maybe actually in that first six months having a couple of extra meetings? I know it's tough to clerk them and staff them, but it might help in the long run to have a few extra meetings, even if people can attend, you know, virtually to help to get there because the clerk's meetings are the only place where you can really have those ideas, you know, the working sessions. There could be more working sessions, but they're not structured. So, so how, how do you kind of reconcile that, you know, giving more time as a group to develop that work plan? Absolutely, and, and that's exactly it, is in future trainings, we are looking at providing more time. Uh, this term in 2021, we had uh, provided a session before the first regular meeting where members were able to get together, get to know each other, and develop some community expectations for how the group would operate. Um, based on that, we're looking at adding even another one um, that is essentially an informal working session prior to them getting into their official regular meetings, which would uh, be a space where potentially staff groups could come to them and say, you know, here are the things that you are likely going to be consulted on um, over the course of your term. And then that information could, could uh, inform the development of the work plan over that first six months of official meetings. Thanks okay, so that's much. the end. Thank that's you all. very much. Yep, perfect. I, I, we're going into a second round of questions. I just have a quick question before we do go into a second round, and that is related to... Um, uh, if, if there is sort of an extreme case where there is sort of egregious sort of overstepping of roles and what have you, um, is there a place for the integrity commissioner there to be consulted upon and advise um, to sort of support what we're hearing in a number of these questions related to conduct and appropriate sort of, um, we're hearing about 
canvassing for motions and things like that, just what would be appropriate? And has there been a conversation that you've had with the integrity commissioner in terms of these guidelines and go forward? And if not, would that be something you do in the future to make sure that they're up to speed on how it works? Absolutely. And we actually, the, the, um, the appointment of the integrity commissioner and the creation of the current code of conduct for council and advisory bodies, body members has been hugely helpful for us as staff in sort of creating a common set uh, or a common understanding of the rules that we're dealing with here. And so if there is a situation, like you said, if someone oversteps or if there is something potentially unethical happening or a breach of the code of conduct happening, we now have a person in the integrity commissioner who we can who can help uh, address that either informally or formally. They have a few different mechanisms that they can use. And we are looking at um, uh, working with the integrity commissioner in the development of training for the next term so that that code of conduct information is, is very clear for members. And that's available for counselors, but of Yes. Uh, advisory committee, our advisory body members yes. as well. Yeah. Okay. Those, that's all my questions for now. Councilor Dominato, um, I think you're awaiting a response. So hopefully, Kevin still has that. Over. Yes, and I have a second question. Thank you. Okay. Can Can you remind me, Councilor, was it about the 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 management of the of scope? Councilors managing scope. Um, yes, I believe my last question was with respect to. Um, I think you addressed that, though, to be honest, I think in a question that Councillor Kirbyano addressed. So how about we just move on from that, um, right. just in the interest of time. I do have one question, and, I, I'm, I, and I'm, I'll, the context for the question is this. My observation has been there are a couple of high-functioning advisory <laughs> groups um, that were really able to um, provide input into, um, for example, draft strategies that were coming to council that informed council decision-making. And that's how I have, in my role in advisory bodies, has been is that they're, you're able to provide that input and inform decision-makers. Um, I'm curious if you have considered, sorry, it's my dog. I'm going to go outside for a moment. Um, I'm curious if you have considered um, leveraging the experience of those a handful of advisory committees that were really effective in informing um, uh, uh, draft strategies, informing council decision making, um, and to utilize them as peers in educating other advisory committees and uh, in, in, in terms of ways to do that. Um, and was that a conversation that came up as part of your consultation? Yeah. So, if I'm if I'm understanding the 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 question, is it that are, are we looking at ways to kind of um, leverage the the experience or the knowledge of those committees, which uh, we might consider more established or more high functioning, uh, in 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 the assistance of creating consistency across the the system? Yes, because I think you've you've got some really well established committees that really um, I I they came to council they presented they were able to inform some of our decision making um, and I definitely um, uh, I think that they could serve as uh, as role models if you will uh, to some of the other advisory committees and and to inform hey this is how we approached giving advice to council on these issues. Um, and then, uh, so I, I'm wondering if that came up in the research and the consultation you did and whether that might be utilized as a model to sort of uh, build capacity across the committees. Mm -hmm. I, it hasn't come up, I think, exactly as you're, you're envisioning it, but I do think it's a great idea, um, you know, not to, not to single any particular committees out, but uh, persons with disabilities, for example, um, has a lot of well members who have been on the committee for a long time. They're well aware of kind of the systems and forms within uh, civic government, and so they tend to be very effective in producing motions and recommendations uh, for council. And so I, I do think it's a, a good idea to potentially, as, as part of um, the guidelines or as part of training going forward, maybe even creating uh, uh, hypothetical scenarios or, or looking at past scenarios that that, that committee has dealt with and, and uh, using that to, to educate other committees on, on how they dealt with it at the time. Great, thank you. That, that, that's definitely what I'm getting at mm -hmm. is, is how do you leverage that experience um, for the benefit of all committees and um, so that the committees are able to inform and uh, we're all able to get that information as well as council to inform our decision making. And so it's really a win-win. So uh, I appreciate, sir, you taking that away. Thank you. And that's it for me, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. 
Councillor Dominato. Councillor Weeb. Um, yeah, I guess my question might be through to the city manager because it does talk about um, putting two members of staff or pointing up two members of staff. I find that as being on advisory committees for up to eight years, the strength of the staff liaison is a critical element on the strength of these advisory committees. So I want to hear from yourself on how do we expect that we can increase the capacity or training or do we see coming out of COVID there's better opportunities because I think that plays a key role on ensuring they have good information to help create and form good decision making. Yeah, thanks very much for the question, Councillor. I think Kevin's spoken to the training piece, so we're, we're going to be looking to set a much more level baseline, I believe, for the staff liaisons. Um, and appreciate your point that it is a critical role. I think one of the challenges we face often is many of our seniors, there's, there's a workload component of this, which is very difficult for, for some of our senior staff to manage in addition to their regular job. So that's the trade-off we're trying to, we're trying to navigate is, is the demand on those folks in terms of their other work. But um, no, no dispute or debate on, on the point that you've raised is, is those rules are key and we're gonna look to do whatever we can to make sure that they're the right staff and that they have all the support they need to be effective in that role. Perfect, thank you very much, appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Weeb. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, I just want to follow up on one point. Have we considered any, and it's sort of an entirely different construct where we use these committees to bring forward specific reports or areas for development solely, for example, during a term that are important. I remember I sat on one years ago, develop a cultural tourism strategy, and that group had a very clear purpose, and we're brought together as they had perspective. Have we considered an approach? that is very um, specific around using their input specifically on civic policies for things that can move things forward in the city. Are you referring to um, uh, ideas for civic policy coming directly from the, the committees or? No, or no, I'm referring to initiatives that are coming forward from staff on potential policy, whether it's supporting, you know, the using children, youth and families to get their input on, how, on developing housing policy and family supportive housing, things of that nature. I'm referring to doing, going the other way. Have we considered that? Just a short answer, so, Kevin. So that that does happen. So staff tend to, uh, most of the, well, all of the committees uh, have staff presentations in their committee meetings, generally around the development of some policy or initiative. And we'll typically, uh, persons with disabilities, again, is a great example of this as a seniors, um, will develop a motion around their uh, recommendations on that policy or, or initiative. I'm out of time, I'm sorry. Uh, that's great. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Uh, so that does end our uh, questions to staff, and we will now hear from our speakers. Uh, we do have um, our first speaker on the line, who is Eddie Elmer, co-chair of the 2SLGBTQ Plus Advisory Committee. And Eddie, are you there on the line? I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, you're welcome to start. Uh, you have five minutes to speak to council. Wonderful. Um, and if I'm long it would be helpful if you can remind me. Uh, when I'm halfway through my, uh, through my minutes, it would be helpful. So my name is Eddie Elmer. I'm from the Mayor of the... I'm hearing a lot of feedback here. Um, I am co-chair of the City of Vancouver 2S LGBT. Eddie, it's very hard to hear you. Sure. I'm hearing a lot of, I'm hearing a lot of, like, I'm hearing my own voice. <laughs> oh, you have an echo on the line. I do. It's really distracting. Just a moment. Um, I'm just going to allow the clerks a moment to see if there's anything we can do on our end to support that. Okay. I've turned off my speakerphone, so. I have, I'm just resetting your timer as well. Okay. Fine. Is it any better now? Uh, testing, testing, testing. No, I can still hear myself. <laughs> you could always disconnect and recall in. Just a moment. Okay. You've muted your computer, I'm sure, already. Is that correct? I have, and I'm, and I'm using earphones, so yeah. there's no... Well, it's it's your it's up to you. We do have one other speaker. You could, if it's too distracting, you're welcome to disconnect and reconnect, and we'll hear from the other speaker and then come right back to you. Okay. Let me just. I'll turn down my volume here. Okay. Um, can you still hear me now? We can hear you. Okay. Super. Okay. Let's try this. Um, okay. 
So I'm Eddie, I'm co-chair of the City of Vancouver TS LGBTQ Advisory Committee and have been in this role for nearly two years. And prior to this, I was on the Seniors uh, Advisory Committee for, I think, seven years. Uh, our committee is very pleased to see this report, which offers many useful suggestions for improving the utility and functioning of advisory committees. Uh, before I comment on specific recommendations, I, I really would like to offer a very sincere thank you to Kevin Burris uh, for the time, thoughtfulness, and attention to detail that obviously went into this report. I know that he's gone out of his way to solicit feedback from committees and individual members about ways that committees can be improved. Uh, I know he spent innumerable hours on the phone with, with several of us carefully listening to our concerns and suggestions, and I'm pleased to see that many of these suggestions have been included in this report, which we feel demonstrates a, a great degree of respect to us as advisory committee members. Um, I'd like to address a few of the recommendations based on feedback I've heard from our committee, from joint committee meetings, as well as conversations with individual committee members from this committee and others. Um, number one, we're pleased to see a recommendation for hybrid meetings. Uh, this is what the majority of our committee members voted for. Uh, exclusively in-person meetings tend to favor those who are young and fairly healthy while presenting barriers to people for reasons of health, mobility, transportation, family obligations, time constraints, and of course ongoing concerns about the pandemic. Removing this barrier is critical for advancing equity and having participation from the widest range of people. Uh, on the topic of barriers, we're pleased to see some mention of honoraria for members, which we think is important to improve committee recruitment and retention. We would have preferred that this be an explicit recommendation in line with practices in other cities, but it's good to see that at least it is flagged as an area for further study. Uh, we've been in touch with other committees about exploring this further and liaising with members of the nomination committee to explore the value of honoraria and the logistical details. Um, number three, many of us are pleased with the recommendation that terms be extended from two to four years, which we feel is critical for the continuity of committee work and preservation of institutional knowledge. Um, one thing we would like to see more of is reappointments of people who are willing to serve more than one term. These individuals tend to be very, very valuable because they're committed to their work and have a longer term time perspective. Uh, on my committee, I was the only returning member last term. Um, I'm not sure if this is just because nobody else had reapplied, but it has been my understanding that some members from uh, previous council's term were not reappointed to this or other committees, even though they had wanted to serve again. Um, next, speaking for myself, I'm pleased to see a suggestion for term limits on chairs and vice chairs. This would give an opportunity for other people to take on leadership roles and might be a convenient way to uh, deal with chairs or vice chairs who might be a little too dominant or problematic in some other, in some other way. Um, next, we're delighted with the recommendation for a motion tracking system. Time and again, we've heard from members who wonder whatever happened to one of their motions, and we've also heard complaints from new members who have a difficult time figuring out what previous committees had done and what role, if any, the current committee might wish to play in following up on or extending this work. Um, Next, as a co-chair, I'm very happy with the recommendation of staff engagement forms to ensure that engagements are relevant to committees or at least give an opportunity for the committee to assess whether a presentation would be relevant or of interest. Um, number seven, on the topic of engagements as well, I think it's important for, uh, to the extent possible, that councillors remember to try to include advisory committees when proposing uh, any kind of community-based consultation. For example, with the motion that is coming before you today on public safety, and I have chatted with Professor Genova on this on this matter. Um, number eight, um, also important for staff and council not to sort of pigeonhole advisory committees. Some issues are clearly relevant to a particular committee, like you know the Pride Parade in our case, but there are many other issues which might not, on the surface, seem relevant to a particular committee, but which might directly impact the community. Uh, that are served by that commu uh, uh, committee. And so street lighting and other public safety issues are, are, are uh, an example of matters that we would address. Uh, number nine, um, it's important for committees to be consulted well in advance of the production of reports that they're asked to provide feedback on. This has been a source of ongoing frustration for many committees that were asked for our opinion at the very last minute. And even when we are asked in advance, we don't have an opportunity to look at a draft report before it goes to council to ensure that our feedback was incorporated. One week's notice before something going to a council meeting is really not not enough. Um, two more items. You just we have 10 seconds. Joint... Eddie, you just have 10 okay. seconds, so I'll um, just ask you to wrap it up. Okay. 
the ballot, I think it's important to encourage new applicants to consider committees that might not on the surface seem relevant to them. So, for example, um, LGBT people might want to uh, apply to seniors committee and seniors might want to apply to our committee as well. And it might be good to have an option on the application form to allow people to uh, select more than one committee that they could possibly um, join. So, thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And Eddie, I didn't ask you at the beginning, but are you speaking on behalf of the advisory committee or as an, or as an individual? I am speaking on behalf. Some of these recommendations are echoes of what we had discussed at meetings. Um, we have not, because we only had one week to see the report uh, and we have not met yet, we're meeting tomorrow, we didn't have time to go through the report line by line and have a formal statement. Okay. So this is sort of an amalgamation of what I've heard from this committee, individual members, other committees, and some of them are my, the personal own. statements are where I have, yes. Okay, understood. So I, you discuss, but I it's your individual it. take on it. Okay. That's great. You do have questions. Where, where, I, where I've specified that it's my opinion, I, I, it's my oh. opinion. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Okay, you do have questions from Councilor Carr? Three minutes, Councilor Carr. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Eddie, very, very much for all the service you do for the city and for taking the time to speak to us. Um, I, I'm really, you've got a lot of experience on these committees. I'm really interested in what you feel has been the most productive role for council liaisons to play and what advice you could give if there was a very clear standardized training uh, for the role of councillor liaisons. Well, I'm thinking, so I've been on the seniors committee and this uh, committee. Um, we have benefited tremendously from, particularly on the seniors committee, from um, um, counselors who have come to all of our meetings, stayed through the duration of the meeting, updated us on what is happening at council, and without pushing us, sort of saying, you know, this is what's being discussed at council, you might, you know, this is something you might want to uh, provide some input on. And what we've also appreciated is the council liaison has talked to us about the different options that are available for us to uh, get our work done. So there's always this assumption that, you know, the only way to get things done is to write a motion and then get a counselor to bring it forward. And, and personally, that's my, my preference. I, I like the formal route. But we've had council liaisons who, and, and, and um, a counselor Blythe, our current liaison, have, and uh, has encouraged us to, you know, look at other avenues. Um, so having the council liaison have an informal conversation with staff uh, is one, one such option, and that has worked for us uh, before uh, for something that's not extremely serious or, or that can be dealt with in a more informal manner. Because sometimes we have noticed that when there's a formal motion, um, it, can, I don't know, it can ruffle some feathers uh, with staff. So if we can do things informally and have a council liaison who can do that, uh, we think that's a benefit. That's super helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Eddie, those are all your questions. We do appreciate you coming to speak to Council. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, next on the list, we have Nathan Davidovich. Hello. Hi there. We can hear you. You can go ahead, Nathan. Thank you very much, Councilors. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I was a member of many advisory committees over the years, and from my experience, the present rules and procedures are not quite appropriate, and uh, many other cities in Metro Vancouver have better procedures for my observa observations as I attended some of their advisory uh, committee meetings and, and so forth. Um, uh, these recommendations are for the new incoming council. Uh, there is no recommendation that the new council might consider a different model uh, and not just uh, of the advisory committees, but running of city council and city council regular committees. Um, if we get to elect six progressive members of council, in the next election, uh, then many of the policies and procedure enacted by vision will be changed. And uh, so there, there could be quite few changes. I mean, none of the present members of council uh, were on council prior to vision. 
so they don't have the the knowledge of what how things were run before and in the city and um uh, the reason, uh, well, one of the reason that Vision uh, did uh, all these changes is, is to uh, uh, only have city council meet uh, twice a month instead of three times a month, like was before, and therefore they gave more power to staff to to do things and so forth. Um, the uh, uh, there, there should be more uh, education opportunities for for new members, and uh, that would definitely help. Um, the cost uh, could be reduced if the city clerk staff not attend the advisory committee meetings to take minutes. You can record the minutes and the staff liaison and and the committee can produce the minutes, and that would cost save money. Uh, we never had a city clerk staff person at any of the advisory committee meetings when I was a member. Um, in closing, uh, this report should be sent to all the present advisory committees and ask them by a motion to to approve it or make some suggestions, like you heard from the previous speaker. They don't meet till tomorrow. So there is no rush to approve this report in the first place. It's going to the next council. So send it to all the committees, see what they propose, and, and maybe also get the staff to give you a report of how the other big cities in Metro Vancouver operate and then you'll have some understanding that we, our system is not the, the, as good as it could be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nathan. You have questions from Councillor Hardwick. Please go ahead. Um, thanks, Nathan. I think I heard you right, but I just would like to confirm some points with you. Um, you were pointing to the fact that the methodology that we have pursued during our term is really a holdover from what was uh, implemented during the vision decade. And that was different than what was there before, which I can attest to having been on, on the committee until 2008. What, what in particular though, would you point to as an illustration of how that has changed? Well, I mean, the, the, the whole setup of the committees of, of city council has changed. Uh, 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 Vancouver is the only city council that uh, 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 the committees do not report to the whole council, uh, you know, and, and, and you have a council meeting right after the committee to ratify the action of the committee. That's completely uh, uh, not a, a good way. Uh, as I said, none of the other cities in Metro Vancouver or the regional district uh, 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 uses this system. And uh, there is no need for all members of councils to be members of all committees. You know, well, uh, back in the old days, there used to be four committees of city council, and two of them would meet at the same time, and half members of council would be on each one. But then everything went to city council for approval, which gives more time for people to react and to find out what exactly uh, happened at the committee meeting. But the way it is now, there is no time whatsoever. You approve it in the committee, and then then it goes straight and re-approved by the whole council on the same day. The the other things are um, uh, uh, there is many uh, you know having uh, trouble hearing. Oh, sorry. Uh, there is many other uh, changes that Vision has implemented that uh, are not. Uh, in the spirit of the Municipal Act or the Vancouver Charter. 
They copy them from uh, people that they brought in from the U.S., where they have a different way of governance. So, you know, we, we have to go back to the basics, how the city has been governed for over 100 years instead of the way vision changed the whole governance structure. Um, I'm almost out of time. I would ask more, uh, but I think that that's it. Right, Chair? That's your time. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Okay, thank you, Nathan. Those are all your questions. Thank you. Appreciate you coming to speak to Council. So this does bring us to the end of our speakers list. Uh, so thank you to both of our speakers for coming to speak to Council. Um, so Council, is there any move the recommendations? Thank you, Councillor Carr. Uh, any discussion? See, Councillor Carr is on the queue. I'm just going to move us to a main queue, Councillors. So if you can put yourself on the queue, Councillor Carr, did you want to make comments since you moved the recommendations? Okay, Councillor Hardwick, please go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I remain concerned uh, at how this area has evolved. Um, I, I uh, remain concerned that there is a diversity of opinions reflected in these committees because my experience has been that those that are not aligned with with the uh, well, so the script goes goals and objectives of our values based organization if people are not aligned with that that they need not apply but that's really a problem that is inherent in the nom nomination committee uh, process of, of council rather than the individuals themselves. I think we have to 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 take a, a long hard look at this. But as uh, our last speaker pointed out, that the decisions that we're making today are really going to affect the next council. Um, so uh, I do appreciate the work that has been done, and I certainly appreciate the work that staff has done supporting the committees. I have a, a few reservations about uh, some of the end, the uh, organizational and engineering that's going on. Uh, but by and large, I, I think it's fine. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Carr. I just want to speak strongly in support of the recommendations and congratulate and thank staff for the work that they've done on this. Um, Kim Burris has done, a, I think, a, a really wonderful job in, in moving for, things forward. I have seen um, uh, incredible support of meeting coordinators um, in different meetings and a real ap appreciation of the work um, and the professionalism of, of those meeting quarters by uh, the members of the advisory committees. So um, I am... Uh, I am I'm pleased um, by the uh, committees, uh, the work of the committees that, that I've been on and um, the motions that have come forward and the work that I see ha um, obviously reflected in the speakers who come uh, from different committees, as we've already had today, um, to, uh, to address us as council. I think our committees are an incredible opportunity for the public, members of the public who are very interested in certain subjects to get in, in, engaged on those and to provide um, information and insight, which I think is helpful, um, not just to the staff who are there, but to the councillor who's there and ultimately to mayor and council. Um, so um, uh, I'm, I'm um, uh, very supportive of uh, these recommendations and the work that's gone on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I want to thank staff for the work on this report. I think it's really important that we make um, progress and make improvements. Um, and I will say that I do think that um, we need a reset on these committees. So um, I view this as progressive improvement, um, and I think that's absolutely positive, and I'm going to support it for that reason. But I do think that we need to um, continue to take a look and revisit because it's really important to hear that perspective from residents, but it's also equally important to set them up for success. Um, and I don't believe that we are doing that optimally at this point and consistently across the different committees. I think it's also incredibly paramount that we define the roles of the council liaisons. And I um, will state, um, perhaps not popularly, but unequivocally, that I think that the committees are being politicized as opposed to leveraging them as incredibly valid sources of perspective um, in terms of lived experience and diverse backgrounds that can help inform quality civic policy 
to improve livability and services that the city of Vancouver delivers um, and provide support so that those committees have some grounding um, on city policies. They have some understanding of what some of the key work pieces are that staff are working on and parties of the council of the day, and they can contribute their incredibly valuable point of view and considerations and perspective into developing better um, and more representative policies of that within the city. Um, and I would like to see us do that um, because I think we have significant issues in our own city as opposed to focusing on um, federal matters, um, as opposed to focusing on councillor motions, but to really help inform work and outcomes in areas of things like housing policy and um, civic facilities and neighborhood um, amenities and transportation flow and safe streets and all of those things that make a great city a livable one um, and one that is welcoming and friendly to everybody. So I think it's a huge opportunity to kind of reframe and reset. I can't understate enough how important and how big the need is. Um, and I'm really hopeful that staff are listening uh, to this dialogue. And I really um, am going to in advance appreciate the role that the staff liaisons are going to play because I think it needs to be a much more active one to help support these committees and to validate and make it worthwhile experience um, and for the people that are participating and giving of their time and their energy and their emotion and their expertise, um, which I think we have to be very cognizant of in setting it up so that it's a good experience for them, but it's also providing value back to the city. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Kirby Young. So that does bring us to the end of the um, discussion. We'll be moving to a vote on this item. And that motion does pass with unanimous support. So thank you very much to our staff team for all the work on that report and answering all of our questions. Uh, so we do have 15 minutes before um, lunch and we do have some speakers on the line to the next item, so we're going to keep moving ahead. Um, we have five items on the agenda that were referred from yesterday's council meeting to today's meeting in order to hear from speakers. Uh, and then, of course, followed by debate and decision. Another uh, reminder that if amendments are brought forward, they must be submitted to the clerk in written form before the member introduces them. The first referred motion is item 10, a placekeeping, protecting and supporting cultural food assets and other forms of intangible cultural heritage in Vancouver. Uh, so this was previously a member motion B3 from yesterday's agenda. Um, and this was moved and introduced by Council Boyle and seconded by Council Weeb. So we're going to hear from speakers on this motion. And the first speaker we have uh, on the line is Paul Beesla. Speaker number one is not on, not presently on the line. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll move to speaker three, Michael Schwartz. Hi. Hi there, we can hear yeah. you. You do have five minutes oh, to great. speak to council. So please, I invite you to start when you're ready. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you for taking my call. I'm Michael Schwartz, Director of Community Engagement at the Jewish Museum and Archives of BC and the Vice President of the Heritage Vancouver Society. In both these roles, I work to preserve and celebrate the intangible cultural heritage of Vancouver's diverse communities. UNESCO defines intangible cultural heritage as traditions or living expressions inherited from our ancestors and passed on to our descendants, such as oral traditions, performing arts, social practices, rituals, festival events, knowledge and practices concerning nature and the universe, or the knowledge and skills to produce traditional crafts. Food traditions are an integral piece of this wide-reaching definition. Food is in a sense a language unto itself, through which our parents, grandparents, and elders communicate to us who we are and where we come from. In turn, when the time comes, we pass these traditions on, this vital knowledge, to our, to our children. This is especially important for diaspora communities. Food, like dance, is one of the most meaningful ways that we are able to maintain a connection to our homelands and to our ancestors. 
In fact, food has been central to some of the most successful and resonating programming that the Jewish Museum and Archives has offered. Our attention to the small businesses that serve as anchors for Vancouver's diverse cultural communities, and specifically how these small businesses struggle daily in the face of development and rapid rising costs. I support this motion and I hope that Council will pass it. While it's only a start, the outcomes that, uh, that may result from the ensuing research and action uh, have the potential to have a significant positive impact on our city, preserving its rich diversity and ensuring that our communities from around the world feel at home here. I wanna be clear that my support of this motion is not opposition to the continued growth and development of our city, quite the opposite. There are valuable lessons we can take from other cities that have navigated the same challenge of balancing growth with preservation. And there's much potential for Vancouver to pioneer new approaches that could have lasting impact here and around the world. I encourage you to support this motion and give staff the direction to begin this important work. Thank you. Apologies, my mic was off. Thank you very much. You do have questions from Councillor Hardwick. Okay. No, I think that's a holdover from the last, and it's still, oh, they've changed. No, that's a holdover, sorry. Holdover, okay, no problem. Um, so thank you very much, Michael. You don't have any questions, but we appreciate hearing from you today. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, next on the list, we have speaker four, Hannah Campbell. Speaker four is not presently on the line. Uh, speaker six, Sarah Kim. Hi there. Hi there, we can hear you. You have five minutes okay. and you're welcome to start when you're ready. Thank you. Hi, um, thanks for letting me speak today. My name is Sarah Kim and I'm an uninvited uh, settler and resident of the Musqueam, Squamish and Slow Tooth Nations, also known as the city of Vancouver. And I am in support of Councillor Boyle's motion to protect and support cultural food assets. If you'll bear with me, I have a story I'd like to share with you. A year ago, I was invited to speak on a national panel on anti-racism by a local MP. At the time, I was working at Collingwood Neighborhood House in East Vancouver, which many of you know is across the street from businesses owned by racialized people that were to be displaced by rezoning development, cultural food assets of not just the neighborhood, but of communities across the city and the Lower Mainland. I spoke of this displacement at this panel and named it as a form of systemic racism. Later in my talk, I provided examples and solutions on what we could do to create a more just, equitable, and anti-racist society. And one of those solutions just happened to be for the city of Vancouver to work with business owners and racialized communities impacted by development and displacement in a meaningful way. This motion brought forward by Councillor Boyle demonstrates a commitment to address inequities and structural racism at the city. It also demonstrates the commitments that you, Mayor and Councillors, approved in the equity framework last July of fostering strong relationships and resourcing equity work across neighborhoods. This, mo this motion can set a precedent in applying your equity framework and an equity lens on much needed policy change. Your mission as leaders of the city of Vancouver is to create a great city of communities that cares about our people. This includes equity seeking communities and their cultural spaces and centers. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Hannah. Oh, sorry, Sarah, Sarah Kim, thank you very much. Uh, we do appreciate hearing from you. You have no questions from our council today. Thanks. Great. Uh, next on the list here, um, we do have speaker number seven, Layla Tricky, board chair for Collingwood Hi. Neighborhood oh. House. Hi there, Layla. You have five minutes. Hi. Please go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, my name is Layla Tricky. I'm president of the board of directors at Collingwood Neighborhood House. I'm speaking on behalf of our board in favor of this motion. The issue addressed in this motion arose again last year as something that's really common in our neighborhood, a notice of development. Yet another condo towering, tower coming to Renfrew Collingwood, this time on Joy Street. In this case, the development would displace beloved cultural food assets, mainly Filipino restaurants and food stores. We've seen this repeatedly in our neighborhood, 
a developer proposes the demolition of small culturally significant stores and restaurants, along with affordable rental apartments above the shops. The, they propose building a shiny new condominium tower with retail space below. City Council approves the redevelopment. Once the new tower is built, chain stores move into the expensive street level retail spaces. Cultural roots ripped up through demolition, no consideration for retaining the neighborhood's history and the sad loss of cultural food assets in development after development after development. I'm here today not to ask that you stop approving development. I'm here to ask that you please ask city staff to look into ways to protect and nurture these cultural food assets and other intangible cultural heritage assets these spaces foster and represent. Over this past fall and winter, staff from Renfrew Collingwood Food Justice at Collingwood Neighborhood House have worked with local Filipino organizations to form the Joy Street Action Network to examine this issue, recognizing that this kind of gentrification would only continue in our neighborhood. Councillors Christine Boyle, Pete Fry, and Jean Swanson attended the group's town hall on this issue. Together, the team worked to build input from several communities, different communities across Vancouver and key staff departments, including Heritage Vancouver, Chinatown Transformation Team, Food Council, Food Policy Council, Punjabi Market Collective, Hogan Valley Society, and Hua Foundation. They drew on lived experience and knowledge of our neighborhood to work with Councillor Boyle to inform this motion. Considering the ongoing development in our neighborhood, we have seen the distressing repeated loss of cultural food assets locally. As a council, you have voted to approve a lot of development in our neighborhood. The result, which has become sadly predictable, is the loss of invaluable cultural assets that are very precious to our neighborhood and beyond. Prior to moving to Renfrew Collingwood, the Renfrew Collingwood area, I worked with the food system within the food system, first in the restaurant and catering industry cooking, eventually as a small-scale local farmer and a food security and food justice advocate. I know firsthand the transformative power of food. Food is a way of knowing. As a black biracial woman with personal and professional experience living and working on social inequities in health, I understand the barriers to maintaining cultural identity and connection in a city where the specter of gentrification is always looming. In July of 2021, the city, this city council passed the city of Vancouver equity framework, which states, Equity efforts seek ways to transform current structures, policies, and processes in order to balance power and influence, expand access, and create new ways of walking together that nourish all people by embedding intersectionality in institutional and sectoral change. In working to create a socially just world, embedding intersectionality in institutional and sectoral change would require power sharing across differences in communities with an eye toward creating opportunities for those who have been historically disadvantaged to have a seat at the decision-making table. In Food Assets for Whom, Community Perspectives on Food Asset Mapping in Canada, Shulman et al. note, it is critical to explore communities' perspectives in the places and spaces that contribute to their everyday food practices. And that's because the social aspect of food sharing, both formal and informal, are key to designing and creating more inclusive, humane, and sustainable cities. These cultural food assets and other intangible cultural heritage assets that we are here to protect are essential. They are livelihoods. They are our community. They are our connections. They are culture. They are identity. They are resilient. I respectfully ask that you support this motion. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor Carl, just ask your mic to be put on. Clerks, if you could just quickly put her mic over. Thank you. Or to finish with this particular speaker. Okay, great. So that motion was to continue past 12 to finish uh, hearing questions to the speaker. Correct. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Um, okay, great. So that motion carries. Thank you very much, Councillor Carr. A point of procedure, procedure Councillor Genova. Yes, I just wanted to make sure we'd be able to break for an hour after that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you very much to the speaker. Leila, you do have questions. Uh, Council Boyle, please go ahead. You have three minutes. Questions to the speaker. Thanks so much, and thanks, uh, Leila, and all the speakers for making the time to sign up. I I'm just wondering um, if you have thoughts. I know the Collingwood Neighborhood House was part of the broader community planning that happened, um, and I know out of that Joyce Food Hub, 
um, mobilizing, there was quite a bit of conversation about how uh, the about the voices in the neighborhood that um, weren't engaged in that planning. Uh, so I, I'm interested to hear if you have thoughts or recommendations on how we as a city can be doing better to engage cultural communities in broader neighborhood planning, uh, as well as site specific projects like was proposed at that Joy Street site. Yeah, so personally, as somebody who did not work, um, do the labor involved in um, in this project and this advocacy, I I would what I would I would defer that response to some of the community members who did work on this, who we will hopefully be hearing from after my um, time speaking. Sure, totally fair, and and maybe on that point, Chair, can I just confirm for the public? I think we have a couple more people on the line and and others. Uh, who may not be on the line that we will, after hearing questions uh, to this speaker, we will come back at three o'clock and hear from the remainder of the speakers and go back through the speakers list? Yes, that's correct. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll leave uh, my questions there, but again, really appreciate uh, your time. Thank you very much. You do have questions from Councilor De Genova. Go ahead, Councilor. Okay, you don't need to go in the queue for that. But that's no problem. So, Layla, those are all the questions that we have for you today. Thank you very much for speaking to Council. Thank you so much for your time. So, we will be breaking for lunch now, which is uh, two minutes past 12. So, I'd say uh, we will convene back in, um, we'll, we will be convening in, t in camera, continuation from yesterday, uh, from 1 until 3 p.m., and then we'll be back to hear from the balance of the speakers on this item and the um, and the other items on our agenda today at 3 p.m. Have a good lunch. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.
Hi, Terry, can you hear us? I hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, thanks. Thanks.
continue listening to uh, our speakers on our first uh, referred motion, which was item 10, which is item 10, placekeeping, protecting and supporting cultural food assets and other forms of intangible cultural heritage in Vancouver. Um, so we do have our uh, speaker one on the line, so we're gonna, start, we're gonna start at the top of the list there with Paul Beesla. Hi, uh, Paul Beesla, I reside in the city of Vancouver, just in a loud space to find a more quiet location. Thank you for your patience. Um, I have five minutes, as I understand it. You do have five minutes, Paul, and we can hear you, so please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to speak to the importance of this motion as it pertains to the community in which I live, which is South Vancouver, and um, the vicinity of Punjabi Market, um, where I also help run a nonprofit along with my colleagues called the Punjabi Market Collective. In our area of Punjabi Market, there are a few remaining stores that um, sell items that are very um, specific and s important to the community in, in Vancouver, especially in South Vancouver. Um, as an example, we have Punjab Food Center, which sells very specific Indian items um, that are needed, much needed for Indian cooking and for households of Indian and South Asian descent. And um, stores like Mr. Tours, Punjab Food Center, and others um, along Fraser Street sometimes can have difficulty trying to survive the many taxes that are uh, put upon them um, at different levels of government. Um, the reason why we need to support them and ensure that they remain viable is more than just ensuring that there's a supply of food for that com those community members. It goes beyond uh, things that are not as tangible um, for the purposes of building better community, not just within a specific diaspora, but beyond that, about building bridges. As an example, if any one of you counselors wanted to experience Indian flavors and Indian uh, food and Indian cuisine, and you wanted to do that, do so at home without having to go to a restaurant, you need to source those grocery items from somewhere. At, that would allow not only for you to access the culture through food, but it would allow you to understand a community better too and build those bridges of understanding. So that's one reason why food can help kind of build those bridges and uh, build a better understanding of different cultures. Beyond that, there is another reason I wish, wish to discuss, uh, which is um, the growing population of the Indian, uh, excuse me, international students from India, um, particularly though that student body, which is at Bangara, which is not too far from the Punjabi market. A lot of the times when these young Indian students come, international students come here to Canada, they don't have a lot of familiarity uh, in, that would allow them to feel uh, a sense of belonging. And so we want to ensure that through food and through culture and places that are important that we allow them that space and that uh, familiarity through accessible cultural food assets, which what uh, this motion speaks to. I won't go too deep into talking about the challenges that international students face, but one of them is social isolation. And this is one way we can ensure that they have access to things that they are comfortable with so they don't feel so, so the Canada, excuse me, doesn't feel so removed from what they understand and what they know, and they don't feel foreign in a new land where nothing is familiar to them. So there are all these reasons uh, why it's so important to help preserve these cultural food assets. I'm probably close to my time, so I'll stop there. Thank you so much for your time. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. You do have questions from Councillor Boyle. Go ahead, Councillor. Okay. 
Thanks, Paul. I just wondered, I know there was a lot of conversation uh, in the community about the development, what would go come into the commercial spaces at 49th and Main there, um, and uh, likely another new development on the other side of 49th um, with some potential for the, the ground floor commercial there. So I'm wondering if um, you have thoughts on what would be a, a value in kind of strengthening the that cultural rooting and recognition of the history of the community there in terms of uh, community oriented or culturally rooted um, commercial new commercial spaces? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilor Boyle. Um, uh, gentrification is happening throughout the city, and in particular in neighborhoods that have a historic cultural uh, character to them, whether it's, um, you know, uh, the Filipino community advocating for their space in Joyce, whether it's the Chinese community advocating for their cultural heritage in Chinatown, we are doing the same and trying to strike a balance. It's kind of why the Punjabi Market Collective was born to not only assist these mom and pop shops, but also to help policymakers strike a balance in how development takes place in their neighborhoods, especially ones of cultural significance. And specific to Punjabi Market, we have seen a building go up, uh, a very beautiful building um, on the corner of Main and 49th. But we also saw the businesses that were displaced because of that. We also saw the challenges that newer businesses, or excuse me, older businesses face trying to return to those original locations. Understandably, the developers need a return on their investment. In order to do that, they need to raise their lease rents, or leases and rents and costs of doing business. We're afraid that, or we're concerned, excuse me, that when buildings go up on the north side of 49th, when the building is replaced onto your cloth house, a very symbolic building for Punjabi market. When that is replaced, it just got demoed, that mm. the rents and leases will be so exorbitant, to, which are necessary in order for the developer or landlord, in order to pay the cost of taxes, um, that it'll be too much. It'll be overwhelming for any place of business to either return or any new uh, businesses to, uh, to open up um, that are catered to the community, because the only ones that typically do survive are franchise restaurants that are more uh, commercial, more, more mainstream. As an example, a Tim Hortons. Again, I'm not against any of these businesses. I'm using this in, as an example of how cultural food assets and places of culture are being uh, replaced and uh, washed away. Uh, oh, we'll have with... to leave it. I'm really sorry to sorry. interrupt you. No, yeah. it's okay. I just wanted to have you finish your sentence, but um, we are over time. Thank Council you. Boyle's time. Okay. okay. Great. Yes, thank you. Thanks so much, Paul. You do have more questions, thank though. Uh, Councilor Weeb, go, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Paul. I really like the idea you're bringing about making sure that we keep South Vancouver-specific items to South Vancouver and each one of the little neighborhoods to feel unique and provide those cultural elements. So my question to you is, recognizing that we are seeing growth in these areas, what do you see as a mechanism? I think you've talked about rents for the commercial spaces, but what are the other mechanisms that you've heard from the community are needed to support continuing to ensure that when people go to these specific neighborhoods, they can feel that cultural identity, they can connect with it, they can feel like they're bringing that link to um, where they're from or where they want to associate with or they want to connect with. So I'm just trying to figure out what are the things that you're hearing, or solutions that we could be bringing that this motion will hopefully provide? Thank you, Councilor Weeb. Um, I think there are, uh, first of all, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. There are a couple of mechanisms in my mind um, that probably need a little more uh, fleshing out in a sense of being discussed by policymakers such as yourselves. But for me, uh, initially, if tax is an overwhelming burden, or taxation is an overwhelming burden for commercial spaces, then that's where we need to start. But in order to do that, we first need to recognize the importance of a, of cultural spaces 
and um, formally recognizing them so they can have some sort of special designations. Um, as an example, Chinatown now has an international designation uh, under the UNESCO uh, umbrella as a heritage site, I believe. So from that is born more policy and better policy. In this case, uh, we would want Punjabi market to be recognized as a space that's culturally significant and that's historically significant. From there, it's easier for policymakers such as yourself to create policy to lessen the burden of taxation, especially for newer businesses. Typically, new businesses either make it or don't uh, within the first two years. So if there was some sort of tax subsidy for within the first two years to allow new businesses that are not turn the key franchises to be successful, I excuse me, if there was some sort of subsidy that would uh, that existed that would allow them to be successful, in my opinion, that would be one less thing that's against them in trying to uh, thrive and make it. Uh, that's one. And then the other one would be when um, development occurs, that there are organizations, recognized organizations such as ourselves and other advocacy groups to have a seat at the table when these development projects are taking place, as opposed to being just stakeholders that are engaged at a public hearing, a public uh, consultation after all the plans are already drawn up by a developer. Uh, nothing against developers. We need development. But it would be more collaborative if we could do it together. From the, Thank start, you. From the start of it. Yes. I really appreciate that yes, comment exactly. about incubating small business, because I know that uh, a lot of people have said not just preserving the heritage businesses are there, but lifting up the young businesses. So appreciate that comment. That's my time. Thank you. Okay, great. And one more uh, councillor on for questions. Councillor Kirby Young. Hi, Paul. Uh, thanks for speaking to council. Um, I'm wondering if you think that some practical things might be um, strategies such as um, requiring smaller commercial retail units in some of the developments or flexibility in different permitting uses so that different kinds of uses like retail along with food service or diversity in terms of, you know, shared tenancies, just like really being more flexible and creative with permitting and use of space, as well as the size of spaces that are being built would be helpful to kind of keep some of those small businesses that are only of a certain size, right? So they really have to be careful about cost. What are your thoughts about that? Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Um, if I understand the question, um, it's specific to how do we diversify some of the businesses and the size of those businesses? Is that, is that Am I right on that thinking? Yeah, I'm, I'm asking if, you know, smaller spaces obviously cost less money because they have less square footage. Um, mm -hmm. And so if we, for example, require, you know, a number of smaller spaces to be included um, instead of just allowing large CRUs or commercial retail, retail unit spaces, or if we're more flexible about yeah. shared space and find different businesses to share spaces or have different kinds of uses in one space, do you think that would be a help? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yes, I think it definitely would be help, but I think, again, it comes down to how you consult. So, the, you know, to borrow Council Weeb's uh, word, uh, mechanisms, how do we create the appropriate mechanisms to allow for that feedback to take place? Um, as you already know, Punjabi Market does not have a PA. We're not big enough, and for other reasons, other community challenges, there isn't one. That's why, again, one of the reasons Punjabi American Collective was born, even though we're officially an arts and culture organization, we're a pseudo BIA. And um, in order for those consultations and for those ideas to have any weight with policymaking, uh, organizations like ourselves need to be at the table. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in allowing us, as representatives or stewards of a community space, to help in creating uh, the makeup of what the business district should look like, look like, excuse me. And um, in this case, we could, in those kinds of instances, we could talk about size of business, square footage. We could talk about types of business because there has been a retail study that was commissioned by the city of Vancouver. Thank you very much. And we have that data. We have those studies. So it's just a matter of how do we implement those, having a mechan mechanism to do that. But everything has to start with a recognition of a space and a people beyond just a sign, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, I know we get limited time, but I really appreciate you um, adding your voice to this. Thank you. Thank you, Culture. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Paul, for coming to speak to Council. Those are all your questions. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Take care. Take care. Uh, next on the list, we have Speaker 10, Jillian Durr. 
Hi, can you hear me okay? We can. Uh, you're free to get started whenever you're ready. You have five minutes to speak to council. Okay, awesome. Thank you. My name is Jillian Durr, and I am speaking today in support of Councillor Boyle's motion as a young person living in Strathcona um, and also somebody who's been working in food justice and food security for over seven years across Turtle Island. Over the past seven years, I have always used food as a means to bring communities together, including cooking wholesome meals to support young moms in Toronto, using seaweed to build connections between racialized settlers and Haida in Haida Gwaii, stewarding a community-supported agriculture program aimed at increasing organic and ethically grown East Asian vegetables in Vancouver's Chinatown, and most recently working on projects in the Renfrew Collingwood neighborhood in Vancouver. I am excited that this motion has come to council, and I'm hopeful that this marks a turning point in how our city values food and food spaces as the backbone of so many of our community gatherings, cultural transmission, and continued livability of Vancouver for equity-deserving communities. This motion is extremely personal to me, not only due to the nature of my work. Um, during this pandemic, I moved to Strathcona in large part to be close to Chinatown. Um, I'm a descendant of head taxpayers and CPR builders on my father's side. And for many of us, Vancouver's Chinatown is part of our history. When I moved here, quite honestly, I moved for the egg tarts and the baked pork chops with rice from the neighborhood treasure Goldstone restaurant. But after the first lockdown, Goldstone never reopened. I never got an egg tart. I never conspired with friends over Hong Kong milk tea in one of their booths. These stories of loss are far too common for communities of color who face cultural, whose spaces of cultural transmission and food are disrupted, displaced, and disappeared by the re relentless gentrification of Vancouver's neighborhoods. Our places are not disposable. This motion will start the work to support our communities to continue to thrive in this city. The city has passed the equity framework, and now it's time that the city works to recognize that an intersectional approach means we need to include food spaces that work in that work because these are intangible cultural spaces where cultural transmission occurs. Additionally, for many newcomers, these spaces are where many find inroads into the Canadian economy and begin to build a new life here. These spaces are often the only semi-public spaces where languages that carry histories of migration and homelands can still be heard. These are spaces that are so much bigger than food for equity-deserving communities. My family had to leave Vancouver and BC a long time ago because of inequity and a lack of opportunities due to racism and racist policies. It feels good to be back here now, in this neighborhood with such a rich cultural history and food history. When my dad comes back here to visit me, his first stop is Kent's Kitchen, serving quick to go Chinese food. And when he leaves, he packs away two pork and vegetable bao for my yaya, my grandfather, because Sun Fresh Bakery is the place where yaya says they still make bao like they did in the village. Despite the loss of Goldstone, these places are still here. They remind me that I'm still Cantonese in a city where whiteness encroaches on every doorstep. I am respectfully asking you to approve this motion and to ensure that spaces like Kent's Kitchen, Sunfresh, and the equivalent spaces of intangible cultural heritage for Black, Brown, and other communities of color are safeguarded and celebrated by the City of Vancouver. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And you do have questions, Councillor Weed. Yeah, thank you for speaking um, and bringing the expertise to the discussion today. One of the questions that this has been brought to us sometimes is that food is outside the jurisdiction of the City of Vancouver. However, I've been on the Food Policy Council for eight years. I recognize that we continue to fight to get it on the budget. Can you talk about how important food is to connect different cultural communities, connect people, reduce loneliness, bring community together? Can you really talk about how important this is for our City Council to pass? I think for me, I've never really thought of food as just what's on my plate. And I think for a lot of um, communities of color, that's also a very similar um, feeling about food. Um, I can speak from my perspective as a Chinese Canadian person, food is often also used as medicine. Um, and that medicine extends beyond the plate to who you gather with, who you learn from, who you value. I think also it, it Speaking about economy, um, you know, when we think about economy, it's actually a cultural system. Um, and when we talk about money, 
and where the city puts its money um, to support our cultural system, the fact that food doesn't get honored in the same way that like arts and culture spaces do, um, not that we should defund arts and culture spaces, but um, we need to start recognizing that food is not just like the thing that's on the plate. It's not just sustenance. It's nourishment for so many other parts of our being, including community and including cultural transmission. And I think when we get the idea out of our heads and out of our um, like governmental systems that food is just on this plate in front of you and you need to consume it to fuel your body, and we start thinking about all the other aspects that bring food to us, the workers, the economic driver of food, the cultural continuity, uh, the medicine in food, all of that starts to make more sense when you think of food more holistically. So it is imperative that the idea that like food never makes it onto the budget um, needs to be shifted because food is not just food, it's all the other things. Yeah, we've seen Thank a couple. You yeah, I guess follow up. We've seen a couple questions do well-being outcomes instead of financial outcomes as a city. Is that something that if we had outcomes that were more on increasing the well-being of citizens, then food would be higher up on the list? So is that something you think that we should change our perspective on what the finding of the city of Vancouver goes for, recognizing that well-being of our citizens should be our number one priority? Is that a yeah, I I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, uh, thank you. And those are your questions, Jillian. Thank you for coming to speak to council today. Thank you so much. Next on the list, we have speaker 11, uh, Wendy Young. Yeah, I'm here. Hi there, we can, can hear you, you. Yes, please start when Great. you're ready. You have five minutes. Great, hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Wendy L. Young and I am an Uninvited guests on these traditional lands that belong to the Coast Salish territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, also known as Vancouver, and I'm a voter. Today, I'd like to express my support for Councillor Boyle's motion on supporting cultural food assets and my gratitude to everyone who has labored on it. As a Chinese settler with roots in Hong Kong who has lived and worked in the downtown east side Strathcona and Chinatown community for the past seven years, it has been sad, frustrating, and heartbreaking to see gentrification erode the cultural fabric of my community through the loss of cultural food assets such as eateries and grocery stores. And to the previous speaker, maybe she's not on the line anymore, but I was also going to say how heartbroken I was when Goldstone closed down, um, which was my favorite place to get egg tarts. A few other memories come to mind as I ponder on how food spaces are such important gathering places for not only physical sustenance, but for culture, connection, and the passing on of generational wisdom. These memories are centered around my experience as a Chinatown community member, but I hope that you can extrapolate these stories to other cultural hubs being displaced too that other speakers have talked about already. Last fall on Mid-Autumn Festival, I decided to go visit a senior in Chinatown named Mrs. Chung and invite her for dim sum with me. She's over 100 years old and is often seen still active around Chinatown with her walker and hearing aids. She almost jumps with joy when she understands that we're going out together after months of isolation and we slowly bumble through Chinatown to the restaurant. Along the way, she points out Chinatown as she knew it and laments the loss of grocery stores, herbal stores, and Chinese cafes that she used to enjoy, and I resonate with her sadness too. When I first moved to Chinatown, I think there were around five grocery stores, and now there is only two left, I believe. Um, but anyway, at Dim Sum, we both bump into our own friends and peers, and we both were able to make new connections with each other too. She shares more of her story with me, and I leave with a deeper sense of um, awe and inspiration at the resilience of my elders and gratitude for these spaces where intergenerational friendships like this can form. I also think of the numerous conversations I've had with my neighbors and random aunties outside grocery stores, exchanging wisdom from a range of things such as gardening tips, what Chinese soup to make for the season, and which store has the best choy sum or fresh fish today. These are the places where we not only purchase food for our body, but these are the places where the fabric of our community relationships are woven to. 
With my own family living halfway across the world in Hong Kong, these spaces are also where I feel at home, belonging, and part of the generational narrative and expression of culture on this foreign land. Around six years ago, when a wave of Syrian refugee families began settling in my neighborhood, one of my Chinese neighbors who grew up in Strathcona organized a Chinatown grocery store walking tour for newcomers with the hopes of nurturing trust, mutual welcome, and helping them feel at home through connecting through over food. Over the years, I've had more Syrian friends tell me how happy they are when they find gems in Chinatown, such as live whole fish at Chinatown's fishmongers, which is also the way they eat fish, like whole, and unique ingredients that they couldn't find elsewhere for their dishes. Protecting vibrant cultural and food spaces are not only a gift to one cultural community in isolation, but it's an investment towards the well-being for other equity-denied communities and ground for nurturing cross-cultural exchanges too. I hope that today's decision to protect existing food assets and spaces will be a tangible witness for future migrant communities that will come to Vancouver for them to know that this is indeed a city of welcome and that they have a place here and there's a place for their culture as well. I'd like to acknowledge too that the systemic erasure of the culture and communities of color by those in power at various levels of government has been happening for a very long time. The erosion we see today of the food assets of marginalized communities is the same dynamic when colonial violence first came on these shores and was imposed on indigenous people when they were denied to their traditional food systems. And the damage and trauma of that still runs to this day. But today the violence looks a little differently. It looks like rezoning policies that threaten low-income housing and small businesses livelihoods and fair taxation processes and ruthless policy accelerated gentrification. To quote Mrs. Kong, a senior who has come here to speak to you, a few of you about changes in Chinatown, we say Chinatown, Chinatown, but really we should call it coffee town now. Gentrification threatens a community food's assets and ability to remain anchored in place over time, especially towards fixed income folks and people of color. I'll end my time with um, uh, just saying this, I hope that you will pass this motion today to ensure that these assets are protected and celebrated so that we'll always have access to the delights of life like egg tarts, crispy lumpia, and the right spices to cook with. And more importantly, that the next generation will inherit a culturally vibrant Vancouver run on the principles of justice and equity. Thank you for hearing me today. Thank you very much. You do have questions from Councillor Swanson. Please go ahead, Councillor. Yeah, thanks so much for um, coming in and supporting this motion. You mentioned gentrification a couple of times, and I've noticed myself how gentrification erases, as you said, low-income housing and stores. Um, do you have, like, concrete ideas of how that could be dealt with when there's new development yeah, happening? Thanks. Yeah, thanks for your question, Jean. Um, yeah, it's ironic because uh, the couple times I've been to city council is to give feedback on developments that have ended up happening and um, closing down certain uh, locally run stores. Um, yeah, I do wonder what it would look like. I know that there are some conversations going around, you know, allocating a certain number of housing units in a building for low-income housing, even though the definition of that is ridiculous these days. I hear it's around like $2,000 a month for a one-bedroom. But anyway, I wonder what that might look like to, um, yeah, to make sure new developments going in, if they absolutely have to, um, will also make sure to give small businesses a like a living ch like a, a chance at making it um, whether it's renting in these new buildings or other ways um, but ultimately you know the thing that I didn't get to mention because I was running out of time is that we're talking about food policy but ultimately it's connected to other things too such as housing and I don't feel like we can truly address this until we have a shift in the city and society to see housing not just as a commodity to be traded for people who have the 
capital and the equity to um, access it, um, I feel like that's kind of like a more upstream issue that needs to be addressed. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just yeah. end, end it there. So we have policies that say, for example, if you if a developer destroys a rental, that those rentals have to be replaced and the, the people who are in them have to, if they're low income, they have to be able to get 20% uh, off market in the new building, things like that. Do you think that would work for businesses, food businesses? Uh, yeah, I think we could definitely give it a try. I'm not like um, an expert in these matters, but I recall another speaker had mentioned maybe um, like there can be a certain amount of time that's protected, you know, maybe like for the first couple years, this is like an agreement that is signed. Um, I also wonder what it would look like for the city to have more opportunities for funding people who want to get to start new businesses in these areas too, starting culturally relevant businesses that also serve low-income people. Okay. Sorry, um, when, culturally specific sorry, Wendy, I don't, mean to, that they need. I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, we're well over the three minutes Councillor Swanson had to ask questions, so I'm going to have to move us along. Thanks, Wendy. Okay, okay well, thank you very yeah, much for you. coming to speak to Council. We do appreciate it. Next, we have um, Speaker 12, and it's Jordan Baltitude. Hi there, can you hear me? Hi there. Yes, we can hear you. You have five minutes and you can start when you're ready. Fantastic. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Jordan and I am an uninvited settler living on the unceded and stolen territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Slaywood Tooth Nation. I am also a voter and a representative of the Vancouver Neighborhood Food Network, and I support Councillor Boyle's motion on protecting and supporting cultural food assets. The Vancouver Neighborhood Food Networks, or VNFNs, are a collective of neighborhood-based community nonprofits aimed at supporting food security, justice, and sovereignty in our neighborhoods. We collectively uphold the rights of food, including prioritizing cultural food assets across Vancouver through systemic change. I sit at the VNFN table as the representative of the West End Food Network at Gordon Neighborhood House, where I work specifically on anti-poverty and food justice initiatives. So nearly 10 years ago, Council acknowledged how important heritage is as a value to residents living in Vancouver and approved the Heritage Action Plan. Since then, Council has undertaken countless initiatives to preserve particularly architectural heritage, but also legacy businesses and community spaces that serve as a place to connect with material cultural elements, share knowledge, and hold space for each other's day-to-day -day living and the hurt, healing, and happiness that accompanies it. The Heritage Department of the City has included more explicit support for intangible cultural heritage, and I am excited at how this can work as a method to preserve and protect cultural food assets. Cultural food assets often serve as a safe haven and place of refuge for their patrons, which is all the more crucial as we found ourselves in the midst of a global pandemic and a deeply disturbing uptick in racism and hate incidents, primarily targeted at Indigenous and East Asian community members. At least one in four British Columbians either experienced or witnessed a hate incident since the start of the pandemic, and over half of those impacted were youth aged 18 to 24. This issue impacts every single person living in our community, demonstrated by the 80% of British Columbians who are concerned about the rise in hate incidents. This targeted hate and racism highlights how important it is that this motion to preserve and support cultural food assets is introduced now. Cultural food assets provide a space where people can be themselves without risk of verbal and physical assault. A place for diasporic communities, driven apart by systemic racism, to come back together to connect, share, and heal. A place to be understood and have the safety to explore. It's not just about food, but about how food spaces are the epicenter of community and connection. What makes Vancouver Vancouver is the stores that are more than just businesses. There where I pay a quarter, cash only, for a coconut bun. Where my elderly neighbors meet to solve the world's problems over coffee. Where I can find an ancient medicinal root for nerve calming tea. And where my mom and I would go for a fun treat after I received painful treatment for my autoimmune disorder when I was a child. These storefronts are not just businesses. They are where community lives, where low-cost goods are sold or bartered for, where counseling happens during haircuts, and where people can access foods that remind them of home. 
Approving this motion and maintaining the cultural vibrancy in our neighborhoods is an opportunity for Council to redress historic inequity in the City of Vancouver and align itself with its commitment to the equity framework, UN DRIP, Truth and Reconciliation aims, and countless other initiatives it has invested in that are designed to support racialized and targeted community members. As a white person growing up in Vancouver, the foods that remind me of home were never questioned or made to feel different. Still, I have seen through my own experience the speed and cold efficiency in which neighborhoods in Vancouver are being gentrified and the disproportionate impact this has had on equity-seeking communities. Gentrification impacts a community's ability to remain in place and maintain their cultural food and intangible cultural heritage traditions, which leads to increased isolation and diasporic conditions in a time where we are desperate for connection. It further impacts the price of specialty and traditional foods in the midst of supply chain issues and a deeply stressful affordability crisis. And it impacts the local availability of cultural foods, which makes equity-seeking groups travel longer and further to find culturally appropriate sustenance in the midst of an aging population with limited mobility, bus route closures, and an overwhelming spike in gas prices. Maintaining access to cultural foods in our neighborhoods is a critical component of keeping our city livable, diverse, and working for all of us. Good urban planning must realize how intangible qualities, such as equity and inclusion, make up the richness of our city and use tangible levers like policy change to allow for the flexibility required to treat unique spaces in unique ways. I ask that Council approve Councillor Boyle's motion to protect and support cultural food assets in the city of Vancouver. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, there are no questions, but we do appreciate hearing from you today. Thank you. And next on the line, we have call, we have speaker 13. Hello? Chair Bly, we lost your sound. Hi, this is Rick. Apologies. Thanks very much, Councillor Boyle. Um, my mic was not on. Um, Rick, we can hear you. You can start when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, well, I support this initiative. I believe it needs to go beyond cultural assets as described in the motion. There are unique cultures within the larger Vancouver community which are defined other than by ethnic origin. And there are unique neighborhoods under stress besides Chinatown and the Punjabi market. Specifically, I'm referring to Vancouver's 2S LGBTQ plus community, and in particular, those businesses and community resources in the Davy Village neighborhood. But first, a little history. In Canada, as elsewhere, homosexuality was illegal until decriminalized in 1969. Gay meeting spaces that existed before 1969 were primarily limited to the dark corners of mainstream bars that chose to look the other way. Often, they were controlled by the Mafia, as was the case with the now-famous Stonewall Inn in New York City. Police raids were common. Arrests often resulted in public exposure, criminal charges, and the loss of employment and housing. And yet, the need to connect with other gays, and this was primarily gay men, and the desire to create a sense of community was so great that many were willing to take the risk. Despite police harassment, the inside of a gay bar was considered safe space, which it remains to this day. Even when the law changed and gay-owned establishments were allowed, they were often relegated to the sketchier parts of town. In Vancouver, through the 1970s, 80s, and into the 1990s, this meant the Yale Town Warehouse District and the seedier blocks of Granville Street. And then Vancouver hosted Expo 86. Almost immediately, the entire Yale Town District was redeveloped into condos and upscale restaurants and boutiques. Not long after, Granville Street was revitalized and designated the city's primary entertainment district. Every single gay bar and nightclub was displaced by this, either because the venue itself was torn down or the establishments converted their space to service mainstream patrons. I repeat, Every single gay bar and nightclub in these districts was displaced, every single one. 
Thanks to the determined and tenacious efforts of a small group of entrepreneurs to obtain liquor licenses at a time when City Council had imposed a moratorium on new licenses, Davy Street between Burrard and Jervis became the new gay entertainment district. It's also where the community center and other community resources are located. In the past few years, there's been a great deal of development along both Davy Street and Burrard Street. And then there's the future redevelopment of the St. Paul's Hospital site, which will have a profound impact on the street. Taken together, there is a very real threat that increasing property values and development pressures will again displace the queer community. Please don't be the council that allows this to happen. Don't let Davy Street become another Robson Street. Whatever form of protection staff, staff come to recommend, it is essential that they look to include the intangible cultural heritage of the queer community. It is in queer spaces that generations of marginalized peoples have found safety and community. It's also where unique cultural artistic forms have flourished, including drag. The wording of the motion is general enough that specifically mentioning the 2SLGBTQ plus community is not necessary, but I trust that staff will take away my comments and develop guidelines accordingly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. And there are no questions, but we do appreciate hearing from you today. Thank you. Next on the list, we have speaker 17, Kevin Huang. Uh, wait, I think, can folks hear me? What? Okay, I will, I will assume, yeah, yes. Uh, hi, good afternoon, uh, Council. Uh, my name is Kevin Huang. I'm joining you from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, tsleil waututh Nations, colonially known as Vancouver, where I am a resident and where I vote. I am speaking in support of the motion, place keeping, protecting and supporting cultural food assets and other forms of intangible cultural heritage in Vancouver. By the way of introduction, uh, here are a few affiliations of relevance that informs my opinion and knowledge regarding cultural food assets and intangible cultural heritage. I was a past Vancouver Food Policy Council member where we, as a council, worked with city staff on the 2017 Vancouver Food Strategy Refresh. I am a current Vancouver Chinatown Legacy Stewardship Group member, also serving as the chair of one of its working groups. As part of this role, the Stewardship Group works collaboratively with city staff and community members to support the conservation of cultural assets and implementation of projects that showcase the various forms of intangible cultural heritage that exists in the neighborhood. But today I'm speaking in my capacity as Hua Foundation's Executive Director, where we as an organization have and continue to do work around the topics of cultural food assets and intangible cultural heritage as part of our community engagement and advocacy work. A significant amount of our work is based out of Vancouver's Chinatown. As an organization, we support this motion because it brings together years of work, including advocacy by numerous community-based grassroots groups who are calling for the protection and revitalization of cultural food assets that their community members depend on. I speak to this directly as in our work, we have identified that there is the opportunity to develop new tools and frameworks at the city so that we can better recognize, support, and revitalize cultural food assets and other forms of intangible cultural heritage that are being lost and arguably irreplaceable. An example of where this, where the continues to be a gap is how the existing definition of food assets as per the Vancouver Food Strategy and the Green City Action Plan only includes community gardens, farmers markets, community kitchens, community orchards, composting facilities, food markets, and urban farms. However, this definition of food assets excludes spaces and places that provide culturally appropriate food access to equity-seeking and equity-denied communities across the city. In 2017, Hua Foundation published Van the Vancouver Chinatown Food Security Report that documents the over 50% loss of what we classify as cultural food assets in Chinatown between the period of 2009 to 2017. We classify cultural food assets as greengrocers, barbecue, meat shops, seafood shops, dry goods stores, restaurants, and cafes. These spaces contribute to the community member's sense of belonging, often acting as anchors for communities to gather and provide other social and cultural functions beyond access to culturally appropriate food. As documented by the Renfrew Collingwood Food Justice Group, these places often act as, also act as resource hubs for immigrants and language communities. 
Through preliminary exploration of what protecting these cultural food assets looks like, it became clear to us that new tools and solutions were needed, especially as the work spans multiple departments and requires a strong equity framework. At the same time, there were parallel and mutually supportive conversations around legacy businesses, for example, the Chinatown Legacy Business Study, how to recognize culture and heritage within the arts and culture as seen in the culture shift plan, and including the intangible culture heritage as part of a heritage planning work at the city. There is also the upcoming Chinatown Heritage Asset Management Plan that will bring various forms of intangible heritage forward as key assets for Chinatown and us as a city. I believe all these bodies of work coming from separate departments shows the emergence of the shared realization that this aspect of our lives, from our shared history to how these places and spaces play critical roles in people's lives, needs to be protected. The concept of intangible cultural heritage would encompass the many aspects of our lives, including food, that is not often considered in policy, especially if you're from an equity-seeking community. The framework also challenges us as a city to maintain the rich cultural diversity across the city and creates opportunities for equity-denied groups to fully and better participate as equal stakeholders in civic processes. I see tangible gains in terms of our city's social cohesion and economic opportunities from this framework. To that end, I support this motion and request that Council support it as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And you do have questions, Councillor Carr. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thanks. Thanks so much, Kevin. I really appreciate uh, uh, the work that you do and also taking the time to, to speak to us. Your report is a really great report on food assets in Chinatown. Uh, my question to you is, how do you how do you turn it around in terms of especially the importance of having clientele, people, enough people to come to, um, to purchase uh, items, to, you know, visit all the, the various um, the, the stores and the barbecue shops, et cetera, that, that you mentioned. How, how, do we, how do we turn that around? Because it's been the decline in, in people uh, coupled with rising rents and, and costs associated with those establishments that have been so problematic? Mm -hmm. I, uh, from our perspective, we believe that like complete communities are needed. And I realize that like through the Vancouver plan, for example, there's a concept of complete communities. And for us as an organization taking from a food security standpoint, how do we bring, uh, ensure that community members still have access to all their needs, ranging from food to social services, to health, to even spiritual spaces? So I think that this is a more of a comprehensive plan. And while this motion speaks more directly to food assets, I do believe that the concept of intangible cultural heritage allows us to look at communities and uh, equity denied groups and also uh, all the other groups. Uh, in terms of how we can support and better support their livelihood as a whole and as a city. Great. Um, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a tangent, but it's directly related to this. Um, did you, behalf on, the, uh, on behalf of the Hua Foundation, actually provide that kind of input into the public consultations that took place around complete communities through the Vancouver plan process? Uh, I believe uh, I would have to check with my staff, but uh, let me get back to you on that through email, if that's okay. okay. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely yeah. appreciate that very much. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Carr, Councillor Boyle, over to you. Thanks, um, and I just w wondered if there are pilots or efforts in Chinatown that you think would be valuable for the city to be looking at elsewhere or, or examples? I, I know you've done some work around legacy businesses and looked at tools in other municipalities. If there are specific tools that stand out to you that you particularly think we should be looking at? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, so in my work, we do work with other Chinatowns across North America, and we are in touch with them, and it seems like a lot of different Chinatowns, and also not specific to Chinatowns, uh, other, uh, like, I would say, uh, equity denied groups, like, neighborhoods that have significant historic relevance and, and are still living communities. Uh, there's, there is this uh, idea of how do we think about intangible culture heritage as a planning tool that involves economics, that involves like tourism, that involves uh, meeting the needs of the local residents at, at the forefront because it is a living community concept. And I think uh, this is where there is the opportunity that if we do, do adopt this framework to also be a part of that conversation uh, with other cities across North America. 
Uh, a few more tangible examples, in my opinion, is uh, what uh, I would agree with uh, Paul, the first speaker, that it has to go beyond recognition that this is a historic site. There is uh, how do we tell the civic history and stories of our uh, uh, and, and link that to the education system, link that to the tourism sector, and also really think, uh, allow the residents of these neighborhoods and the operators of these businesses to tell their stories. So I think that the, the, it's really reframing the power dynamics of uh, allowing and empowering uh, the community members to, to really tell their story and, and share culture and livelihoods with us. Thanks. I really appreciate you speaking to all of that and all the work Hua does. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Kevin, those are all of your questions, but we do appreciate hearing from you today. Next, we have speaker Bill Yun, Executive Director with the Heritage Vancouver. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Yun. I'm the Executive Director of Heritage Vancouver Society. Uh, I am speaking to support the motion. Um, we feel that the motion is incredibly important because it directs the attention of planning to how cultural and social connections are a part of our physical environments. And it, it raises as a serious concern the vulnerabilities that places that support sort of uh, daily rituals that people have. Um, and it recognizes that dealing with these relationships that people have with a living place is a serious concern. Um, there are members of different neighborhoods and communities have frequently raised this concern. You've heard from a number of them today uh, with the Joyce Food Hub um, near the SkyTrain. Uh, if you look at the, the Joyce Collingwood Precinct Plan, it makes it sound like the area is going to start from zero and, 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 and the development is going to create this social cohesion and social sustainability like it's a blank slate, like there's nothing there already. And, and you had these groups come out that said, hey, actually, there's, you know, a lot of uh, social cohesion there already with that food hub. And, and there's going to be a negative social impact with that development because it wasn't factored in from the get-go. Um, there are other examples where, uh, for example, heritage legislation or planning legislation doesn't really help in how a neighborhood works. Uh, I think I've talked about the recycling depot at Carolina and Broadway before. Nothing factored in how that recycling depot was important to the population in that neighborhood. Uh, the recent sort of discussions on C2 um, displacement of small businesses. In, in those conversations about uh, rental on C2s, uh, the, the businesses are really kind of, in my view, treated like a, um, a footnote. And, and, and what's gonna happen to those businesses that's really treated like a footnote, even though people have been talking about issues of small business for a long time. Um, there's a development on Main and 28th, uh, originally, there were four or five small businesses and one wrapped around the corner onto 28th. There's a new building going up there, and on the ground level is the Bank of Montreal, and that's taking up uh, most of the storefront. I believe there's one smaller storefront. But people have been raising this concern for a long time now. It's, it's nothing new. I think the biggest example comes from um, the 105 Key for Public Hearings, where uh, you have people come to council speak about their heritage connections and their cultural connections and their human relationships to Chinatown. But the heritage and planning regulations were only focused on the physical form of Chinatown. I'd like to add that, um, you know, this motion, it seems like it's, it's a pretty obvious step to do, particularly with the goals of um, cultural redress and truth and reconciliation. And, and heritage goals in the, in the updated heritage plan. Uh, I'd like to speak about the, the sort of really technical sounding um, historic urban landscape framework that the heritage plan is supposed to be using. And I think the word landscape is really important. In the previous heritage planning, it was building by building and buildings are separated from their environment. Landscape means that 
everything is tied together, even the buildings. I think that's a really important point that we have to start looking at. That's what this motion is looking at. So just to finish off, um, I'd like to talk about our involvement in some of this work. Several years ago, um, we were part of a team that worked on the study of San Francisco's Legacy Business Program, commissioned by the City of Vancouver. Amy Robinson of, um, of Local BC led that, and together we worked on a definition uh, of a heritage business, a feasibility of a similar program for Vancouver, other tools to protect the relationships that communities have with important neighborhood businesses and cultural districts. And I believe that Amy Robinson was in touch with you about um, uh, presenting the work that we did for informational purposes as a starting point. And I would like to add that we would be quite happy um, uh, to, to, to do that. Uh, if I have any time left, I just want to say something about what Councillor Weeb said um, about young businesses versus heritage businesses. When we did that work several years ago, we specifically laid it out so that young businesses could be heritage businesses, that the heritage businesses is not just a function of age, that if a business responded to the values of a, of a area, of a neighborhood or a cultural district, it could, it could be a, a heritage business. So I'll just stop there. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, Councillor Boyle, questions of the speaker. Um, thanks so much, Bill, for all the work you and your team do on this. I wonder if you can just speak a little bit more to the concept of intangible cultural heritage for those for whom that might not be a super familiar idea and and um, the how that shifts some of the more traditional understandings of heritage that's been particularly focused on built form from a particular era? So there's a very specific definition by UNESCO for intangible cultural heritage, but I think what's, what's really important is that different groups in different places have been sort of redefining that word for themselves. And I think the most important point is that, and this is similar to what happened with UNESCO, intangible cultural heritage came about because it was recognized that the legislation for preserving buildings couldn't deal with other forms of heritage that you know, other communities, non-Eurocentric communities valued. And, and this is basically what's happened, right? So I think it's the best way to understand it, it's kind of like a catch-all, right? Whatever the, the heritage regulations for buildings cannot cover, um, you can think of uh, as intangible cultural heritage. And some examples you know, of intangible cultural heritage are, is food culture. Uh, in Germany, the, the idea of co-ops, that's intangible cultural heritage. Um, mm -hmm. Singapore, uh, you have like the, the hawkers. Like, so the idea of the food, um, sort of the, 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 at the area where they have the hawkers um, sell food and people eat it together. So it's not the food itself, it's the food culture. And I think that's what Jillian was talking about earlier, right? It's the, it's the culture around the food. It's not really just the food itself. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, and, and I will follow up to see about setting up a presentation with you and Loco on um, the work you've done on that. Thank you again. Thank you. Great, thank you, Bill. Those are all your questions. Thanks for coming to speak to Council. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of uh, the speakers we have on the line, but uh, we will, I will go through the list one more time. So speaker four, Hannah Campbell. Speaker 8, Bry Gurge. Speaker 9, Lama Magabo. Speaker 16, Catherine Zhu. And Speaker 19, James Infante. We're hearing no other speakers on the line. Uh, that does bring us to the end of the speakers list. Uh, the motion has been moved, of course, and seconded. Um, so we can go to discussion. Councillor Swanson. Yeah, I think this is a great motion. Um, what really interested me in the speakers was how many of them talked about gentrification. And I'm just grappling here with, is there a contradiction between wanting to build more housing and pre preserving cultural food assets? I think that's a issue that we have to grapple with with every uh, 
application for new building that we deal with, if it's got restaurants or food below it, almost everyone. I know in um, Chinatown, like Kevin was saying, that 50% of the food assets were lost between 2009 and 2017, which is when most of the gentrification in Chinatown happened. Um, so I think this is important. I'm definitely going to support it. I want to thank all the speakers and all the folks that worked on it, um, including Councillor Boyle. And I hope we can come up with something concrete, really concrete about it, in order to stop the loss of these assets. That's it. Thanks, Councillor Swanson. Councillor Weep. Yeah, I'd also like to thank everyone that's been involved in it. There's a lot of work that's happened to put this together. Um, and for myself, I think we need to be creative here because this is something that we have talked about for a while. There's been research, I know Kevin and his team, and Amy back in the day trying to look at what options it would look like to do the heritage businesses. We've talked about cultural businesses, trying to do incubator spaces, utilizing city spaces. And so there's been a lot of dialogue on this, um, but we're getting to a really critical point here where uh, we need to make sure that these communities are connected and are revived in a way that continues to ensure that this is part of the legacy of Vancouver. So I'm very supportive of the motion and really hopeful that we can be creative and try to try a whole bunch of different solutions because I don't think there's one solution that's going to solve this. I think there's some taxation stuff we need to do, <laughs> but I think there's a lot of opportunity here, and I really support uh, this work and all the people that support it. So thank you. Councillor Boyle. Thanks. Uh, I appreciate all of the conversation and, and the support from Council, and I particularly want to name some of the specific examples that came up, including the Councillor Weeb and Councillor Kirby Young have mentioned when the conversations I've been having with, with communities uh, on this motion for the last year, six months in particular, um, there have been a number of really specific examples around, you know, uh, food courts, um, that exist in, in Burnaby and Richmond and food market uh, type models, um, small uh, food business incubators like Coho in Vancouver that has an incredible array of, uh, of small businesses being incubated there. Um, you know, even examples like temporary uh, relocation spaces um, out of uh, modular units. Uh, one of the big issues that I heard from folks across the city is the challenge of um, the, the transition, the gap time. Uh, if a new building is going in and a business can come back in, there's still a couple years in between and particularly for businesses where English isn't the first language they're, they're most comfortable operating in. All of, the, um, uh, all of the process pieces about moving and moving back in can really just make that impossible. And I've really appreciated in particular the um, advocacy uh, that we need more commercial spaces, not just in pretty limited commercial stretches, but off arterial and uh, further along arterial so that in those um, redevelopment and relocation uh, situations, there's space for businesses to relocate into permanently or temporarily um, so that they're able to stay in the neighborhood and communities are able to continue uh, to access that community serving space. So uh, I know it does often seem like a, a tension, particularly as we've currently set up our, our policies and our zoning, there's a tension between retaining these spaces and building housing, but that is because of the limits we've put on where that housing is available and where new commercial spaces. So I think all of the above are important. Um, and, and the last thing I'll say, on that front as well is the possibility, the, the work around expanding heritage to include more intangible cultural spare, uh, heritage um, brings with it a, 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 an important uh, amount of resources. We have um, significant grants that go into heritage and to uh, make those more broadly available to communities working so hard to protect and support the intangible cultural heritage that already exists in places around the city would be a really important resource in supporting those communities in developing the kinds of policies that we most need to make longer term systemic change on this front. So again, really grateful, hugely grateful for uh, everything I've learned from community members and conversations 
uh, leading up to this and all the folks who have put time and uh, and advice into shaping where we go with it. Thank you very much, Councillor Boyle. That brings us to the end of the speaker's queue. Um, we can move to a vote. Do you see Councillor Dominato has been offline? Okay, great, thank you. So that motion does pass with unanimous support. All right, so we are gonna be moving now to our next item, which is item, uh, our second referred motion is item 11, using the capital plan to help reach our housing affordability targets, which was moved and introduced by Councillor Swanson and seconded by Councillor Boyle. We are now going to hear speakers of this motion and our first speaker on the public body representatives list is Mark White, co-chair of Seniors Advisory Committee. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Councillors. Um, uh, as, uh, as mentioned, I'm co-chair of the Seniors Advisory Committee and I'm grateful to be living and volunteering on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Sailor Tooth Nations and I uh, live uh, and vote in the city of Vancouver. Uh, in my academic life, uh, I'm a research scientist and I have strong interests in the social determinants of health, about aging well and ensuring that when we look at housing, we're also looking at community programs and services um, for that purpose. As per the material I circulated to the mayor and councillors, the Seniors Advisory Committee strongly supports uh, uh, Councillor Swanson's motion that has the intention of seeking information by city staff to create um, a data-informed line item on the capital budget that specifically focused on city land acquisition program. And, and this is being done uh, by other progressive municipalities across Canada. However, land acquisition alone will not be sufficient for good decision making without some additional information and reflection on current city policies that are contributing to the unaffordability uh, of housing supply in Vancouver. So good policy requires adequate information, building on research evidence, and working in partnership with the nonprofit housing sector, as well as different levels of government. Our recommendations are as follows. Um, one, that the current metric of using current market rental average uh, as, a, as a metric uh, for affordability will uh, exponentially uh, continue to make Vancouver one of the most unaffordable places to live. It will only primarily serve higher middle income individuals and it will increase housing stress for single parents who are predominantly women, uh, though also impact to other genders and will uh, not address uh, those facing systematic and individual discrimination. The two or three bedroom housing supply will also not serve ethnocultural or racial communities that often have intergenerational extended families. By city staff calculations, the current market rental average has increased over 100% in 12 years, uh, basing social housing on 80% of the CMHC current market average. Rental average only takes us back uh, to the unaffordability of housing of approximately 1.5 years ago uh, based on current uh, increases um, using this metric. Uh, to make a difference is to have uh, also to have um, clear community informed terms of reference for the Vancouver Affordable Housing Endowment Fund with input from the advisory committees and nonprofit housing providers who, um, on who will be the beneficiaries of this land acquisition and who will not. Clearly, the uh, City of Vancouver cannot meet the affordability housing supply based on current need, never mind the future need. But to be successful is really a question of how successful the city can foster land acquisition in partnership with the nonprofit housing sector, community organizations, 
labor and private sector who would likely donate land to community-based housing trusts. I've submitted some ideas to councillors uh, on uh, some of these things and will continue in the future. Um, uh, the one thing that I was a bit concerned with the motion, I don't believe that the uh, assessment of needs and potential strategies requires in-camera deliberations, as there's no actual real estate transactions being considered. Uh, and those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Councillor Carr, questions of the speaker. Go ahead. Uh, yes, thanks very much. I, I appreciate so much the work you do and um, and uh, your leadership and involvement in our um, committees. It's, it's wonderful, your, our advisory committees. I'm interested in the comment you made about um, and also needing to think about the, um, uh, the basis for defining affordability. Um, I've been uh, pushing for many, like more than this term, last term, the last two terms, um, uh, for using the standard um, uh, definition of affordability where a household pays no more than 30% of its gross income. Um, do you have advice as to how, whether or not that's your definition, um, whether how you figure we can incorporate that into um, our um, uh, housing affordability targets? Well, I think that the motion, if I understand it correctly, is really to get city um, to get some assistance with city staff on looking at the current need across income brackets. But I think that the uh, because I think it's really income that really sets affordability. But it's also um, the uh, census family uh, demographics as well as across uh, racialized um, ethnocultural groups as well of having a deeper understanding. Uh, obviously, 30% for a single uh, parent, which are predominantly women, uh, isn't going to be all that helpful uh, when looking at affordability, So, I, and uh, nor will it be for seniors. So I think that it's important um, when getting information on, on the income affordability and what the need is, uh, that it's a full breakdown, uh, not on average, uh, are not using just an arbitrary 30%, but really looking at what does that mean um, across both census families and non-census families as, uh, as that information is readily available um, and will be even more enlightening uh, with the new census data that's coming right, out as right, well. Right. Um, so that... It, totally interesting, and I've already done that motion. We don't we don't have a motion on that. But how do you? I mean, obviously, census families, non census non census families, the varying kinds of of um, family uh, uh, and household definitions make it hard to develop policy. How do you imagine um, that we could incorporate that kind of variability into policy? Uh, I think that's going to take longer than a few minutes. I want it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I do think that it's a really um, important question, and and I would be um, uh, quite interested bringing um, a, a number of the nonprofit housing sector folks together um, uh, in, in that discussion. Right. Uh, I think that there are ways. Uh, and, and there's some research evidence um, in terms of what some other cities have been doing um, more in Europe, uh, uh, less so in Canada. Mark, Mark just email me, and I, I'm sure that I can share that with all of Council um, if there's an opportunity to have that discussion. Okay, great. Sure. Th thank you, Mark. Those are your questions. We appreciate hearing from you today. Thank you very much. Uh, the only thing that I really wanted to go back to was the terms of reference uh, for the Vancouver Affordable Housing Endowment Fund, and I hope that um, th uh, that uh, advisory committees are uh, given an opportunity to provide input on that. And thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Councillor Di Genova, did you want to ask questions? Yeah, I think he said what he needed to say. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so we are moving on to our next speaker, uh, Speaker 3, M. Wickman. Can you hear me? Hi, yes, we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Okay. 
Um, my name is Marlene Wickman. I'm from Vancouver, and I am supporting using the capital plan to help reach housing affordability targets. I have no expertise in the housing industry, but I wanted to make some specific comments and then make a suggestion about land acquisition. Firstly, who is affordable housing for? In Vancouver, it doesn't seem to be about families with children, with 30% of households having families with children, whereas the rest of Metro Vancouver is 42% and Surrey has 51%. Current housing is not friendly to new immigrant or refugee families with more than two children or extended family members that need to stay together. There has been too much focus on wrong supply housing of one-bedroom and studio apartments, which have been forcing families out of Vancouver for decades. There isn't such a thing as too much housing when it's the wrong kind. Why isn't affordable? Speculation, which seemed to worsen after the last Olympics and the Canada Line construction on Canby. There seems to be speculation despite efforts to curb that with the, the ongoing Broadway plan. There is a false belief that building more housing makes it more affordable. As taken from the recent UBCM position paper, more housing has been built in British Columbia over the past three years than in any three years in the past 20 years. How can it be made more affordable? Prioritize building affordable family housing with family-sized units and private green space for children. Green space is important for mental health, such as with children with ADHD. Develop protected family zoning, that such buildings are conveniently located near schools, parks, and community centers, so as to keep out for-profit, predominantly one-bedroom apartments and cut speculation. Support nonprofit builders rather than big developers for housing. Supply blueprints of buildings with appropriately sized two to four bedroom units with effective storage and built ins with anticipation for need to isolate for illness. This makes good designs easy to replicate and passes savings to the builder and resident. What are maintenance expectations for housing? There needs to be a minimum level of maintenance on these buildings. For example, BC Housing declared the Alma Blackwell on Adenac too expensive to repair, so it's renovating the tenants of the three-story building built in 1986, so it can be replaced with a, a six-story building with more expensive rent. How can affordable housing improve quality of life, increase income, and achieve aspirations? There can be affordable business space at ground level for daycare, food services, etc. This would help address some issues raised um, by Councillor Boyle for protecting um, cultural food businesses. For single people in support of housing not living with family, there are beneficial recommendations to support local work opportunities and encourage neighbourhood connections. Councillor Swanson participated in the CMHC-sponsored study by Happy City, Recommendations and Roadmaps for Social Wellbeing and Modular Housing, Design and Programming Recommendations to Nurture Health and Social Support for Vulnerable People. I would advocate putting employment opportunities at the ground level of social housing. Uh, there should not be 100% social housing, but mixed use so to enhance the income and the social role of residents in their neighborhood. Now, how can land be obtained? So this is out of my league. But I read an interesting article in the Toronto Star on March 1st. It's a, a French term called a viager. I'm not going to pretend to say it in French properly. So it's similar to a reverse mortgage, except there is a buyer as opposed to a mortgage company. The elderly person can live out their life in their home. There is some contractual um, arrangement made about how much the buyer gives to the elderly person. At what point does the elderly person provide rent. This has to be added all into the, kind of the title of the home. Uh, the new owner pays for repairs. But this may be a way to kind of gradually acquire land instead of these elderly people going into these grossly overpriced assisted living residences where they charge them like ten, eleven thousand dollars $11,000 a month, and they may not need all these amenities. And Elderly that you may have known during the pandemic that live in these facilities, they haven't been able to go out anywhere, they haven't really been able to eat with anybody, they've been kind of isolated in their rooms. So I think that there is an opportunity to kind of gradually acquire land um, using a different way, all right? Um, I can't really add more to that, um, but, um, you know, who knows, maybe it can work for Vancouver. Thank you for your time. And thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's good to hear from you. There are no questions, but we appreciate you coming to speak to Council. All right, thanks.
So we do have two speakers we haven't heard from, so I'll call their names. Speaker two, Bri Gurge, and speaker four, Catherine Zhu. And uh, just noting that both of these speakers have signed up for every item on our agenda today and have not shown up, so we may not be hearing from them. Just flagging that for council. Um, so that actually brings us to the end of the speaker list. And um, we'll move to discussion. Council Swanson. Yeah, I just want to thank the speakers. This is a fairly straightforward request. Um, just to try and. Um, at the beginning of our term, Councillor Carr made this motion about getting our ho housing targets so they match the actual need of people according to their income, which I think is a really good idea. Because when you look at the graphs that Andy Yan has provided, there's a big lack of affordable housing at the, for people under 15000 is a huge lack for people between 15 and 30,000, is a big lack for people between 30 and 50, and then we start to get, get it so we're overproducing at the higher income rates. So that's one thing that's really important, and the speakers have mentioned it's really important to get the bedrooms right too. Um, the other thing is, like our current policy seems to be mostly, because land is so expensive, to try and increase the density of existing nonprofits, um, which means like Entre New Femme or like the seniors place at Venables and um, Renfrew, people have to be evicted. So then the new place comes, the people who are evicted, the nonprofits find a place for them, but that place, the place that they find is a place that people who are homeless, for example, or people that are on the BC housing wait list can't get because they're getting it. So if we can get some additional land to build additional housing, I think it would be way easier to meet our actual targets. So this is just, I'm hoping we can get some information back so we can get a little bit of extra money in the capital plan to try. I know that the city can't do it all that we need uh, senior government help, nonprofit help, but traditionally the role of the city has been to provide the land. This is a motion that's been supported by the Co-op Housing Federation, the BC Nonprofit Housing Association, Brightside Community Foundation, um, and our own seniors and uh, disability committee. So I'm hoping we can pass it and get this information and get some money in the capital plan. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Swanson. So seeing no other uh, councillors on the queue, we'll move to a vote. Oh, that was just a last minute. Okay, Councillor Kirby Young, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I just wanted to provide one quick comment. I think it's really helpful for Council to have um, information in terms of informing our decisions and understanding kind of the magnitude of issues in front of us. I know we've had a number of motions recently with respect to the capital plan. Um, and I just want to reiterate the importance of delivering on housing and utilizing um, things like city owned land. Um, but with respect to sort of reference in this motion around what amount of money is needed in the capital budget that we have different sources of funding, whether that comes from development cost contributions or partnerships with senior levels of government. And I think that we need to deliver on the priority of housing uh, through the the best means that the city can and provision of land is one really fantastic way of doing that. Um, but not to the extent that we are not, for example, renewing our fire halls um, or our community centers, separating our sewers, trying to deal with environmental flood mitigation measures and all of those other pressures that are facing the capital plan. So I'm really happy to get information back. I'm hugely supportive of finding a way to advance housing. I'm happy to be a vociferous advocate for additional investment from senior levels of government in housing. But um, I just want to be clear um, for the record that. Um, in getting the information back and supporting this motion, I'm not suggesting that we switch our entire capital budget over to housing because I think we have some pretty significant needs in front of us in terms of 
things like um, public safety response, like having a fire hall. We have a gap in the Canby corridor, for example, with the significant amount of new residents going in there, 40 to 50,000 in the next 15 years. Um, that has been underserved. We've been um, we're not renewing uh, at the at the rate that we need to um, on our existing facilities, and I'm really concerned about that. So I'm just bringing that perspective and that lens to this discussion. That information is very critical. Housing is really critical, but we're going to need partnerships to be able to get there. This is not something that the city can fund on its own unless we're going to applicate our other responsibilities to things like not ensuring sewer overflows, um, not working on flood mitigation, not renewing our community centers, not renewing our playgrounds so they're safe and great spaces for kids to play or safe streets um, in, for school zones, all of those things. So uh, we've, got, we've got a lot of needs in front of us in the capital plan, and I just want to reflect that into the record um, as well as the importance of housing, which is obviously fundamental, but we can't do it on our own. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Councillor Kirby Young. So, uh, with that, we will go to a vote. And that motion passes with unanimous support. So thank you very much to our speakers and to uh, Council. We're moving on to our third referred motion, uh, which is item 12, prioritizing public safety, was uh, moved and introduced by Councillor DiGenova and seconded by Councillor Kirby Young. This, at this time, we're going to hear from speakers um, on this item, and we'll start with the first speaker that we have on the line, which is Speaker 5, Mike Roan. Hello. Hi there. We can hear you. You have five minutes to speak oh. to Council, and please uh, start whenever you're ready. Perfect. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm calling in generally to support this motion. Uh, I live in Strathcona. I want to say that people still aren't really reporting everything to the police, even if it's a personal safety issue, at least in my neighborhood. Um, for our neighborhood, the best resource we actually have is a, a, a local Facebook group, and it flags to other people in the neighborhood if there's something to look out for. Some issues I see in there get reported to the community policing center, but uh, the community policing center has actually told me that they don't share police with the uh, sorry info with the police directly either. Um, I've got tons of stories over the last couple of years from this neighborhood, but uh, a couple of recent ones is um, about two months ago, one of my neighbors chased a, a thief into our yard, and uh, it was particularly scary because he had a weapon, and uh, our kids were out, out here, so it was uh, a bit upsetting. Uh, yesterday, in, in this, that same group, we got a, uh, a word that a woman was being followed down uh, Hawks Avenue by, by a man. Um, while they were trying to track that, the discussion got a little confusing because police were out also looking for a different person creeping around uh, Strathcona Elementary School. So it's, it's a, bit of a bit of a gong show here at Days. Um, I think the real people getting hit hard right now are actually the elderly Asian community around here. Uh, the ones in my neighborhood, the couple that I talked to, said they've never really felt totally safe here, but right now it's as bad as it ever was. Uh, I think the uptick in anti-Asian incidents have kind of hurt that community particularly hard, and I don't know if the city's kind of stepping up to renew that trust. Uh, the one thing I don't want is, you know, for us to say, hey, let's, you know, send in cops and start the cracking skulls. Uh, I'd like to just see a more visible presence, you know, if that's VP or CPC or the park rangers that we had during uh, the, the encampment. Um, I'm also stoked if we do something like uh, the Bear Clan Patrol that it got in Calgary or bring back the city ambassadors we used to have here. I'm pretty much open into yeah, kind of anything like that. Anyways, I hope everyone at Council can kind of acknowledge the concerns that we've got here right now. And uh, thank you for letting me speak. Thank you very much. You do have questions. Uh, Councillor DiGenova. Thanks very much for, for waiting all day to speak as well. Um, I, I just had a few questions for you. I mean, we're kind of having a meeting about this motion right now, but do you think that it's important to give residents a chance to speak to all of council? I acknowledge and appreciate that there are, you know, groups of councillors or individual councillors um, who've hosted, uh, you know, their own forums or have gone out to meet with people. I've, I've met with a number of residents, uh, you know, when they've contacted me. I'm just wondering, do you think it's important that we bring together all of these other organizations like BC Housing, like the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions, and we hear from residents like you and including you if you want to be there, um, to really get an idea and a scope of what's going on and how you feel in your neighborhood? 
Would you think that would be helpful to your neighbors that maybe can't, can't hang on the line eight hours to wait for this item to come up? No, I, absolutely. Like I, I watched that um, that that um, a town hall that a couple of counselors did with uh, a couple other people, including a uh, guy Salicella, which mm -hmm. it was awesome to see like a diverse range of voices. Um, I know a lot of, uh, of people in this community don't particularly like speaking in public. I, I'm not really a public speaker myself, but uh, yeah, the more voices that we have from the areas that are kind of hit would be the you know for the best. Okay, so, um, and do and you think that it's important, the timeline that I've proposed in the motion is to, to have this meeting in May. And, you know, that being said, it can't come soon enough. If it was tomorrow, it wouldn't, but I want to give staff time. Do you think that, that this needs to be a priority? This needs to be something that the council shows leadership on and takes on? Or do you think that we can push this back behind some of our other council priorities? Well, personally, I feel it's 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 a pretty important one, just with you know how how things are going right now. I wouldn't dare tell you guys how to prioritize different motions. We've got all sorts going on, but uh, for me, this is this is a pretty important one. Thank you, and, and sorry to put you on the spot so much, but with my last minute, I'm just going to ask you: Can how I mean, you've mentioned the anti. Asian hate and violence that we've seen, sort of in Chinatown and throughout our city, but. For you personally, what's the number one biggest change in your behavior? How you've kind of, is there anything that you don't do anymore that you or your family don't do anymore or that you're concerned about because of public safety in Vancouver? Uh, I, I don't really let my kids wander too far uh, into areas that I don't know. Um, you know, and they're, they're older. They're kind of at an age where I like for them to be able to explore a little bit. But, uh, you know, I want to keep them within eyesight. So. You know, I'm I'm a little bit more guarded, especially when I'm with them. I've I've had a couple incidents where, you know, if I'm with my kids, somebody will, you know, try it on a little bit. But if I'm by myself, they generally leave me alone. So I don't know if that answers your question. It, it does. Thanks so much. That's my time. Thank you, Councilor DiGenova. Councilor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks, Mike, for speaking. You described some very specific incidents um, that had happened sort of in and around the neighborhood. And I guess I'm wondering if you could sort of give us a bit of um, perspective. You said you lived in Strathcona. I'm not sure how long you've been there in Vancouver. Um, do you feel it's changing? Do you feel it's getting worse? Because we hear a lot like, oh, well, Vancouver's safe or different kinds of crime are up or down and there's debate there. But in the reality of what you're experiencing and your perspective, is it feeling worse to you? Uh, it is. I mean, it's a, it's a little tricky. You know, being we had the encampment last year, or you know, it, there was that was a massive uptick. So, you know, I'll be honest. Since the encampment, you know, we moved people into housing. I felt it got a lot better since then, of course. Um, but there are definitely still times where I'm walking around. It's it's it's, it's definitely a little rougher. Um, and then, you know, I've got I live really close to uh, you know some elderly Chinese communities here, and mm -hmm. uh, I noticed that there's a definite. Uh, hesitation, like people will cross the street to avoid me. Like I'm, I'm not Asian myself. I'm a younger person. You know, I just dress a little grubby, I guess. So I can tell there's a kind of a palpable fear from. Is it like, yeah, maybe I'm putting something in their in their mouth, but it, it it doesn't feel very comfortable right now for for people. And how they like, kind of a follow up, like if if you're kind of asking council to sort of you know how seriously we should be taking this. I mean, how fundamental do you think the sense of safety is to people and where they live? I, oh, I, I, I think it's, I think it's a, a, a big one for sure. Um, you know, it's, it's. There've been a couple incidents, kind of going around where, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, a scrappy person, but I've had, a, I've had two incidents over the last couple of years where I had to get a little physical with somebody. So it's, it's not, it's not great. Not for Vancouver, anyways. No, not a comfortable position to be in at all. Okay, thank you for sharing the perspective. But I think it's really helpful, at least as for me, to hear the people's real life experiencing experiences. But you know, outside of the hyperbole, is like what's actually going on for people in the neighborhood. So thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, those are your questions. We do appreciate hearing from you today, Mike. Okay, thank you. Next on uh, the line, we do have Speaker Nine, uh, Colin McGrath. Hello. Hi there. We can hear you. Uh, you have five oh. minutes to speak to council. Please start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so I just was calling in to, in support of this motion and thank uh, council and 
Council Vision over for putting it forward. I think listening to some of the other discussion just in the prior speaker, I think um, my logic is I, I, what, I, what I understood from this is a collaboration of the different groups, which were all great groups, uh, and with the community. So I think the community does uh, want to have that uh, chance to say this to those stakeholders. And I think to do that with those stakeholders listening and you know potentially having something come from it would be key. I personally, I think it's also we talk about public safety. I think you know I don't want to sort of be accused of fear mongering or anything, but partly you know when people talk, we see what's on the news and all the violent behaviour that's happening. Um, I think we definitely, my family, my wife, my children, uh, are more cautious, or we're more cautious with our children. Um, I think I had an experience just recently this weekend, in fact, where I was in a situation in in an area uh, with with the children, went into a, a washroom because the small children needed to go. There was an individual in there, and I won't need to get into details, but doing things that were not appropriate uh, for, uh, well, they were sexually oriented uh, actions. I think the children didn't see it. But I think, you know, when I went there, I didn't feel unsafe, but I thought that that was also something that needs to be thing. So we talk about a lot of this violent crime, but there's also uh, things of that nature that are, my children didn't see anything, but I think they were also traumatizing and certainly people would feel unsafe by that. I think also that um, uh, I, went, I thought about that much later and, and considered it and, um, and thought maybe I should report something like that. I don't know if that's the right thing, but I felt it should be reported. But I subsequently called three times at different times of the day, and it's, I didn't call 911, maybe I should, but I didn't think that was appropriate. But not in police emergency, was, each time it was a 50-minute wait, and I had to just abandon it because I couldn't. So I kind of look at that and say, you know, when we talk about crime being reported, a lot of it's probably not simply for that reason, and there's some, some complacency, but even those like myself who have a will to do it haven't been able to do it. I haven't been able to report that incident. So, so I probably will try again. I don't know how else to report it, but, but I think that factors into some of the data we see too. So I'd say things might be far worse than what we might see, even though um, many say crime is uh, down. Um, but I, and I'd also just say, I also, and I think I've spoken to some of the councillors and sent councillors some information. Some of you were kind enough to reply to me and talk to me, so you would know me. I put forward information around things to do with uh, BC housing and some of their developments around supportive housing in some of the neighbourhoods where they, you know, there was outright, I'd say, um, misinformation and disinformation from those uh, staff people, and I'm not trying to disparage staff, but the numbers, the data speaks for itself, in how they were representing uh, to the community and the community feedback about sites. And they were actually saying, well, we're consulting with police and things of this nature, and the police have said we were never consulted with and never asked. And it's documented on city documents and city websites that police were consulted when police were not. I think that misinformation is wrong, and it creates situations that are unsafe because of, you know, the, the misinformation uh, mis, uh, about what's actually occurring. So I think with the stakeholders discussed, having them all there, having a more collaborative approach and inclusion of all those groups is, can only help, and I think it should be a high priority. I know there's other bigger things in this world, but this is pretty big for a lot of people living in the city. And um, so I would support it. And so I'll, I'll stop there, and thank you all for the chance to speak. Great. Thank you very much, Colin. Do you have questions? Uh, Councillor Di Genova, over to you. Thanks so much for waiting patiently and engaging in this along with all of the other engagement efforts that you've made, um, as you noted. I'm wondering, I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked the last speaker. I, I mean, you've shared an experience um, with us uh, in your comments and presentation about taking your, your children, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, mm -hmm. to a public washroom. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you be hesitant to do that until some of the issues with public safety and, and some of the other complex issues uh, around housing people maybe with mental illness and, mm -hmm. and, and coming through with some actions on this are, are um, implemented in our city? Uh, what is this going to preclude you from doing now that you've had this experience? Sure, yeah. No, I think the same answer is, yes, I, we do consider what we do. I think that situation I described, I didn't want to do it, but nature was calling, and that was where it was. And I remember when my child was asking me to do that, I was like, oh, I'm really in for trouble here, but it had to be done. I would not want to do that, and I certainly don't want to wander out too far when you see what's going on. My, um, my wife certainly does not at all, and so we keep things fairly close at hand. And... Um, and consider what we do. And, 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 you know, I think that that's always a good habit to be mindful of what's going on around you, but it almost feels like you have to do it the minute you walk out your front door. You know, so I think, I think that would be 
my comment if that answers your question. Uh, it does, and sorry to put you on the spot, but how long have you felt like this in the city of Vancouver? Well, I think, you know, I'd say definitely in the last year. I think I'd seen, you know, we all know what happened with COVID and there was a lot of stuff going on. Uh, you know, someone mentioned that the Asian sort of hate crimes and things like that. Um, and uh, and I sort of had it, but I think, you know, the reality of, so you see it on the news, I think the reality of seeing it much more has certainly been in the last year, you know, and, and um, so I think at that point you start to say, well, you know, the stuff you're seeing on the news, maybe there is okay. more reality to it and it's not just the socialism. And I'm, I'm also wondering, do you think that the perception of crime is, as por is just as important as actual crime? I've, I've been told by people that are frustrated with wait times when they call 911 or, you know, feelings mm -hmm. of hopelessness. So they just don't report the crime. So we might even have a higher percentage of crimes than we know yes. about. So what's your I, sense of I, this? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. Like that, that really was why I was, that point I was trying to make by stating the challenge in reporting this incident, you know. I mean, if someone might say, well, this is not reportable. I, I don't agree. I agree this should be reported, uh, but I can't do it because I just simply don't have 90 minutes to call and I'm not going to call 911 for this. And so more avenues for doing that would probably give better better information because I think we're working off, you know, not all the information. I had my um, car broken into uh, uh, probably about six months ago, I'll say, three and four months ago. No window was smashed. There was no need to make an ICBC claim. Nothing of inherent value was, was stolen, a pair of sunglasses or something like that. So I just, like, you know, locked. I tried to call, same experience. I just locked the car door, locked it up, you know, make, and didn't report anything <laughs> because, you know, if I needed to make an ICBC claim, I would have hung in there. Colin, but, I'm just going to interrupt you because that is... Um, I just wanted to say thank you for waiting on the line and speaking to us. Yeah, but no, no problem. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Colin. Those are your questions. Good to hear from you today. Thank you. Next on the line, we have Speaker 10, uh, Karen Finnan. Hello, Council and Mr. Mayor. I am speaking today on behalf of the Kitsilano Coalition. I live in Kitsilano at 8th and Arbutus. The members of the Kitsilano Coalition include business associations, strata councils, community groups, and people who live, work, and attend school in Kitsilano. The coalition was formed last year as a response to the practice of elected representatives making decisions that have significant and lasting implications for their constituents without meaningful consultation with the community they were elected to serve. The present focus of the coalition is the safety issues presented by the 140 unit supportive housing tower that is proposed for 7th and Arbutus. The project is a subject of a rezoning application that Council is expected to vote on later this spring. In early 2021, the community was advised that the tower would be comprised of single occupancy, low barrier units intended for the hardest to house of the homeless population. There would be no criminal records checks conducted and drug and alcohol use would be uh, permitted in the building. The site of the project is directly across Arbutus from an elementary school and daycare, across 7th from a highly utilized to toddler park, and is bordered on the third side by the Arbutus Greenway pedestrian and bike path. BC Housing has admitted that it would never consider placing families in a building that includes the hardest to house of the homeless, yet the province and the city seem willing to risk the safety of the children who attend the school and the toddler playground that are each only 20 metres from the project site. Advocates for the homeless in Vancouver estimate that at least 50% of the homeless suffer from mental illness. That means that Kitsilano can expect that persons with mental health challenges will occupy 70 of the 140 units at any given time. 70 people with mental health issues housed in one building in the middle of a residential neighborhood, plus a high percentage of people with substance abuse problems, and some people will suffer from both. There are no existing mental health or addiction resources in Kitsilano to serve the needs of the proposed tenants of the tower, and no assurances have been provided that these services will be funded either within or the immediate vicinity of the project. Earlier this month, Deputy Chief Chow of the BPD reported that serious assaults in Vancouver have increased 29% compared to 2019. News reports regarding random stranger assaults reveal that mental illness is the common thread. VPD stats indicate that 84% of mental illness calls to the VPD involve violence, criminality, or danger. 
It's the position of the coalition that the current city policy of approving housing for the homeless in residential neighborhoods without supportive services required to care for individuals with mental illness and addiction issues is a key contributor to the spread of violent crime and the decline in the quality of life that we are all experiencing in the city. As such, city policy is in fact a driver of the unsafe conditions spreading across the city. The Kitsilano Coalition calls for moratorium on building housing for the homeless in residential neighborhoods until the city and the province develop a properly planned and resourced model for these projects that does not simply export the crime and the chaos of the downtown east side to every other neighborhood in the city. Homeowners and tenants in this city have the same right to live in a safe home as the homeless do. Electric representatives must serve the interests of all constituents. Housing for the homeless must be conceived and executed in a manner that does not pose a safety risk to the surrounding community. The coalition encourages city councillors to visit the 7th Arbutus site to appreciate why the community is voicing so much concern about 140 units of low barrier supportive housing. At okay, this I'm just going to pause you just for a second, um, Karen, and just guide you to the, the contents of this motion, which is talking about ho holding a, a special council meeting to discuss prioritizing public safety. It's important that um, your comments are directed to the topic that we're debating. Um, yep, and they absolutely are, because the public safety, supportive housing without proper supportive services is absolutely a public safety issue. And the coalition is in support of the, uh, of the what is proposed okay, in that, the motion. That, that's great. That's what I was looking for, is to have you uh, let us know if you're in support um, and, and why yeah, absolutely. on the motion. Absolutely. Any, anything, anything where we can get the city to look at the safety issues and consider the role of supportive housing without proper supportive services plays in the safety problems that the city has now is something we are behind. We are behind supportive housing but we need supportive housing that doesn't put existing communities at risk. Okay, that's good. Thank you very much. I'd appreciate your final comments there um, in relation to the motion. You do have questions. Uh, Council DiGenova. Thanks so much. And while I, I do understand the chair's um, uh, comments, uh, I also understand that, that this motion, as, as I drafted and uh, with input from a number of different councillors, including Councillor Weave, would include BC Housing and the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions. On a scale of one to 10, how important do you think it is the council sits with um, those organizations and uh, others, and, or I should say levels of government ministries, along with the Vancouver Police Department to together hear from the public? How important is that? Well, it's absolutely important that you talk to the VPD because BC Housing is not talking to the VPD and is representing that it is. You can talk to BC Housing if you want, but BC Housing doesn't listen to anybody. They certainly don't listen to the community. We've been voicing concerns about the safety aspects of this project since last spring. So, and uh, David Eby just confirmed last week during a call that he is 100% behind this project and wants it to be passed. So, so in, in considering some of the other, you know, neighborhoods that have had extremely high uh, incidents of violent crime and stranger assaults like Chinatown, Gas Town, Yale Town. I'm wondering, are you concerned that this may be the case in your neighborhood if we don't address uh, complex care and work together across organizations and break down these silos? Is that what you? Is that one of the things you'd hope to achieve from this meeting? Do you think this meeting would help, and these actions would help? Uh, well, we certainly hope so. Uh, right now, we're uh, at, at loose ends and we're pushing back on a project and feeling like nobody is listening to our safety concerns. Again, the coalition is, is in favor of supportive housing, but you have to give us a model that is not going to import uh, violence and crime into our neighborhood. That's what we're looking for. And can I ask, I mean, your group and the group that you're speaking for, your coalition, how many families do you represent and what are you hearing from your neighbors from, you know, specifically I've, I've heard from women who don't feel safe, um, especially women who are out and about in public with their children. How many people do you represent and are you hearing from in your neighborhood? Well, we represent a wide variety of people, which would include parents of the local schools, including the school directly across the street, but also other schools 
that are in the neighbourhood, the residents of the proposed tower are not going to simply stay at 7th and Arbutus. They're going to travel. And in fact, the fact that this tower is proposed next to the new subway station, uh, we believe makes it a less ideal, not a more ideal location because you're going to bring in undesirable people such as drug dealers who are going to prey on the vulnerable residents that will reside in the tower. We are at three minutes, so we'll have thank to you. end it there. Thank you very much, and thank you for calling in. Karen, good to hear your comments today. Thank you. We are moving on now to speaker number 12, Marlene Wickman. Okay. But I'm just actually Hi. noting the time. If Sorry, Marlene, if you would just pause for one moment. Okay. Um, we currently have two speakers on the line. <laughs> Oh, great. Councilor DiGenova, go ahead. Um, I, I was going to suggest that because we are at uh, 4.56 that we hear from the two speakers on the line and then we break and we come back and hear from any other speakers that may be on the line at that, that point. Okay. Uh, so the motion on the floor is to hear from speaker 12 and 14. And then have and an then hour dinner break, come dinner. back and hear from any other speakers. Okay. That is the motion. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, great. So we will hear from Speaker 12 and 14. Um, so Marlene Wickman. Yes, yes, I'm back. Great. Okay, and I'm supporting prioritizing public safety. Uh, point one, for prioritizing public safety, COV needs to realign its priorities to those of a family, especially multi-generational families, and use this for all of its decision-making. Families bring stability and a hope for a better future. A city safe for a child or a frail elderly person is safe for everyone. However, COV has not been using a family-focused approach. This is exemplified by, as I've said before, building the wrong housing supply for families, COV's preoccupation with homelessness and safe supply as opposed to rehabilitation and integration back into society, COV's lack of understanding of second-generation septed, septed is crime prevention through environmental design. These are a set of design guidelines for buildings to increase the likelihood of being caught during a crime. Second generation SEPTED further incorporates design of the neighborhood for public safety and uses neighborhood engagement processes. The absence of this concept is felt in neighborhoods that don't have compatible use of space, such as in Yale Town, where the Lugat and OPS are placed beside family-oriented condo buildings and toddler park, and as the previous speaker spoke about the terminal Alberta's subway station bus loop and uh, supportive housing building by the elementary school toddler park and seniors building. COV is preoccupied with creating social policy, but not social order. Point two, one pillar approach to drug addiction. Vancouver has long been a magnet for those with drug addiction in BC and across Canada because of an open drug scene and advocacy to support this. There are multiple factors at play here. A, Safe injection sites are meant to be discreet and eliminate open drug use. Part of the problem is location and building design. There is no enforced clear boundary around the safe injection site where drug use activity stops. The COV's one pillar approach to drug use, harm reduction and safe supply. There is an alliance between groups that one, want to save people with addiction from toxic drug death and two, those that want drug legalization, safe casual drug use for themselves and legal drug business opportunities. Some in Group 2 work hard advocating for the normalization of drug use behavior as a purposeful life activity. Some in Group 2 target addiction physicians that speak out about the safety issues with safe supply and effectively intimidate and close off balanced discussion on this topic. Repeated discussion on safe supply overwhelms discussion on treatment, rehabilitation, and social integration of people with addiction. From a family perspective, I would want a loved one to have treatment and rehabilitation. There's a lack of appreciation about the escalating use of methamphetamine and its role in random acts of violence. There is no safe supply of methamphetamine. And D, decades of neglect by senior levels of government in managing addiction issues and not using the proven model used by Portugal. Locally, it appears that COV has defaulted to West Coast American policies that have put us on track with Seattle and San Francisco that... Uh, Councillor Dijinova um, cited in her, um, in her document. Point three, the court system perpetually releases repeat offenders 
which sounds like San Francisco. This just emboldens people to commit acts of violence, as there are no serious consequences. Both Vancouver and Victoria had studies showing that 300 people caused most of the crime in each city. Psychiatrist Dr. Bill McEwen had an opinion piece in the Vancouver Sun stating, treat the 300 worst and save the downtown east side. There are limitations to the piloted complex care model, which is still voluntary care. These are not locked facilities. It does not stop people from going out and inflicting damage. And lastly, point four, Vancouver is a magnet for every protest and every suburbanite that wants to raise havoc by coming into Vancouver for a major event. There are three issues here. One, lack of respect for others and personal boundaries for behavior. Two, Metro Vancouver and the BC government need to pay their fair share for policing in Vancouver. And three, protests need to be equitably distributed elsewhere outside of Vancouver. Conclusion, I propose that Council direct the creation of a think tank with the Vancouver Police Department, BC paramedics, Vancouver Fire Department, forensic psychiatrists, addiction physicians, behavioral psychologists, and a safe growth septed consultant to develop an action plan on making the city of Vancouver geographically and socially safer and advise on effective management of those with mental health and addiction issues. In particular, second generation septed could be useful in improving the safety in the downtown east side, including safe defined spaces for substance use activity. If you're serious about safety in Vancouver, you will pursue this. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. That was perfectly timed. We do have questions from Council Di Genova. Okay. Thanks so much. I was wondering if, um, if you're okay to answer this question, what compelled you to sign up to speak today and why do you think that it's important that Council has this special meeting where we uh, make an effort to advertise to the public and bring together other uh, levels of government and organizations? Okay, I will have to, you know, well. You don't say, have to answer my question either. No, no, I'm going to answer you. I could, like, probably take too much time answering things. Um, okay, well, I've only become interested in local politics after uh, the announcement by BC Housing for the the complex beside uh, the school, Arbutus and uh, 8th. And then I've done lots of reading and then, yeah, become aware of, uh, well, not watching the news. I had no time to, like, watch news. I was taking kids to activities before. Um, so I feel like, okay, something has kind of gone wrong with this, you know, the city that, you know, you expect people to just know what they're supposed to be doing, where things belong, but there doesn't seem to be kind of common sense, okay? I, I read through the city documents that I know that, like late 90s, thought, okay, well, you know, supportive housing, low-income housing has to be distributed. I understand that. There's lots of perfectly appropriate people that can live, like, anywhere in the city. Uh, but when people have, like, a lot of complex needs, I wouldn't put, like, a large number of them together when they're, like, in an understaffed facility. And also to think about compatible uses. Uh, you know, when you have, like, Children and Toddler Park, well, and also the subway station. Like, actually, the subway station is, like, the one that, that's one that really ticked me off because that really doesn't belong, you know. And I wrote, like, I, I mentioned this yesterday, a big, big document that I'm worried about, like, what kind of people I do, I, I'm so could sorry. come in. I'm sorry. Are you I'm, cutting me off at three minutes? No, no, no. I have one more, but I have one more question for you, if you don't mind. Okay, you, okay. I'm okay, so sorry ahead, to interrupt, in. but I only get yes, three minutes. That's fine. Um, do you personally feel safer in Vancouver today than you did a few years ago? And oh, no, no, no. I have to think about when I was, like, first came over here over 20 years ago. I was, like, walking downtown at night, like, in Kitsilano, walking over the bridge, going to a concert, coming back. Well, I was with somebody else. You know, and I worked in the downtown east side. And at that point, I didn't feel like a problem walking around there during the day, although bad things, like, you know, did happen during the day. I remember having, like, like lunch, picking up some Portuguese sandwich and being in that lunch in the, the, the elementary school there and some guy with a gun ran by and the police came after him. But anyway, I, I didn't feel that bad being there, but I wouldn't go there now. Uh, you know, even I get weird stuff like walking down, you know, like Broadway, you know, there's like my child, I doesn't want to walk down Broadway because there's always like somebody that's sort of like, like psychotic talking to themselves and she's kind of disturbed and even uh, like, you know, driving, like stopping, like at a four-way stop there, you know, you know, I let somebody pass, you know, go first before me, and then I, I get the finger, like, why did I get Marlene, the I'm going to you. have yeah. to just pause you there, yeah, sorry, that is the end of the three minutes, it goes Thank quite you. quickly. Those are the end of your uh, questions, but we do appreciate hearing from you today. Thank you. All right, thanks. 
Thank you. And next we have uh, Neil Wiles, Executive Director of the Mount Pleasant BIA. Good afternoon, counselors. I will attempt to keep it brief so you can get off to your uh, dinner break. I'm not going to tell you anything that uh, you probably don't already know or that's nothing new. Uh, this Monday when I came to work, uh, there were 12 new smashed windows uh, in the businesses of Mount Pleasant. Um, I did 100 graffiti reports. Um, I just got reports back today is Wednesday afternoon that the uh, some of the spots that were done, the more difficult ones up on rooftops and whatnot, have been tagged again. <clears throat> we've had so much graffiti that we've hired a second contractor. Um, people have suggested we get uh, those roll-down shutters and bars on the windows. Uh, my security team are getting increased number of calls, uh, shoplifting. Uh, is probably the most common. Um, one was on the news the other night where the shoplifter was challenging the store employee to a fight. Residents and businesses are sharing incidents of break-ins that are occurring. Uh, I got one this morning, uh, and here is the email uh, as they were trying to do the uh, VPD non-emergency. Couldn't wait. Um, however, they tried to do the um, online, and they couldn't do that uh, because it was a break-and-enter. I'm not sure how that uh, isn't available to be done as a, online, but anyways, there's, that was the message that I got. Um, my overall concern here, and I think the point I want to get to, is um, a lot of these things are being seen as being normal now. Um, you know, graffiti has become so rampant that uh, it's just normal, and the city is providing us paint, which of course I'm always grateful for. Um, but now it's just normal. Um, the smash window things, you know, we were seeing it downtown. Uh, you know, lots of uh, ringing of hands, etc. And now it's just become normal, and it's normal in my neighborhood. You know, there's plywood all over the place. Um, this is this is my concern: is that we're starting to see these things as being normal, um, and that we're just going to keep moving forward. And I think that we have to stop and say that this is not normal and this is not right and this is not part of a civil society. I'm offering you no solutions. Um, you've clearly um, you know, heard all of these things before and got a list of uh, people in front of you. Um, one of my businesses has had so many break-ins that he's decided to stop claiming it on his insurance um, because they've threatened to stop insuring him. Um, and you can't have a business in Vancouver without insurance. His insurance has gone up $20,000. Um, he is on the... 200 block of Kingsway. Uh, I think you know which one that is. Um, so this is this is my concern. Um, I, I don't. Uh, I, I you know if you don't need to ask any questions, I can let everyone go. Um, but I'm, my concern is that this is being seen as normal behavior, and it is not, and it should not be seen as normal behavior, and we should recognize that. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. You do have questions, Council Di Genova. No. So oh, sorry. okay. So sorry, Neil. I was going to let you go on your dinner break, too. Um, I, I have to ask, what do you see the value being in bringing together uh, all of council, not just, you know, here's two councillors, three councillors, all together along with BC Housing, with the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions, with VPD? Where, I mean, do you see there being a benefit in also bringing out more people to be able to share their experiences? including businesses, uh, but also residents and people who work in Vancouver? I'm grateful that you're bringing this, uh, this motion uh, to council and to the floor. Um, but I, I, I don't think this is anything that we haven't done, heard, or, or tried before. Um, and, I, you know, there's, there's a lot of there, – uh, clearly there's a lot of moving parts here. We all recognize that, um, you know, whether it's someone like BC Housing or um, VPD. I just had to go witness a, a drug deal going down outside or through the windows um, on 200 Kingsway. Um, you know, like these, these things are not normal. They shouldn't be happening. They shouldn't be happening in our neighborhoods. Um, we all know that, and I think just at some point – um, as much as getting all of those people together, somebody just needs to say enough is enough. Okay. This has to this has to change. So the part of the motion that talks about, you know, our staff requesting that VPD work with them and come back with changes um, alongside some of the other organizations' input and hearing from residents by June. Do you think like having a date to that and having something to say? Okay, in June we're going to hear about what change might be made. Or what actions we can see is that important? To I you? would support that. I, it, okay. it is important. I think that always hearing, um, you know, from people who are uh, are the victims 
um, of these incidents is always important to realize that it's an impact on on real lives and real people. It's not abstracts. Um, you know, having to cough up ten thousand dollars to fix your windows is not uh, is not nothing. And so, you know, it is good that people need to hear that. And do you do you think that we already have a coordinated enough approach with these other levels of government, like the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions, like BC Housing, with Vancouver Police? Do you feel that the City Council currently has? I, I'm not asking you to disparage anything, but do you think there's room for improvement with that? There is definitely there is definitely room for improvement, and I, um, right. I yes. Yes, there. You know, and I think that lots of other people need to step up to their plate and do their job. And my last, um, you know, city. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask you my my last question for you is: Do you think this is affecting the customer base for businesses too? Customers are less likely to come when they see broken windows. Just ten uh, seconds. I think business growth in in Vancouver has been stagnant. Um, I think you know, I people are talking about closing, moving. So it does it does affect, and I think that it's having a longer term effect on people's mental health on whether they want to do this anymore. That's my time, but Councillor Weeb's up, so maybe he'll ask more. Thanks. Thanks very much, Councillor Weeb. Yeah, thanks, Nick, for you know, coming today. Um, one thing we're seeing across the country in Ontario that mandated that uh, community safety plans that are working with local service providers, healthcare, social service, policing, education, to develop proactive and address these community risks, because you've talked about it being normalized. Do you think this needs to be bigger where we actually pull everyone together and create a strategy that's not just embedded in one department, but it's something that we pull everyone together and stop normalizing what we're seeing on the streets now? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that the, you know, one of the root causes of, of this is, is mental health issues. Um, you know, and that's, uh, you know, that's not for the VPD to solve, right? I guess, you know, that involves, it's a multi-agency uh, solution. Um, and we need to get those agencies out of their offices and onto the streets and helping the people that they're supposed to be helping. Okay, so if we start to look at more ways of designing, because I know then Surrey they do preventative, ensuring safe places, community capacity, like you've talked about, what we could do in Mount Pleasant to create different opportunities to support community safety, the, the more on the ground supports we have in the community to be proactive will help this work instead of continuing to do what we're doing now is coming after the scene. Helping people where they are. Okay. Right? Getting out there and talking to them and meeting them where they are. Thank you. Appreciate that. Great. Thank, Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, Neil, those are your questions. And that brings us to the end of um, our speakers before the dinner break. And we'll come back. Thank you. Have a good night. And we will be back uh, at 10 minutes past 6 uh, to continue hearing uh, any other speakers to this item and then our final item uh, on our agenda today. Have a good dinner.
Harry, just checking, you can hear us. I hear you great. Can you hear me? Yep, thanks. Thank you.
prioritizing public safety. Um, and we've heard uh, a number of speakers. We don't have any other speakers on the line, but as procedure, we will I will read through the list of speakers and then close the speakers list. So uh, speaker number three, Catherine Helenzi. Speaker four, Clayton Greenwood. Speaker six, Bri Gurge. Speaker eight, Wanda Helpert. Speaker 11, Bill Thielman. Speaker 13, Catherine Zhu. So hearing no, uh, no responses from speakers, we can actually move to discussion. Council Carr. <clears throat> yes, uh, thanks very much. I had um, an amendment that I circulated. It's a fairly simple one. I'll move us to an amendment queue. Go ahead, Councillor Carr. Great, thank you. Um, it's just in, in B, um, uh, subsection I, um, and it's just to remove the word members after the Vancouver Police Department and Vancouver Police Board only because everything else talked about the agency um, or the organization. I thought it was, it, it might have been confu confusing in terms of actual members of uh, the VPD to, to the public. So it's just a simple removal to uh, provide some consistency. Great, thank you very much. I see Councillor Weeb's also on the queue. Perhaps this is not, okay. So I see that we can go straight to a vote on that um, simple amendment there. Uh, I see Mayor Stewart's with us. Just waiting on Mayor Stewart's vote. Uh, vote in affirmative, please. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, vote the, thank you, sorry, Chair. No problem, thank you. So that does pass with unanimous support. Thank you. We'll go back to the main queue. Councilor yeah. Carr, you have the floor. Yes, I, I'm, I'm fine. I'll speak later. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, next is Councilor Boyle. Over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Chair. I also circulated an amendment and uh, wanted to introduce it by saying um, the thing I I really appreciate about this motion is the recognition um, of the value of bringing together folks from different uh, experts from different perspectives to inform the public safety conversation that we've already been having that we will continue to have. Um, and I'm also conscious um, that of all the issues that we hear speakers on, um, we have had a number of really important opportunities to hear from the public on this issue. Uh, and so knowing how, uh, and I'll say, I know we will continue to do that, each of us uh, on our own, as well as on other issues. Um, my proposal in this amendment is modeling a special council meeting after the successful, I think, um, COVID recovery committee that we had and being able to bring together experts and leaders on the topic and have counsel in public ask questions and um, uh, be able to uh, engage in that way. Um, but have it it'd be just one evening and not a not um, what could be days and days uh, of hearing. And, and, you know, just to be frank, I think likely hearing from um, from speakers who have had negative experiences with the police, speakers who uh, want to see a lot more police or have fears around um, folks who are homeless or folks who use drugs. Uh, I, um, I think we would have a, a rich and productive conversation in bringing together uh, experts on these topics. Um, and so that's the uh, proposal here. Okay, great. Thank you. I failed to move us to an amendment queue, so I will reset your time here in the main queue, but let's move over to an amendment queue so that councillors can put themselves on that queue to speak to the amendment. Councillor DiGenova. Um, thanks so much. I'm, I'm just asking a, a point of information, if I may, Chair, through you to the, um, the mover of this amendment. And I'd like to ask Councillor Boyle if 
by striking residents, businesses, community delegations, experts, and community leaders. We would be handpicking people and inviting people like we did with the COVID Recovery Committee. So this wouldn't be an open public meeting to anybody who wanted to come and speak to us anymore. Is that, I'm, I'm just trying to be transparent here about what we're voting on. Yeah, no, it's a great question, and and if this isn't the direction council wants to go, you know, um, no problem. But I had assumed in the in the list of speakers that you had written later into the motion that already that was um, suggesting a number of uh, experts to come and inform the decision, and so um, this is a, about being able to uh, shape the meeting around those experts, recognizing, as I said, that we hear from the public. Um, in in many many other times and that's important and and we should uh, and will continue to but uh, trying to shape a special council meeting around the expert opinions of the list of folks that you had included already in the motion that's that's the intention thanks so much so um i'd like to ask a point of information if i may through the chair to staff as to how they would interpret this would the public still have an opportunity to sign up and speak to this in the way it's worded, or would it be structured and modeled like the COVID-19 um, recovery committee where the committee would invite, more like a workshop, like the other motion we have, which would maybe make it redundant. <laughs> I'd have to go back and look at the other amendments to the 2020 motion of the workshop that's already coming through. But I'm just trying to understand uh, how our staff would interpret this because I would see it striking the opportunity to hear from residents. Thanks, uh, Chair. Th through you, so yeah, I based on on the wording and and the description that Councillor Boyle provided around intent, that's how I would read it as well. That this would be a focus on uh, more presentations and discussion with um, experts and community leaders, as framed there, more so than an open public meeting um, with um, folks who could just sign up. That's how I would interpret it. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, so what I will say to this is thank you, Councillor Boyle, and I'd be happy to do this if this was in addition to meet hearing from the public, but it's not. And it's my understanding that the, the staff, if passed, would interpret this as we would not hear from the public. And we heard from a number of people today who maybe couldn't hang on the line long enough to wait or had to <clears throat> pick their kids up from childcare or you know, do, do many of the things that, that ordinary uh, folks have to do every day in, in our city and outside of our city um, who wanted to speak to this or who would like to sign up to speak to an organized meeting. And I think we have to give them their chance. I'm hearing from people that they don't feel heard. So, well, I appreciate this. And if you'd like to add this as an addition that I would see as being able to support, but if, if we are going to be removing public input and not hearing from the public any longer, I won't be able to support that. So again, if you wanted to bring something back, I'm not sure where this will go. I would hope that, um, I mean, this really takes away from the original intent of the motion and brings it back to 2020, um, where it was turned into a workshop. So I, I would um, ask my colleagues not to support this because I do think that there are some other amendments that do deal with this uh, coming forward from Councillor Weeb and others uh, that I think will will add sort of an equity-based lens to this as well. So I won't be supporting it, but I thank you. Um, thank you for bringing it forward. And again, would support it if it was an addition. Thank you. Councillor Fry. Yeah, um, I have to agree with Councillor Gijanova on this one. Um, I, I support this the idea of this amendment as, as an additional piece, but I, I'm not really supportive of the idea of, of not allowing the, the public and residents and businesses to also participate and contribute. Certainly in my role and in my neighborhood, I hear a lot from residents and businesses and frustrations, and, I, and I'm not going to be able to look my neighbors in the eye and say, well, we don't value your opinion. We'd rather just hear from the experts. So uh, I think this is a great addition, but I'm, I'm not really supportive of it as a, as a strike and replace. So uh, hopefully with a little extra time, maybe somebody will craft up an amendment to the amendment that puts this in more of an addition framework, but uh, I can't support it as, as, as a strike and replace. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Swanson. Yeah, I support this amendment. Um, I think it's really important that people who are homeless and people who live in supportive housing shouldn't have to endure speaker after speaker who generalizes that they are dangerous to children. 
Um, and I think it's important that we not set up a, a, a meeting where prejudices just run rampant and people who are at the target end of those prejudices feel bad. Um, and I think this gets at that a little bit. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Councillor Swanson. Uh, you are the last person to speak on the queue right now, so we will go to a vote on this amendment. And that motion does fail with Councillors uh, De Genova, Councillor Fry, Councillor Weeb, Councillor Dominato, and Mayor Stewart in opposition. So take us back to the main queue, and Councillor Boyle, you do have the floor. Um, thanks. So I'll just, I, I just want to say to correct any characterizations that my intention really um, wasn't and isn't to um, shut the public out or not hear from them, but to attempt to have a, a, a conversation about public safety that doesn't risk to um, stigmatize some of the folks who are struggling most in the city um, and that, uh, and that, recognizes the massive constraints that we already place on staff in terms of public meeting times. Um, but it, it, that's not the will of council and that's fine. I, I, I just want to correct that mischaracterization, um, but uh, uh, we'll leave it for there um, and uh, hear what others have, uh, have to say and, and amendments to propose things. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. Councillor Weed. Yeah, I've submitted an amendment. Okay, I'll take us over to an SD. amendment queue right away. So, put you back on the queue, Councillor Weed. Um, cities are often the first line defense against community safety issues. It is where local neighborhood solutions are matched to local issues and measures are developed, implemented, and maintained. More and more Canadian municipalities are shifting to a proactive and collaborative approach to community safety and well-being planning, where municipalities take the lead in defining and addressing local needs. Through this approach, vulnerable populations can receive the help they need when and where they need it the most, from the providers best suited to support them. In Ontario, municipalities are mandated to work with local service providers in healthcare, social services, policing, education, develop community safety and well-being plans that proactively address locally identified community risks. In Surrey, the strategy is developed to advance three goals for public safety. Increase feelings of safety in our community, improving quality of life for everyone, increase opportunities for civic participation. The strategy also outlines proactive approaches, including prevent and prevent crime, ensure safe places, build community capacity, and support vulnerable people. Burnaby's got a new plan that also has five key areas to supporting crime prevention reduction, transportation safety, emergency services, and climate emergency management. It's time for Vancouver to step forward with a long and holistic plan to improve community safety. And I think that what we've done in this city is continue to showcase how important it is that our community partners and some of the programs we've done in restorative justice, PACT, and other things that are working around the region are part of a safety strategy that is, belongs to everyone. And so I'm bringing this forward as recognizing that this is a great step to do these events, but I do think we need a long-term strategy to ensure the safety for everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Weeb, and that is up on the screen there. Councillor Di Genova to the amendment. Thanks very much. I'd like to thank Councillor Weeb for bringing forward this amendment. I, I support it, and I also wanted to thank Councillor Weeb for the many months of meetings that we've had together about community safety and moving forward and listening um, to people in, in the public about that, and also for hosting your own meeting on public safety. I think that it's important that we all get out there in the community, regardless of what our views um, may be, uh, as to how, how far up the list of priorities this is for some councillors, as we've heard from. But I think that it is really important that uh, we also look at sort of the long term here. I'm, I'm proposing in my motion some more quick 
and, and short-term actions uh, to address, uh, you know, the devastation and the fear that we're hearing from people and businesses that they're facing. But I think that this is a really welcome and needed uh, approach in the long term uh, to looking at how do we collaborate and work together with other levels. And I appreciate that we've also both had the opportunity to speak with you know, the Vancouver Police Department together on this, and I understood that, that uh, they also had, uh, had seen this amendment, and I uh, appreciate you, uh, you doing the work to make sure that that, that was passed by everyone. Um, so happily supporting this, and thank you for the work that you've done, Councillor Weep, on this. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I'm wondering if through you, I may ask a question to the mover of the amendment. And it's just to um, clarify is, um, to Councillor Weave, is you envision um, with the community safety and well-being strategy, which I, I think is a great idea, do you envision this superseding the healthy city strategy? Um, because I think one of our challenges is that we have multiple strategies and I can see a lot of overlap with this and the healthy city strategy. Do, do you envision that potentially? Sorry, I can't hear as a point of privilege. Yes, we'll just get his mic on. Yeah, um, yeah when I brought this forward as a motion um, over a year ago, one of the comments from our city staff was recognizing for the missing woman report was to come back to us. We were dealing with the equity strategy. We had the um, decriminalizing poverty. We had all these amazing strategies that were in the works and that this larger strategy is something that they recognized needed to be done um, as well as bringing back some of the Healthy City work. A lot of this work would be in partnership with what the Healthy City strategy is, um, as well as working on the well-being budgets and the rest of it. So this is to come when staff do have the capacity to do it, but a lot of the work needs to start to funnel, recognizing the need for us to have a long-term strategy. Uh, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Because I, I think there's a lot of alignment with um, some of the uh, uh, aspects of our existing healthy st strategy. And so I could see, the, see them dovetailing. Um, so I appreciate that. And, and I'm happy to support uh, the amendment. I think it makes a lot of sense and certainly aligns with conversations uh, that I've had around public safety, community safety. Um, and so happy to support the amendment. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Dominato. And I just have a quick question to the mover of the motion. Um, this, the motion that you brought forward, I know we've had a number of motions on this topic in the last two years, so I just wanted to clarify, that motion passed at Council? No, we never actually brought it because right. we're waiting on the other report. So it was brought in, but we never voted on it. So that's why. So I wonder, I know this is not customary in terms of practice, but the way that it's written, it says scoping the feasibility of the Vancouver community safety. And it seems to me it should say of a Vancouver because it's great catch. Chair, it writes I will as take if it's that. actually. Okay, I wonder, I don't know, we don't do friendly member, uh, amendments, but, but if... the chair is able to correct... Okay, I players. would just say that we change the to a to suggest that it's a future... Is that okay? Okay, I'm getting a nod from the clerk that that's okay this time. Thank you, chair. Okay, well, we will pass it. Right, okay, fair enough. We'll put that forward as a motion, a friendly amendment. All those in favor? Okay. Yay. Any Yay. opposed? Okay, great. Uh, that's all for me. Councillor Dijanova. Oh, sorry. I was on there in case you needed a motion to do it. I had it all queued up and ready to go. <laughs> okay. Thanks for your help. Uh, looks like we're good to go so we can vote on the amendment that we have on the floor right now as amended. Mayor Stewart, do you need a Yeah, Chair, I may need a vote assist. My Creston panel isn't uh, working at the moment, so in favor, please. Okay, thank you very much. And that passes with unanimous support. Okay, so we will go back to our uh, main queue here. Council, if you do still have the floor. Um, I'm okay, thank you. Council Dominato. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've um, 
forwarded a minor amendment uh, to the motion, and it is to propose uh, that uh, this forum be held in April uh, of this year instead of May. So uh, I'm sure staff will bring that up on the screen. Uh, simply to strike out May, replace it with April, and and that uh, is to address you know my conversations with the public, and I think we've heard that from callers, uh, residents today, and businesses, is the urgency um, to having this discussion. And I know Councillor DiGenova uh, was hoping this would have taken place, in fact, last year. Uh, so that's the uh, amendment I've tabled. Great. So we will move to an amendment queue. And anyone who'd like to speak to this amendment, Councillor Fry. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if I can ask a question of the city manager through you, Chair. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm just curious. I mean, we're almost in April. Is is that even practical or feasible? I know May was a pretty tight timeline. Is April uh, doable given our schedule? Um, thanks, the chair. It's a great question, Councillor. Uh, that Councillor Fry has posed. I, you know, not having had an opportunity to talk with the clerk, I'm I'm not actually sure. Um, I guess I also want to. It would be helpful to get clarification right now. The way the way it's framed is that this would be one evening. Um, because that makes a big difference. Obviously, if the intent is for an open public meeting that could extend over multiple nights, that's a whole different kind of order of magnitude that we're talking about. So I'm not clear, to be honest, on what the intent of the motion is, which which would impact our answer to your question. That's that that's a that's a that's a very good uh, observation, City Manager. And uh, based on that, and and the uncertainty around how many nights this may take on, given the the current framing of the language, I'm inclined not to support this amendment. Although I appreciate the urgency that's been expressed, uh, I don't think I think this this takes a little bit of work to get it uh, lined up and effective, and uh, I, I just don't see squeezing this in in the next thirty days as as practical. That's it. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Fry, Councillor DiGenova. Thanks so much. I, I want to uh, appreciate the amendment brought forward by Councillor Dominato. You're right. Last year, I moved for something forward. It would have been great to have it then. Back in 2020, in fact, I moved forward uh, a motion about a public meeting too. Um, so yesterday would be a great amendment, but it obviously won't happen yesterday. Um, I also wanted to take this, this chance to um, address some of the um, city manager's uh, comments about this while speaking to the April amendment and while I do support doing this as soon as possible um, I, I do think that it's important that we realize as a council we've had council meetings that have run for four or five six nights and this motion is called prioritizing public safety we've prioritized a lot of other things here we've seen um, motions go forward and come back with recommendations to council within a month before and I think in providing two months for a public meeting to happen when we're hearing from people um, and we're also hearing from the Vancouver Police Department that on average four people more than four people are are assaulted in a stranger attack every day some of some of those injuries have been life-threatening um, there was a 18 year old who was recently sucker punched in the head who was unconscious and I'm concerned that we're going to see um, these turn into, I'm try, not trying to fear monger, but if that was my sister, my brother, my child, <laughs> my parent, um, and that happened to them, I'd hope that we'd be dealing with this as soon as possible. And I can't imagine what those families and people are dealing with. So I, I don't think that it's unreasonable to look at May. Um, I do appreciate what Councillor Dominato is trying to do. Um, but I, uh, again, and while I do support doing this earlier, I think that it's important that we do this um, and, and we are upfront and transparent and open with the public about when we're going to do this in the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, we don't have any other councillors on the queue. I mean, I'm going to uh, just put myself on the queue here and advance and speak in support. Um, how I read this is, um, with the urgency that we are hearing from the public, as Council Dijanova mentioned, the this, the elevation of uh, of these incidents happening is uh, increasing weekly, sometimes daily. Uh, Neil Wiles spoke about coming to work and twelve windows being broken. I think that we're in a 
a critical moment where um, if we strive for April, uh, and it's just absolutely not possible, we do have many reserve dates already in our calendar for April that are not accounted for or are, that are not um, committed on, on any other topic at this particular moment, that if it's not feasible, I trust staff will come back and, and we would find some um, um, other date, perhaps in early May, but I think what it does signal is the absolute urgency of the issue and how important it is that we do everything that we can to be uh, responsive to it uh, as soon as possible. So I'm very much in support of moving that date up and again, trust that staff will let us know what's absolutely possible. And I see now others on the queue, so I will uh, advance Council Weep. Um, yeah, just looking at our calendar, every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of April is booked. Um, we have either public hearing, meetings, Metro Vancouver, special meetings on budget. So for me, um, recognizing what we have in front of us, I don't want to give the wrong impression um, to the public or to put staff in a very difficult situation to try to book. I also think we need to give ample time to these organizations to make sure that they're prepared and have the right evidence and data and understanding of what the meeting's going to be like um, and what to present and what to bring forward. So. I want this to be well informed, um, well researched, and a proper meeting that's going to have the right facilitators and the right people there. So, for myself, um, I will not be supportive of this amendment. And Councillor Carr. Yeah, I did a, a quick check too of our reserve dates in um, in April. I mean, we have ones next week, fifth and sixth, but that's too soon. However, we do have three reserve dates um, for council or public hearing on the nineteenth, twenty first, and twenty eighth, which I think could get enough time. Although that is a you know, it is a very tight timeline. But um, but I'm prepared to support thinking that that um, because May gets very busy too. Um, I, you know, the sooner that we get this you know, done from a public perspective, I think, the better. Thank you. And Councillor Boyle. Um, thanks. I just wanted to recognize, of course, there's the challenge um, of finding dates in our calendar. There's the challenge of giving our staff enough time. Um, our staff who, who already have busy uh, calendars and workloads with everything we've already given them, to, to find the time to plan. Um, but also uh, the motion suggests inviting um, leaders from important organizations whose schedules are also very busy. Um, all of which is just to say, I, I appreciate the message of urgency. I, I want us to be cautious, I guess, um, that voting against this isn't about not recognizing the urgency, but I, I do think it's uh, our responsibility as well to be setting our staff and um, and the public up for success in terms of doing an important meeting like this well. And so, um, you know, it, it's almost April. Uh, if we can do it early in May, great, but, but I don't think it's all that responsible to be amending to something we actually don't think is possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we will go to a vote. Sorry, Chair. Um, if I may, I just want to make sure that as we take direction here that we're clear on what council is actually directing us to do. So if, if the motion passes now, we would find a date in April. Um, it, the motion is framed as a weekday evening. Um, so I'm assuming based on that that this is a one evening event So because uh, we need to know how many dates to book. Um, and if we're looking at potentially extending this or not, I think this is a significant planning effort, and it would be really helpful for us to be clear on what council is lo looking for here. So what I'm hearing is, is, and I'm looking at the wording here, that it does talk about a special council meeting, and it also specifies weekday evening, which is part of the language of the original, original motion. So um, this may need to be amended and further clarified to the mover of the original motion uh, in terms of what we're intending, going over multiple days if needed. and. Um, I believe if that was something that was to happen, can we address this particular amendment now, knowing that additional language would need to be added to further clarify what the intent of the original motion is? Thanks, Chair. Of course, happy to defer to Council. I, I just want to make sure we leave the meeting knowing what you're looking for us to do. Understood. Okay. So with that, we will vote on the amendment to change 
I see you've been added to the queue, Councilor Di Genova. You have five, or you, yes, you have a couple, two minutes. Now is a good, as good a time as any to clarify that we've had special council meetings that have, that have been scheduled until 10 p.m. that have ended and continued. So I'm not saying that it would be maybe one day, but when we send this notice out to the public of all of our other meetings, even this meeting today, we don't say that it will be multiple days. So I followed the procedure that we normally follow. I just want to be very clear. And I think council could make a decision at that meeting because we are sitting as a body of council in a special council meeting. We can make official decisions and we could decide at that point if we were to extend the meeting and staff could Consider that just as they do. I'm not asking for okay. anything different, but I want to clarify that chair. Okay, thank you Thank you and uh, We can discuss let's deal with this amendment and then we can talk further about what we need to do uh, so To the amendment by moved by Councillor Dominato the voting screen should be up Right about The car. Okay, so we do. So that motion does uh, pass with Councillors Fry, Weeb, Boyle, and Mayor Stewart in opposition. Okay, so let's go back to the main queue. Um, Councillor Dominato. You have the floor. If I may just uh, respond to um, the city manager's comments, what I'm hearing is that uh, more um, additional language that would further clarify what the intent of the motion is would be helpful. Um, and, and I've heard your comments, Councilor Di Genova, that we would follow typical procedure. I'm not sure if there's a comment back from as a city manager, but we would want to make sure that we're leaving tonight with clear direction in terms of how much time we ought to schedule in case one evening is not um, sufficient. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Yeah, Council's schedule through April, May to the end of the term is going to be extremely busy. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're managing our expectations as we look at reserve dates that we're accommodating that. So, you know, as, as has been indicated, of course, it's totally Council's prerogative to add time and extend meetings. Um, it's just very helpful for us to understand if that's if that's what's potentially contemplated here Then we can plan accordingly. Obviously, we wouldn't be able to hold those additional dates in April um, So just to put that caveat on it We would be looking at that first date of a multi-day meeting if it turns into that in April if I understand. Thanks Okay, thank you very much. So we will um, continue on Councillor Dominato, you do have the floor Um Thanks, Chair. I, I don't have any further amendments. I mean, I simply would comment that um, I, um, I, I'm i obviously not the sponsor of this motion. And so what, whether the intent was multiple evenings or one evening, I, I think that uh, Council and City Hall can set those parameters of what that looks like to the public is that we're hosting this for a evening and evening, um, what those weekdays look like, whether they're Mondays or Fridays or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We did previously uh, Council cancel a public hearing or a council meeting uh, uh, to accommodate the U.S. elections, might I add. <laughs> and um, so there are ways to accommodate this. And again, I'm not sponsoring the motion, um, so I don't know what the intent was as to whether it was to be over multiple days or simply to host a public meeting, one public meeting. Uh, but I, I will just add that um, there may be different options and scenarios around how that could be accommodated. Thank you very much. Councillor Swanson. Can I submit an amendment? Okay, we'll take us over to an amendment queue. And Councillor Swanson, if I'll put you back on the queue and you can go ahead and introduce your amendment. Yeah, this is just to add the BC Human Rights Commission to the list of groups to be invited. They uh, produced this great report called Equity is Safer. And I think they would uh, be a huge advantage to it would be a great advantage to us to be able to hear about their their report okay thank you very much um councillor boyle thanks i just uh, wanted to support 
support this and say for folks who haven't had a chance to read this report from the Human Rights Commissioner, um, it's uh, it's a very thoughtful and useful read that um, that I highly recommend and I think would be a, a valuable contribution to this meeting. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I don't see anybody else. Oh, Councilor DiGenova. Thank you. I've just sent over an amendment to the amendment, and it's in line with what Councillor Carr had proposed before, just keeping things in line. Like, for instance, we have said Vancouver Police Board members, I, um, and to make sure that right now we're not asking any other organization or agency to make a presentation on a very specific subject. I'm just going to pause you for one moment. Um, the amendment that Councillor Swanson has moved, I think, is actually different than the amendment that you've... Oh added here so it's just tough the first portion of the amendment my apologies okay let me just make sure because we've got a, I do see two or three from Councillor Swanson so I just want to make sure we're all maybe I'm on the wrong amendment Claire yeah let's I'll just Thank have the you. clerks clarify or sorry chair yeah the clerk put up the right one I sent two but I made a mistake on the first one Okay, so I have one that is the subsection three. This one is the most recent. Okay. In your amendment to the amendment, Councillor? Oh, no, I'd like Nova? to withdraw that because I thought okay. that was the amendment that was being brought as it was circulated earlier. Okay. Do yes. I need to move a motion to withdraw it? I don't think so. I, I defer to the clerks. And I just wanted to speak in support of this. I think it's great to have another uh, organization or um, an agency at, at a level that we often see work with government uh, included in this. So I'd like to thank Councillor Swanson for bringing this forward and I will support it. Okay, and to be clear, we don't need a motion to withdraw it because it was an amendment to incorrect language to start with, so it didn't oh. really hit the floor, so we'll leave Thanks. it there. Okay. I just wanted to say I support this. Okay. That's great. Thank you very much. And so we will go to a voting screen of a voting panel, please, on the amendment from Councillor Swanson. And that motion passes with no none in opposition. So going back to the main queue, uh, Councillor Swanson, would you like to continue your comments? Um, I just wanted to ask if when we vote on this, we could sever the letters. Yes, no problem, we'll sever. And the furthers. So is it your request that we sever all sections of the motion? Well, just see. Just see, okay, thank you very much. Um, so if there's no further comment, Councillor Swanson, I'll move to Councillor Fry. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, just uh, reflecting on some of the comments earlier on, on some of this um, and, and, and concerns that, that there may be, um, you know, sort of offensive content. This, these are gonna be complex conversations and we've had lots of com complex conversations at this council. So I know that we can work our way through it. Uh, and that's what we have procedural bylaws for. And so hopefully we'll have deft applications by the chair to ensure that folks are being respectful of one another and, and the procedural bylaws are, uh, are, are are upheld when speakers are coming to, to present to council. And, and I just want to challenge some of the sort of presupposition that hearing from the public might necessarily uh, imply that we're just going to be hearing from the wealthy or the pearl clutching yuppies or the nimbies or whatever. Um, I regularly talk to folks who are from vulnerable populations who are challenged with issues of safety in our city, everyone from um, older illicit drinkers in the downtown east side, uh, Chinese elders in, in, the, in the neighborhood here, small businesses, um, people in social housing, public housing here. Uh, so I don't think it's, it's a, it, it shouldn't be considered as the exclusive realm of, of just the wealthy. Uh, and and, and I, I will be uh, counting on our chair at the time of this conversation to ensure that it does not become some kind of poor bashing uh, gong show. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I uh, just wanted to put that out there. I, I think this will be a complex conversation, but I think it's one that we need to have. Thanks to Councillor DiGenova for bringing this forward and for the thoughtful amendments that were included. Thank That's you. It. Thank you, Councillor Fry. Councillor Boyle. Thanks. I just had one um, question 
actually for the mover of the motion uh, around better understanding uh, section C of the motion. It was unclear to me in my first read of it how what's being asked differs from what the ongoing work of our staff in the VPD uh, already are. Is it just in particular an update to council on that work or just seeking some clarity both for me and um, and possibly for staff if it's helpful around what the distinction is and see from regular practice from, from all of our jobs and the work that's already happening. Okay. okay. So that's, go ahead, please, right. uh, Councilor Um I don't want to presuppose what we're going to hear at this meeting. And I think that that is going to inform what comes back to us in looking at actions. Um, and, you know, the city also, I feel that we have to stay in our lane. There's there's a role for us in public safety. There's a role for the VPD in public safety. There's a role for BC Housing to input into that uh, for the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions. Uh, okay, thanks, Terry. I I, I, um, I I don't mean to interrupt, um, but that's helpful. It wasn't it wasn't actually clear to me in the wording of the motion that C was related to A and B. Um, that it was a report back based on that public meeting and not, so that's a helpful clarification. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Boyle, Councillor Di Genova. May I close on the motion now? Uh, you may, you're the last on the list. Thank you. Um, I, I really hope the council will support this and I really wanna thank uh, all of my colleagues uh, who supported and, and even clarified uh, that it wasn't their intention not to support. Um, hearing from the public, I think it's really important that, you know, here we meet in chambers, sometimes it's 13, 14 hours a day. Uh, often people don't have the opportunity, even before we had the call-in option um, to come, and they don't have the opportunity even with the call-in option to participate. But I think planning this in advance and looking at ways to engage the public to, uh, if someone can't come to this meeting, possibly send a representative for them or share their thoughts um, with uh, other people who are attending this meeting, I think it's really important. To Councillor Fry's point, uh, I agree 100%. I, I mean, we've seen the numbers from the Vancouver Police Department that say that vulnerable and marginalized people are often the victims of violent crime, more so than the rest of our population. And Vancouver is supposed to be safe for everyone. I said it back in 2020 with my first motion, I'll say it now, this isn't an us against them, and I'm not sure who us or them, them are. This is about safety for everyone, but also dignified housing, dignified complex care and supports. We can't just throw a key at someone and say that because you have a roof over your head, we've done a good job here. So with so many residents expressing legitimate concerns about public safety, this motion allows us to show leadership as a council, to demonstrate that we're listening to these concerns. It's also important for us as a council to bring in some other groups that are involved, um, other agencies and organizations we work with often, to together hear from the public. And then, after that, have our staff come back. Um, it's also important, you know, I think that while policing is a component of public safety, an important component of public safety, it clearly is a part of our core mandate and states that in the Vancouver Charter. The issues we are facing are more complex than just a police matter here. We can't just clear out the tents in a park move everyone downtown and say that we did a good job. I think that we owe those people a more dignified option. And we can't provide that just alone. We have to work with other groups, not in silos. And this is why it's so important for me that we also have BC Housing, uh, the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions, now the Human Rights Commission, and the BC Prosecution Service also attend. And finally, Council, we started with some very high hopes and with a level of diplomacy that we were going to try and work together. And I think that here we are in an election year, and if we can demonstrate to Vancouver that we can come together to try and address a community challenge 
that affects us all and that affects everyone in our city, then we're sending a message that is desperately needed in our city. So I, I do hope that there is unanimous support for this and that we can come together uh, again with our staff and uh, hear from the people of Vancouver, similar to the people we heard from today. Uh, I also just wanted to state that I followed the procedure that often we'll have a meeting and it will state a date and a time and it doesn't say that meeting will continue on, but it does. I didn't feel that I needed to micromanage that because our staff already do that with our other meetings that don't have an extension date attached to them. So I do hope there will be support for this and I also want to thank Councillor Weep for his work together with me on this. Um, and, and I'm looking forward to hearing from, from the people of Vancouver um, about their experiences and what would make Vancouver safer and more livable for them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor DiGenova. Seeing no one else on the queue, we can go to a vote. And what uh, we will do is vote on um, the motion, all but C, and then the second vote will be just C. Just a point of privilege. Could we please receive a copy of It's the in your inbox. Oh, thank you. Yes, our wonderful clerks are on top of that. Uh, so we can move over to a vote and we're going to, yes, please go ahead. And we'll be voting on A and B. And that motion passes with unanimous support. And I'll just give the clerks a moment to uh, transition and put up C. And we will go to a vote on C, including the further that. Uh, point of privilege, Chair, I'm just uh, trying to see what part that we're voting on. It, it says C and D on the screen. Yes, I'm seeing that. Um, I believe that what we need to be seeing is a that and a further that. It's different than what was emailed to us. Point of privilege, and can we t se sever the two, please? Okay, yes, I hear you, uh, Councillor Swanson. I'm just going to give the clerks a moment to um, make that adjustment. And to confirm that we're able to vote on C and the further that separately? Yes. Okay, so we'll have a vote on C and then we'll have a vote on further that. All right, can I see it on the screen, Chair? Sorry. It's just coming up. It just takes a moment. Okay, that's no, right. yes. It'll be right there. Yeah. Thanks very much. There's just a minor delay before it's broadcast onto the screen. There we go. So what is highlighted in yellow is what we'll be voting on as soon as it comes up. Okay, so I do see it there. So we can go ahead to the voting panel and vote on the highlighted portion of C. And that motion passes with three in opposition, Councillor Swanson, Councillor Boyle, and Mayor Stewart. And now we will go to the final vote, which is on the second part of C, the further that. And uh, our clerks are just going to put that up on the screen and highlight. Okay, so you should be able to see it there. We can go ahead and launch the vote. And that motion passes with unanimous support. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Council, for your work on that motion. Uh, time for us to move to our final 
Item, the fourth referred motion is item 13, strengthening con the conditions of landlord licensing in Vancouver, which was moved and introduced by Councillor Fry and seconded by Councillor Kirby Young. We do have one speaker on this uh, motion. I'm going to go ahead and call the name. It's Bry Burge. And we don't have anyone on the line. So um, that is the end of the speaker's list. Um, and we'll move to discussion on this motion. So I'm going to go back to the main queue. And if you'd like to make any comments, okay, go ahead, Councillor Swanson. Yeah, I think this is a really good motion. I think we should have done it two decades ago. And uh, I think it'll help tenants a lot. I can remember when I lived in a building in Mount Pleasant and the landlord wasn't giving anyone their security, their security deposits back when they left. And um, everyone was griping about it, but we couldn't figure out where he was so that we, could, we couldn't even figure out what his address was. So I got some legal help and found it out. Before I moved out, I made a little uh, leaflet and s stuck it under everybody's door <laughs> and had how to get a hold of the landlord. But anyway, if we could get a law that did that, it would be great and just stick it up in the, in the lobby of the building so everyone would know how to get hold of their landlord if they, and, and what, resources were available to them if they had issues. I think this is great and I think should be a condition of our business licenses. Thank you, Councillor Swanson. Uh, seeing no one else on the queue, I think we can go straight to a vote on this motion. And that motion passes with unanimous support. So this does uh, include item 13 on the agenda and our, um, our, all of our items on our agenda for today. So the standing committee portion of this meeting is now complete and we'll now reconvene uh, or convene in council with Mayor Stewart as chair to deal with the recommendations and actions from today's committee meeting. Over to you, Mayor Stewart. Thanks very much. Just pulling up my script here. Uh, somewhere here in the millions of emails. One second, please. There we go. Okay, so we're now going to be in council to deal with the recommendations and actions from today's uh, Standing Committee on City Finance and Services. May the roll call, please, Clerk. Yes, Mayor Stewart in the chair, Councillor Carr. Councillor DiGenova. Present. Councillor Fry. Here. Councillor Swanson. Here. Councillor Hardwick is absent. Councillor Weeb. Present. Councillor Boyle. Present. Councillor Dominato. Present. Uh, Councillor Bly. Present. Councillor Kirby Young, I believe Councillor Kirby Young is absent. The meeting has quorum. Mayor Stewart. Thanks very much, Clerk. Uh, right. So we need a motion to adopt the Standing Committee's recommendations for items 1 to 13. So moved. Councillor DiGenova. Thank you. Do we have a seconder, please? Right. Thanks. Uh, all in favor say yay. 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 Opposed nay. Oh, okay. That passes unanimously. Thanks. We have one uh, bylaw on the agenda. Anybody wish to hold this uh, for a debate or for conflict of interest? Any discussion? Someone would like to move adoption of bylaw one, please. Move adoption. Thanks, seconder. Second. Thanks, all those in favor say yay. 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 Uh, Pose say nay. <coughs> Thanks, that passes. Uh, this uh, bylaw can be found on the city's website. Someone would like to move to adjourn, please. I'll move. Second. Thanks. Uh, all in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, nay. Great. We're adjourned. Thanks very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Still sunny out. Mm -hmm. See you all. Good night, all. Good night.